The Gilded Ones by Narmina Fauna Are we girls or are we demons? Are we going to die or are we going to survive? Decca lives in fear of the blood ceremony that will determine whether she can become a member of her village. If she bleeds red, she will belong. But on the day of the ceremony, her blood runs gold, the color of impurity, of a demon. The consequences force Decca to leave her village with a mysterious woman, destined to join an army of girls like her, the Alaki, girls who are near mortals with rare gifts, and the only ones able to stop the empire's greatest threat. But as she journeys to the capital to train for the battle of her life, Decca discovers the Great Walled City holds many surprises. Nothing and no one are quite what they seem, not even Decca herself. To my father, who taught me how to dream. To my mother, who taught me how to do. And to my sister, who supported me all the way. 1. Today is the ritual of purity. The nervous thought circles in my head as I hurry towards the barn, gathering my cloak to ward off the cold. It's early morning, and the sun hasn't yet begun its climb above the snow-dusted trees encircling our small farmhouse. Shadows gather in the darkness, crowding the weak pool of light cast by my lamp. An ominous tingling builds under my skin. It's almost as if there's something there, at the edge of my vision. It's just nerves, I tell myself. I've felt the tingling many times before and never once seen anything strange. The barn door is open when I arrive, a lantern hung at the post. Father is already inside, spreading hay. He's a frail figure in the darkness, his tall body sunken into itself. Just three months ago, he was hearty and robust, his blonde hair untouched by grey. Then the red pox came, sickening him and mother. Now he's stooped and faded with the roomy eyes and wispy hair of someone decades older. You're already awake, he says softly, grey eyes flitting over me. I couldn't sleep any longer, I reply grabbing a milk pail and heading towards Norla, our largest cow. I'm supposed to be resting in isolation, like all the other girls preparing for the ritual, but there's too much work to do around the farm and not enough hands. There hasn't been since mother died three months ago. The thought brings tears to my eyes, and I blink them away. Father forks more hay into the stalls. Blessings to he who worketh to witness the glory of the Infinite Father, he grunts, quoting from the Infinite Wisdoms. So, are you prepared for today? I nod. Yes, I am. Later this afternoon, Elder Durkas will test me and all the other sixteen-year-old girls during the ritual of purity. Once we're proven pure, we'll officially belong here in the village. I'll finally be a woman, eligible to marry, have a family of my own. The thought sends another wave of anxiety across my mind. I glance at father from the corner of my eye. His body is tense, his movements are labored. He's worried too. I had a thought, father, I begin. What if, what if? I stop there, the unfinished question lingering heavily in the air. An unspeakable dread, unfurling in the gloom of the barn. Father gives me what he thinks is a reassuring smile, but the edges of his mouth are tight. What if what, he asks. You can tell me, Decca. What if my blood doesn't run pure? I whisper, the horrible words rushing out of me. What if I'm taken away by the priests, banished? I have nightmares about it terrors that merge with my other dreams, the ones where I'm in a dark ocean, mother's voice calling out to me. Is that what you're worried about? I nod. Even though it's rare, everyone knows of someone's sister or relative who was found to be impure. The last time it happened in Erfurt was decades ago, to one of father's cousins. The villagers still whisper about the day she was dragged away by the priests, never to be seen again. Father's family has been shadowed by it ever since. 
that's why they're always acting so holy, always the first in temple, my aunts masked so absolutely, even their mouths are hidden from view. The infinite wisdom's cautions, only the impure, blaspheming, and unchaste woman remains revealed under the eyes of Oyomo, but this warning refers to the top half of the face, forehead to the tip of the nose. My aunts, however, even have little squares of sheer cloth covering their eyes. When father returned from his army post with mother at his side, the entire family disowned him immediately. It was too risky, accepting a woman of unknown purity, and a foreigner at that, into the family. Then I came along, a child dark enough to be a full southerner but with father's grey eyes, cleft chin, and softly curled hair to say otherwise. I've been in effort my entire life, born and raised, and I'm still treated like a stranger, still stared and pointed at, still excluded. I wouldn't even be allowed in the temple if some of father's relatives had their way. My face may be the spitting image of his, but that's not enough. I need to be proven for the village to accept me, for father's family to accept us. Once my blood runs pure, I'll finally belong. Father walks over, smiles reassuringly at me. Do you know what being pure means, Decker? he asks. I reply with a passage from the infinite wisdoms. Blessed are the meek and subservient, the humble and true daughters of man, for they are unsullied in the face of the infinite father. Every girl knows it by heart. We recite it whenever we enter a temple, a constant reminder that women were created to be helpmeets to men, subservient to their desires and commands. Are you humble and all the other things, Decker? Father asks. I nod. I think so, I say. Uncertainty flickers in his eyes, but he smiles and kisses my forehead. Then all will be well. He returns to his hay. I take my seat before Nola, that worry still niggling at me. After all, there are other ways I resemble mother that father does not know about, ways that would make the villagers despise me even more if they ever found out. I have to make sure I keep them secret. The villagers must never find out. Never. It's still early morning when I reach the village square. There's a slight chill in the air and the roofs of nearby houses drip with icicles. Even then, the sun is unseasonably bright, its rays glinting off the high, arching columns of the Temple of Oyomo. Those columns are meant to be a prayer, a meditation on the progress of Oyomo's sun across the sky every day. High priests use them to choose which two days of the year to conduct the spring and winter rituals. The very sight of them sends another surge of anxiety through me. Decker. Decker. A familiar gawkish figure waves excitedly at me from across the road. Alfred hurries over, her cloak pulled so tightly around her, all I can see are her bright green eyes. She and I both always try to cover our faces when we come into the village square, me because of my colouring and Alfred because of the dull red birthmark covering the left side of her face. Girls are allowed to remain revealed until they go through the ritual but there's no point attracting attention, especially on a day like this. This morning, Erfurt's tiny cobblestone square is thronged with hundreds of visitors, more arriving by the cartful every minute. They're from all across Oterra, haughty southerners with dark brown skin and tightly curled hair, easygoing westerners, long black hair in topknots, tattoos all over golden skin, brash northerners, pink-skinned, blonde hair gleaming in the cold and quiet easterners in every shade from deep brown to eggshell, silky straight black hair flowing in glistening rivers down their backs. Even though effort is remote, it's known for its pretty girls, and men come from far distances to look at the eligible ones before they take the mask. Lots of girls will find husbands today, if they haven't already. Isn't it exciting, Decker? Alfred giggles. She gestures at the square which is now festively decorated for the occasion. The doors of all the houses with eligible girls have been painted gleaming red, banners and flags fly cheerfully from windows, and brightly coloured lanterns adorn every entrance. There are even masked stilt dancers and fire breathers, and they thread through the crowd, competing against the merchants selling bags of roasted nuts, smoked chicken legs, 
and candid apples. Excitement courses through me at the sight. It is, I reply with a grin, but Alfred is already dragging me along. Hurry, hurry, she urges, barreling past the crowds of visitors, many of whom stop to scowl disapprovingly at our lack of male guardians. In most villages, women can't leave their homes without a man to escort them. Effort, however, is small, and men are in scarce supply. Most of the eligible ones have joined the army, as father did when he was younger. A few have even survived the training to become Jatu, the emperor's elite guard. I spot a contingent of them lingering at the edges of the square, watchful in their gleaming red armor. There are at least twelve today, far more than the usual two or three the emperor sends for the winter ritual. Perhaps it's true what people have been whispering, that more death shrieks have been breaking through the border this year. The monsters have been laying siege to Otera's southern border for centuries, but in the past few years, they've gotten much more aggressive. They usually attack near ritual day, destroying villages and trying to steal away impure girls. Rumor is, impurity makes girls much more delicious. Thankfully, Erfurt is in one of the most remote areas of the north, surrounded by snow-capped mountains and impenetrable forests death shrieks will never find their way here. Alfred doesn't notice my introspection, she's too busy grinning at the Jatu. Aren't they just so handsome in their reds? I heard their new recruits, doing a tour of the provinces. How wonderful of the emperor to send them here for the ritual. I suppose. I murmur. Alfred's stomach grumbles. Hurry, Decker, she urges, dragging me along. The line at the bakery will be unmanageable soon. She pulls me so strongly, I stumble, smacking into a large, solid form. My apologies, I gasp, glancing up. One of the visiting men is staring down at me, a thin, wolfish smirk on his lips. What's this, another sweet morsel? He grins, stepping closer. I hurriedly step back. How could I be so stupid? Men from outside villages aren't used to seeing unaccompanied women and can make awful assumptions. I'm sorry, I must go, I whisper, but he grabs me before I can retreat, his fingers greedily reaching for the button fastening the top of my cloak. Don't be that way, little morsel. Be a nice girl. Take off the cloak so we can see what we've come. Large hands wrench him away before he can finish his words. When I turn, Iona's, the oldest son of Elder Olam, the village head, is glaring down at the man, no trace of his usual easy smile on his face. If you want a brothel, there's one down the road, in your town, he warns, blue eyes flashing. Perhaps you should return there. The difference in their size is enough to make the man hesitate. Though Iona's is one of the handsomest boys in the village, all blonde hair and dimples, he's also one of the largest, massive as a bull and just as intimidating. The man spits at the ground, annoyed. Don't be so pissy, boy. I was only having a bit of fun. That one isn't even a northerner, for Oyomo's sake. Every muscle in my body strings taut at this unwelcome reminder. No matter how quiet I am, how inoffensive I remain, my brown skin will always mark me as a southerner, a member of the hated tribes that long ago conquered the north and forced it to join the One Kingdom, now known as Oterra. Only the ritual of purity can ensure my place. Please let me be pure, please let me be pure. I send a quick prayer to Oyomo. I pull my cloak tighter, wishing I could disappear into the ground, but Iona steps even closer to the man, a belligerent look in his eyes. Decker was born and raised here, same as the rest of us, he growls. You'll not touch her again. I gape at Iona's, shocked by this unexpected defense. The man huffs. Like I said, I was only having a bit of fun. He turns to his friends. Come on, then let's go get a drink. The group retreats, grumbling under their breath. Once they're gone, Iona's turns to me and Elfried. You all right, he asks, a worried expression on his face. Fine. 
A bit startled is all, I managed to say. But not hurt. His eyes are on me now, and it's all I can do not to squirm under their sincerity. No. I shake my head. He nods. My apologies for what just happened. Men can be animals, especially around girls as pretty as you. Girls as pretty as you. The words are so heady, it takes me a few moments to realize he's speaking again. Where are you off to? he asks. The baker, Alfred replies, since I'm still tongue-tied. She nods at the small, cozy building just across the street from us. I'll watch you from here, he says. Make sure you're safe. Again his eyes remain on me. My cheeks grow hotter. My thanks, I say, hurrying over to the bakery as Alfred giggles. True to his words, Iona's continue staring at me the entire way. The bakery is already packed, just as Alfred said it would be. Women crowd every corner of the tiny store, their masks gleaming in the low light as they buy delicate pink purity cakes and sun-shaped infinity loaves to celebrate the occasion. Usually, masks are plain things, made out of the thinnest bits of wood or parchment and painted with prayer symbols for good luck. On feast days like this, however, women wear their most extravagant ones, the ones modelled after the sun, moon, and stars and adorned with geometric precision in gold or silver. Oyomo is not only the god of the sun but also the god of mathematics. Most women's masks feature the divine symmetry to please his eye. After today, I'll begin wearing a mask as well, a sturdy white half mask made out of heavy parchment and thin slivers of wood that will cover my face from forehead to nose. It's not much, but it's the best father could afford. Perhaps our owners will ask to court me once I wear it. I immediately dismiss the ridiculous thought. No matter what I wear, I'll never be as pretty as the other girls in the village, with their willowy figures, silken blonde hair, and pink cheeks. My own frame is much more sturdy, my skin a deep brown, and the only thing I have to my advantage is my soft black hair, which curls in clouds around my face. Mother once told me that girls who look like me are considered pretty in the southern provinces, but she's the only one who's ever thought that. All everyone else ever sees is how different I look from them. I'll be lucky if I get a husband from one of the nearby villages, but I have to try. If anything should ever happen to father, his relatives would find any reason they could to abandon me. A cold sweat washes over me as I think of what would happen then, a life of enforced piety and backbreaking labor as a temple maiden or, worse, being forced into the pleasure houses of the southern provinces. Alfred turns to me. Did you see the way Iona's looked at you, she whispers. I thought he was going to whisk you away. So romantic. I pat my cheeks to cool them as a small smile tugs at my lips. Don't be silly, Alfred. He was just being polite. The way he was looking at you, it was. What? What was it, Alfred, a mincing sweet voice interrupts, titters following in its wake. My entire body goes cold. Please, not today. I turn to find Agda standing behind us, a group of village girls accompanying her. I know immediately she must have seen me talking to Iona's, because her posture is brittle with rage. Agda may be the prettiest girl in the village, with her pale skin and white blonde hair, but those delicate features hide a venomous heart and a spiteful nature. You think that just because you might be proven today, boys will suddenly start thinking you're pretty, she sniffs. No matter how hard you wish otherwise, Decca, a mask will never be able to hide that ugly southern skin of yours. I wonder what you'll do when no man wants you in his house and you're an ugly, desperate spinster without a husband or family. I clench my fists so hard, my fingernails dig into my flesh. Don't reply, don't reply, don't reply. Agda flicks her eyes dismissively towards Elfried. That one, at least, can cover her face, but even if you cover your entire body, everyone knows what's under. Mind your tongue now, Agda, a prim voice calls from the front of the store, cutting her off. 
It belongs to Mistress Norlim, her mother. She walks over, the numerous gems on her golden mask glittering sharply enough to blind. Mistress Norlim is the wife of Elder Norlim, the richest man in the village. Unlike the other women, who can afford only gold half masks or full silvers, she wears a formal gold mask that covers her entire face, a sunburst pattern replicated around pale blue eyes. Her hands are also decorated, swirls of gold and semi-precious stones pasted onto the skin. The words of a woman should be as sweet as fruit and honey, she reminds Agda. So saith the infinite wisdoms. Agda bows her head, sheepish. Yes, mother, she replies. Besides, her mother adds, the pity in her eyes at odds with her cheerfully grinning mask, Decca can't help that her skin is as dirty as her mother's was, any more than Elfred can hide her birthmark. That's the way they were born, poor things. My gratitude curdles to anger, the blood boiling in my veins. Dirty? Poor things? She should just call me impure and be done with it. It's all I can do to keep my face docile as I walk towards the door, but I somehow manage. Thank you for your kind words, Mistress Norlim, I force myself to grit out before I exit. It takes every last bit of my strength not to slam the door. Then I'm outside, and I'm inhaling and exhaling rapidly, trying to regain my composure, trying to push back the tears of rage pricking at my eyes. I barely notice Elfred following behind me. Decker, she asks. You all right? I'm fine, I whisper, hugging my cloak closer so she won't see my tears. My fury. It doesn't matter what Mistress Norlim and the others say, I tell myself silently. I will be pure. Doubt surge, reminding me that I have the same uncanny differences mother did. I push them away. Mother managed to hide hers until the day she died, and I'll do the same. All I have to do is make it through the next few hours and I'll be proven pure. Then I'll finally be safe. 2. I spend the remainder of the morning preparing for the ritual of purity, pressing clothes for father and me and polishing our shoes. I've even made a garland of dried flowers for my hair, their bright red color will contrast nicely against the ceremonial blue of my dress. I'll be going to the village feast immediately following the ritual, and I must look my best. This is the first time I've ever been invited to a feast, or any other village celebration, for that matter. To calm my nerves, I concentrate on the gooseberry tarts I'm taking to the feast. I try to make each one as perfect as possible, edges neatly folded, dollops of whipped cream just so, but it's difficult to do so without a knife. Girls aren't allowed to be near sharp things from the moment they turn 15 until the day after they're proven by the ritual of purity. The infinite wisdoms forbids it, ensuring that we do not bleed a drop before the ritual. Girls who injure themselves during their 15th year are taken to the temples for cleansing, their families ostracized and shunned their marriage prospects destroyed. All they can hope is that they heal properly and that they're proven by the ritual. Even if it weren't for that, most men won't marry girls who have scars, especially ones with scars from their 15th year. It's considered taboo. Despised are the marked or scarred, the wounded and the bleeding girls, for they have polluted the temple of the Infinite Father. These words have been drummed into my head from birth. If father had more money, he would have sent me to a house of purity, to spend the entire year before the ritual protected from sharp things in its soft, pillowed halls. But only rich girls like Agda can afford houses of purity. The rest of us have to make do by avoiding knives. I'm so deep in thought, I don't notice father's footsteps approaching. Decca, he calls. I turn to find him shifting nervously behind me, a box clutched in his hands. He opens it with a hesitant smile. This is for you, he says, offering me the embroidered dress inside. I gasp, tears blurring my eyes. The dress is dyed the deep blue of the ritual and has tiny golden suns embroidered on the hem, but that's not the most exciting thing. Peeking out underneath it is a delicate blue half mask with white silk ribbons to tie it on with. It's finer than anything I've ever seen, 
the craftsmanship light and elegant despite its wooden base. How? I breathe, gathering it to my chest. We don't have money to spare for new clothes, much less masks. I altered one of mother's old dresses for the ritual. Your mother made them for you in secret last year, he answers, pulling something else from the box. Mother's favorite necklace. I whisper, a happy sob bursting from my throat when I take in the thin, finely crafted gold chain and the delicate gold sphere hanging from it, that old, familiar symbol emblazoned across it. It almost looks like the Kuru, the sacred symbol of the sun, but there's more to it, another marking so worn I've never been able to make it out, not even after all these years. Mother used to wear the necklace every day without fail. To think that she had all this ready for me so long ago. My chest feels tight now, and I rub it, trying to soothe away my tears. I miss her so much, miss her voice, her smell, the way she always used to smile whenever she saw me. I wipe my eyes as I turn to father. She made sure I kept it for you, father says. Then he clears his throat, color rising in his cheeks as he pulls one last thing from the box, a garland of fresh flowers, their bright red shimmering in the light. The flowers, however, are from me. The merchant told me they were long-lasting. They're beautiful, I cry, feeling overwhelmed as I look at him. This is the first time I've received so many gifts. Everything is beautiful. My deepest thanks, Father. Father awkwardly pats my back. Ready yourself, quickly now. Today, you'll show them you belong. Yes, father. I hurry to do as he says, determination firming inside me. I will show them. I'll wear my new dress and flowers, and then, once the ritual has ended, I'll wear my new mask to match. I'll wear it so proudly, even Agda won't be able to deny me. I grin at the thought. It's late afternoon when we reach the temple. The village square is packed by then, well-wishers and curious onlookers jostling for space, girls in their ceremonial blues lined up before the temple steps, their parents on either side of them. Father takes his place beside me just as the drums sound, and we watch as the jatu march solemnly towards the steps in preparation for Elder Derkas's arrival, their red armor a gleaming counterpoint to the sea of deep blue dresses, their gnarled wall masks glowering in the dull afternoon light. Each mask resembles a terrifying demon face, and can be attached and removed from the helmet with ease. Since the doors haven't yet opened, I take in the temple's stark white walls, its red roof. Red is the color of sanctity. It's the color pure girls will bleed when Elder Derkas tests them today. Please let mine be red, please let mine be red, I pray. I spot Elfred at the front, her entire body rigid. She must be thinking the same thing. Like all the other girls, she stands with her face revealed one last time, although she hunches slightly to hide her birthmark. The temple doors creak open, and the crowd hushes. Elder Derkas appears at the top of the stairs, his usual pinched, disapproving look on his face. As with most priests of Oyomo, his mission is to root out impurity and abomination. That's why his body is so thin and his eyes are so intense. Religious fervor leaves little room for eating or anything else. A golden tattoo of the Kuru, the symbol of the sun, gleams in the middle of his clean-shaven head. He extends his hands over the crowd. The Infinite Father blesses you, he intones. The Infinite Father blesses us all. The crowd's reply reverberates through the square. Elder Derkas raises the ceremonial blade towards the sky. It's carved from ivory and sharper than the most finely honed sword. And upon the fourth day, he recites in the deep, booming voice he likes to use for these occasions, he created woman, a helpmeet to lift man to his sacred potential, his divine glory. Woman is the infinite father's greatest gift to mankind. Solace for his darkest hour. Comfort in. Elder Derkas's words fade to a low droning as my skin begins to tingle the blood rushing underneath. It's coupled by sudden awareness, the stillness of the wind, the crackle of melting icicles, 
and, somewhere in the distance, the crunch of heavy footsteps on fallen leaves. Something is coming. The thought flitters through my mind. I force it away. Why is this happening now? Father must have noticed my distracted expression, because he sighs ruefully, eyes squinting against the sun. Ever has your mind been inclined to wander, Decker, he whispers, voice low so the others won't notice we're talking. You're so very much like your mother. When his lips turn down in sadness, I frown at him. You'll develop lines, I say. Now he smiles, suddenly looking like the hearty man he used to be, before the red pox and mother's death conspired to shrink him to a shadow of himself. A bit like the river condemning the stream for rushing too fast, don't you think, he jokes as the line begins to move. I nod, return my attention to the temple steps. Elder Derkas has finished his recitation. The ritual of purity will now begin. Agda is the first girl to walk into the temple, and her face is pale with nervousness. Will Oyomo favor her or judge that she has succumbed to impurity? The crowd leans forward, tense. The chattering, the whispered conversations, all fade to a hush, until soon the only things you can hear are the disgruntled yips of the dogs and the huffed breaths of the horses tethered to the nearby stables. Moments later, a startled cry erupts from inside the temple. Agda emerges soon after, her blue scarf clutched across her chest, where Elder Derkas cut her with the ceremonial blade. Once she arrives at the top of the stairs, she pulls off the scarf and holds it above her head to display the red blood it's saturated with. A relieved cheer swells through the crowd. She's pure. Her parents rush to embrace her, and her father proudly fixes her first mask onto her face, a delicate gold half-mask in the shape of the budding moon to declare her newfound womanhood. She casts a victorious glance around the crowd, her lips curling into a smirk when she glimpses me. Once she walks back down the stairs, the next girl enters, and the ritual of purity begins again. I train my eyes on the door. The sight of it, large, red, and imposing, frays my nerves, causing my stomach to clench and my palms to moisten. The tingling strengthens, a low hum now, fine hairs lifting, awareness rising. Something is coming. The thought filters through my mind again. It means nothing, I remind myself firmly. I've felt such things many times before and never once seen anything strange. Terror slams through me so suddenly and heavily, my knees buckle. I grasp father's hand to remain standing. He frowns at me. Decker, are you all right? I don't reply. Fear has frozen my lips, and all I can do is watch in horror as a sinister tendril of mist snakes around father's feet. More of it is slithering into the square, chilling the air. Above us, the sun flees, chased away by the clouds now rolling across the sky. Father frowns up at it. The sun is gone. But I'm no longer looking at the sky. My eyes are on the edge of the village, where the winter-stripped trees crackle under the weight of snow and ice. The mist is coming from there, heavy with a sharp, cold smell and something else, a distant, high-pitched sound that jitters my nerves. When the sound shatters into an ear-piercing shriek, the entire crowd stills, petrified statues in the snow. One word whispers across the square, death shrieks. Just like that, the lull is broken. Death shrieks, the Jatu commander calls, unsheathing his sword. Arm yourselves. The crowd scatters, the men racing towards the stables for their weapons, women herding their daughters and sons back to their homes. The Jatu plow past the crowd, heading towards the forest, where colossal grey forms are appearing, inhuman shrieks heralding their approach. The largest death shriek is the first to step foot over the leafy border marking the edge of the forest. A hulking beast of a creature, its raw bone to the point of gauntness, its clawed hands dragging almost to its knees, spikes erupting all the way down its bony spine. It seems almost human, black eyes blinking, slitted nostrils flaring as it surveys the village. It turns to the village square, where I'm still standing, terror-struck, and my breath shallows, short 
fast spurts of air now. It opens its mouth, inhales. A shriek blasts through my skull, white-hot agony slicing into my body. My teeth grind together, my muscles lock in place. Beside me, father collapses to the ground as blood begins to pour from his ears and nostrils. More villagers are already writhing there, faces contorted into grimaces of terror and anguish. Other than me, only the Jatu remain standing in the square, their helmets specially soundproofed against death shriek screams. Even so, their eyes flash white behind their war masks and their hands tremble on their swords. The Jatu here are mostly recruits, newly initiated into the ranks, just as Alfred said. They haven't yet fought in the borders of the south, where the death shrieks lay constant siege, haven't ever even seen a death shriek before, probably. It'll be a miracle if any of them survive this. It'll be a miracle if any of us survive this. The thought jolts me from my paralysis, and I whirl to father. We must flee. I shout, pulling him so hard, he nearly jerks off the ground. Fear has powered my muscles, made them unnaturally strong. We must go. I glance at the lead death shriek again, its hair writhing and lashing fitfully around it. As if it senses me watching, it turns, and its eyes connect to mine from across the distance. There's a look in them, an intelligence. The breath rips from my lungs. Every muscle in my body suddenly feels weak, frozen under that predatory black gaze. By the time I find the sense to cower, it's already stalking onwards, as are the others. The many, many others. They're emerging from the mists, leathery grey forms bristling with menace. Some lope to the ground from the trees, claws scoring the snow as they run on all fours. Defend the village, the Jatu commander roars, lifting his sword. For the infinite father. For the infinite father, the Jatu repeat, running towards the beasts. A horrified gasp bursts from my chest as father staggers up and echoes the call along with the other village men, who are all now hurriedly wrapping kerchiefs or belts around their ears. Run to the temple, Decker, he shouts at me. Before him, the Jatu commander is bearing down on the lead death shriek, but the creature doesn't retreat. Instead, it stills, cocking its head. For a moment, amusement seems to glitter in its eyes. Deadly amusement. Then it moves, violently backhanding the Jatu across the square. His body cracks on impact, blood spewing everywhere. A signal for the other death shrieks to attack. They race into the village, smashing through the Jatu's shields, disemboweling them with fatally sharp claws. Screams echo, blood sprays, the odor of urine rises. The Jatu try to fight back, but there are too few of them, and they're too inexperienced against the Death Shriek's monstrosity. I watch, horror choking me, as limbs and bodies are severed with inhuman abandon, heads ripped off with ferocious glee. Within minutes, the entire Jatu force is overwhelmed, and then it's on to the village men. Don't let them get past. Elder Olam roars, but it's already too late. The death shrieks are plowing through the villagers, some leaping onto their victims, others slicing into them with claws and teeth. The more the village men scream, the more frenzied the death shrieks become. Blood splatters the ground, startling crimson across the white of the snow. Corpses lie in a tangle of viscera and dried leaves. It's a massacre. Terror knifing my heart, I turn to father. He and two other villagers are engaged in combat with a death shriek, pushing the creature back with swords and pitchforks. He doesn't see the other death shriek racing towards him, bloodlust in its eyes. He doesn't see its claws unsheathing, reaching for him. No. The desperate cry erupts from my chest before I can quiet it, so powerful it seems as if it's laired with something else. Something deeper. Stop, please. Leave my father alone. Please, just leave us alone. The death shrieks whirl towards me, eyes deep black with rage. Time seems suspended as their leader moves forwards. Closer, then closer still, until. Stop. 
I shout, my voice even more powerful than before. The death shriek abruptly stiffens, life draining from its eyes. For a moment, it almost seems a husk, an empty vessel, rather than a living being. The other death shrieks are the same, frozen statues in the late afternoon light. Silence descends upon the village. My heart pounds in my ears. Louder. Louder. Then. Movement. The lead death shriek turns and staggers towards the forest, the others following behind it. The mist swiftly withdraws behind them, almost seeming to trail in their footsteps. In less than a minute, they're gone. I'm drunk with relief, floating, as if I'm only barely connected to my skin. A hazy feeling is taking over now, making my entire body feel as light as thistledown. I glide towards father, a glazed smile on my face. He's still standing where he was, but he doesn't seem to feel as relieved as I do. His face is pale, his body slick with sweat. He almost looks, terrified. Father? I ask, reaching for him. To my surprise, he recoils. Foul demon, he shouts. What have you done with my daughter? Father? I repeat. I take another step towards him confused when he once more recoils. Don't you dare call me that, beast, he hisses. The other men have gathered around him now. The women have begun to spill out of the houses, Elfrid among them. There's an expression on her face, one I've never seen there before. Fear. Your eyes, Decker. What's happened to your eyes, she whispers, horrified. Her words melt a bit of the haze surrounding me. My eyes? I turn to father, about to ask what the men are saying, but he nods to someone behind me. When I look, there's Iona's, a sword gleaming in his hand. I frown at him, confused. Has he come to protect me, as he did earlier today? Iona's? I ask. He thrusts the sword into my stomach. The pain is so sharp, so exquisite, I barely notice the blood spilling into my hands. It's red, so very red at first, but then the color begins to change, to glimmer. Within moments, the red has turned to gold, the very same gold now racing across my skin. Shadows cloud my vision as the blood in my veins slows to a trickle. The only thing that remains moving is that gold, pouring into my hands like a river, slowly gliding over my skin. As I always suspected, a faraway voice says. When I look up, Elder Durkers is looming over me. His expression is dark with satisfaction. She's impure, he declares. That's the last thing I hear before I die. 3. It's dark when I wake and strangely quiet. The noise and crowds of the village square have disappeared, replaced by shadows, cold, and silence. Where am I? I glance around, my breath coming in short, labored spurts, and discover I'm in what looks like a cellar, with neatly stacked casks of oil lined against dark stone walls. I try to rise, but something stops me, rough-hewn iron shackles, one set for my feet and a matching pair for my wrists. I tug and twist, breaths heavier and heavier now, but the shackles still don't move. They've been hammered into the wall behind me. A scream builds in my throat. You're awake. Iona's voice slices through my panic. He's standing in the darkness, examining me with the cold intensity he usually reserves for beggars and lepers. The expression is so harsh, I jerk back, frightened. Iona's, I say, tugging at the manacles. What's happening? Why am I here? Iona's mouth turns down with disgust. You see me? he asks. Then he adds, as if to himself, of course you can. I don't understand, I say, sitting up. Why am I here? Why am I chained? Iona's lights a torch. The brightness is so overwhelming, I have to shield my eyes. You can see me in complete darkness, and you dare to ask why you're here? I don't understand, I repeat. 
My head, everything is all confused. How can you not remem? Don't speak to it, a cold voice commands. Father rises from the corner, a harsh expression on his face. A pillar concealed him before, but there he is now, clear as day, despite the shadows cloaking his corner. Why can I see him so clearly? Iona's only lit one torch. A fearful twinge shoots through my stomach as I remember Iona's words, you can see me in complete darkness. Father nods curtly to Iona's. Summon the others. Iona's hurries up the stairs, leaving Father, a wraith-like figure in the darkness. His eyes burn with a strange emotion as he approaches. Anger? Disgust? Father? I whisper but he doesn't reply as he crouches before me, his eyes flicking over my body until they land on my stomach. There's a jagged hole in my dress, revealing a stretch of unmarked skin. I cover it self-consciously, something niggling at me. What am I forgetting? Not even a scar, father observes in a strange, removed sort of way. He has something clutched in his hand, mother's necklace. He must have taken it from my neck as I slept. A tear slides down my cheek. Father? I say. Father, what is this? Why am I here? I reach out to him, then stop. There's a harsh, forbidding expression on his face. A simmering disgust. Why won't he answer me? Why won't he look at me? I would give anything for him to embrace me and tell me how foolish I am for being so frightened, his sweet, silly girl. He does none of these things, only looks into my eyes with that awful, removed disgust. It would have been better if you had just died, he spits. And then I remember. I remember the ritual of purity, the death shriek leader's approach, how cold those black eyes were as they met mine. Then the Jatu and the village men's counterattack. Blood on snow. Father in danger. And then that voice emerging from me, that awful, inhuman voice, followed by the look in father's eyes as he commanded Iona's to cut me down. The look that I understood only when I saw the golden blood dripping down my belly. No. I whisper, sobs racking my body. I can almost feel the jagged edge of the sword again feel the darkness descending upon me. I rock back and forth, so deep in my horror, I barely notice the footsteps echoing down the stairs, barely see the figures approaching. Only after they've been standing before me for some minutes do I look up, discover Elder Derkas reading fervently from the Infinite Wisdoms, a bandaged Elder Olam and the village elders standing silently beside him. There are only five of them now. I wonder about the others, and the image of two elders' spines shattering under the sweep of death shriek calls blisters through my mind and my stomach lurches. I double over, vomit pungent on my tongue. Elder Durka steps forwards, his eyes filled with disgust. To think, we sheltered such a creature in our midst. His words freeze the vomit in my throat. I surge to my knees, holding my hands out to him. Elder Durkas, I plead, please, this is a mistake. I'm not impure. I am not. Guilt surges inside me, a horrific reminder, my skin tingled when the death shrieks came, and when they left, it was only because I told them to. Because I commanded them. Elder Derkas ignores me and turns to the other men. Who will purify this demon and rid our village of her abomination? His words terrify me. I begin begging again. Please, Elder Durkas, please. But the Elder says nothing, only turns to Father, who glances at me. There's an expression in his eyes, an uncertainty. Remember, that is not your daughter, Elder Durkas reminds him. She may look human now, but that is the demon that has possessed her, the demon that called death shrieks to our door and killed our families. Called the death shrieks? The words splinter, choking me with horror. I didn't. I protest. I didn't call the death shrieks. You made them leave, however. The reminder slithers in my mind and I force it away. 
Elder Durkas ignores me, continues talking to father. You brought her impurity into this village. It is your duty to cleanse her. To my horror, father nods grimly, then steps forwards and holds out his hand. Ionis places a sword inside it. When it gleams, its blade reflecting the dim light, my fear explodes. I scramble against the wall. Father, no. Please, no. But father ignores my pleas and approaches until he's standing just before me, the tip of the sword resting on my neck. It's cold, so icy cold. I look up at father, trying to see any hint of the man who once carried me on his shoulders and saved the creamiest portions of milk because he knew I liked them best. Father, please, don't do this, I beg, tears pouring down my cheeks. I'm your daughter. I'm Decca, your Decca, remember? For a moment, something seems to spark inside his eyes. Regret. Cleanse her or the Jatu will come for you and the rest of your family, Elder Derkas hisses. Father's eyes shutter. His lips thin into a tight, grim line. I cleanse you in the name of Oyomo, he declares, raising the sword. Father, no. The blade slices through my neck. I'm a demon. I know at the moment I open my eyes. I'm still chained in the cellar, but my body is whole again. Not a single scar or blemish marks my skin, not even the portion of my neck where father beheaded me. I touch it, a whimper wrenching from deep inside me when I feel the skin there, once more silky smooth under my fingers. It's as if I've been completely reborn. Even my childhood scars are gone. I hurriedly kneel, bowing my head in prayer. Please don't abandon me, infinite father, I beg. Please purify me of whatever evil has taken hold. Please, please, please. Your prayers won't reach him, Elder Olam says from the corner. It's his turn to watch me, it seems. Unlike the others, he does so with fascination rather than disgust. He's already rejected you from his afterlands twice. His words are like an arrow piercing my heart. Because I'm a demon, I whisper, horror and disgust and acrid bitterness in my mouth. Indeed. Elder Olam doesn't bother to prettify his answer. He doesn't have to. What kind of cursed creature doesn't die from a beheading? Even death shrieks topple when their heads are cleaved from their bodies. I close my eyes against the memory, try to breathe out my rising panic. Where's father? I ask. The elder shrugs. He tipped to his bed. Something about his tone makes me stiffen. When? Five days ago, when the fibers of your neck stretched their way back to your body and reattached. Vomit rises to my throat again, and I retch loudly, emptying my stomach. There isn't much left in it now but water and bile. Once I'm finished, I wipe my lips, mentally push back frenzied thoughts and acid guilt. All those years, father endured being sneered at and excluded, for me. For the promise that I would one day be proven and show everyone I belonged in the village. But I am exactly what they said I was, only worse, so, so much worse. And now look what I've done. Elder Olam continues watching me. Your friend Elfred is pure, in the event you were wondering, he says. We are watching her, nevertheless. She spent a great deal of time with you. You never know how such associations can taint a person. The words jolt through me. She is innocent, I whisper, horrified. I'm the one who heard the death shrieks. Who commanded them? Alfred has nothing to do with this. Elder Olam shrugs. Perhaps. Time will tell, I suppose. The callousness of his answer is terrifying, but I can't dwell on that now. Father, I remind him. What is his condition? Elder Olam shrugs again, unconcerned. He won't survive for long. Not if you remain undying, he adds pointedly. I flinch, shame and guilt roiling in my belly. 
Now I understand why Elder Olam is here, why the others made sure he took father's place. He's good at making people see his way. Before he became head of the village, he was a very successful trader. He had a way of making his patrons believe that they wanted what he wanted. He doesn't have to do so with me. I look down at my veins, stomach lurching as they shimmer, the gold glittering inside them, demonic essence forever marking me impure. I want to rip them out, want to dig so deeply I empty them. Suddenly, I think of the villagers, huddled in their homes, and father, on his sickbed. And even Elfried. Distinctly now, I remember the fear in her eyes when she looked at me. The disgust. What happens when the demon in me rises again? What happens if it decides to lash out? To attack the village? To call more death shrieks? All those dead villagers scattered in the snow. My breath shallows, and I try to breathe, surrender myself to Oyomo's grace. Elder Durkas told us it was always around us, that if we only reached for it, if only we submitted ourselves to his will. I will submit. I will do anything to cleanse myself of my impurity, of my sins. I look up at Elder Olam. Kill me, I whisper, the tears sliding down my cheeks. I know you must know how. I am an abomination in the eyes of Oyomo. I am an abomination. A grim smile slices Elder Olam's lips. Victory. They say fire is cleansing for the spirit, he murmurs, taking a torch from the wall and staring meaningfully at the flames. Another scream rises, but I swallow it down. It'll be all right, I tell myself. All I have to do is submit, subject myself to the flames, and perhaps then Oyomo will forgive me for my impurity. Even as I think this, I know it's a lie. Fire won't kill me. Perhaps nothing ever will. Even then I have to try, have to submit and bear the pain until Oyomo gives me his grace again. Or until he grants me the mercy of death. Click. 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 A sharp, insistent tapping penetrates my ears. When I blearily open my eyes, there's a woman sitting before me. She's small and delicate, and dark robes cover her from head to toe. Even stranger, her hands are covered by white, bone-like armored gloves, gauntlets. They have sharpened claws at the end, and they glow dimly in the darkness of the cellar. It almost looks as if she has ghostly white hands. White hands. Perhaps that's what I'll call her. When she notices me watching her, white hand stops drumming her fingers. Her wooden half-mask gleams under her hood, a gnarled, frightening demon caught mid-roar. I blink. For just a moment, I thought it was a war mask, but only men wear those. Is she really a nightmare? A fever dream? Please let her be a dream. Please, no more pain, no more blood. Golden rivers, coiling down the floor. Tiny daggers bite into my chin and neck. No, no, you will not ignore me, a lackey, white hand says in a lilting, heavily accented voice. I jerk away from her gauntlets, gasping. This isn't a dream, she's really here. The scent of ice and fir trees wafts from her cloak, chasing away the ever-present stench of burning flesh, melting fat, charred bone. As I inhale deeply, savoring the smell, white hands abruptly crouches, her eyes boring into mine. Fear shivers over me. They're dark, so very, very dark, those eyes. The last time I saw eyes so dark was on a death shriek, but they didn't have white surrounding their pupils. White hands is human. Terrifyingly so. You are awake. Good, she murmurs. Are you lucid? I blink back at her. White hands slaps me so sharply, my head jerks back from the blow. I touch my cheek, shocked, until she grips my chin with those claws again. Ah. You. Lucid. Alaki. There it is, that word again. Alaki. I pronounce it silently in my mind, focusing on its strange, 
forbidding edges as I sit up. Yes, I rasp, licking my lips. My voice is a raw nerve, my tongue drier than our lake bed in midsummer. I haven't spoken in days, or has it been weeks? Months. How long have I been here? My memories blend in an orgy of blood and terror, of gold, shimmering on the cobblestone floor as the sword slices down, tearing past reattaching muscles, reconnecting tendons. The elders bring out buckets, gold lust in their eyes. They're going to dismember me again, going to rip me apart to harvest the gold that flows in my veins. A scream pours out, shrill, unhinged. It mixes with my prayers. Please forgive me. I didn't mean to sin. I didn't know about the impurity in my blood. Please forgive me. Then the icy sweetness of the knife, slicing through my tongue. White hand snaps her claws. No, do not drift off again. She rummages in her cloak and unearths a small glass vial, which she wafts under my nose. An acrid smell sears my nostrils, and I jerk upright, blinking wildly as the memories flee back to their hidden corners. White hands moves forwards with the vial again, but I quickly turn my head away. I'm awake, I'm awake, I rasp. Good, she says. I dislike being ignored by Alaki. Alaki? I repeat. It means worthless, unwanted. That is what they call your kind. White hands peers at me. I can almost feel her frowning under her hood. You do not know what you are? I struggle to understand what she's saying. I'm impure, I reply. Rivers of golden blood flow past my eyes. Amusement glimmers in hers. Undoubtedly, but that does not fully explain what you are. Something stirs inside me, a dull echo almost resembling curiosity. What am I? I ask. And what do you mean by my kind? Does she mean the other impure girls, the ones who died here? More memories surface, impatient whispers in the darkness. Why won't she die? They always die by the second or third death. Beheading, burning, drowning. It's always one of the three. She's unnatural, this one. Unnatural? If you make the correct choice, I will tell you. The sound of White Hands' voice returns me abruptly to the present. Choice. My head throbs and I want to go back to sleep. I begin to close my eyes again, but she pulls something from her pocket. It's a seal made of solid gold, with a circle of obsidian stones in the middle of one side and an old Otteran symbol on the other, an eclipsed sun whose rays have been turned into wickedly sharp blades. This is the first time I've ever seen one so close before. Only officials carry seals, and it's rare they come to effort. There's something strange about the circle on the first side. I squint, forcing it to take shape. Stars. The stones are shaped like stars. The Ansifer. White Hands' voice answers my unspoken question as she points to the symbol on the seal. It is an invitation. Confusion lines my face, and I frown at her. An invitation for what? For you, impure one. Emperor Jizo has decided to create an army of your kind. He invites you to join it and protect our beloved Oterra from those that would oppose her will. White Hands begins untying her mask, and I recoil, unnerved. Is this a trick? Some kind of bizarre test? Women never remove their masks in front of strangers, only family or their dearest friends. I shut my eyes, frightened of what I'll see, but White Hands' amused laugh filters into my ears. Look at me. I squeeze my eyes tighter. Look at me. There's iron behind the command now. I look. White Hands is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. My jaw drops nearly to my chest when I take full stock of her. Small of stature, she has short, tightly curled hair and glowing skin that gleams a smooth bluish black, like the night sky at midsummer. Her most striking feature, 
however, is her eyes, deep black and fathomless, as if she's seen the worst of humanity and survived to laugh at it all. I thought I'd endured tortures, but something tells me White Hands has not only endured but thrived, become stronger for her pain. She's monstrous. The realization shudders through me, along with another. This is why the infinite wisdom's cautions against talking to unmasked women, against even looking at them. They may be demons in disguise. White hands moves closer. Now, then, tell me, what have you decided? You have only two choices, after all, remain here, where the elders can bleed you while pretending to enforce the death mandate, or come with me to the capital and make something of yourself something even those greedy bastards upstairs cannot sneer at. I'm impure, I say slowly, pushing back the futile hope that surges at her words. There's no reprieve for me, no freedom. Nothing will change that. Oyomo, give me grace. Oyomo, forgive me my sins. Oyomo, please absolve me. I turn my head away. But White Hands's gauntlets immediately return, digging into my skin. She forces my eyes to meet hers. You can decide your fate, a lackey, an option that was not given to your predecessors. Her tone is pleasant enough, but there's pure steel behind it. However, if you do wish to have the death mandate enforced. Death mandate? This is the second time she's mentioned it. Never allow an alaki to live nor anyone who aids her, white hands recites, as if reading from a scroll. Those are the exact words of the death mandate for your kind, the words that ensure that every girl in Oterra undergoes the ritual of purity so that all your kind are found and executed without delay. The ground falls out from under me. So that all your kind are found and executed. The elders suspected all along what I was, were just waiting for the ritual to confirm it so they could finally end my life. Listen well, Alaki, White Hand says, moving so suddenly, I feel the sting on my chest only after she sliced it open with her gauntleted claws. Unease shudders through me when I look down and see she's made a cut in the same place Elder Durkas would have, had I gone through the ritual of purity. Gold is already welling up, staining my skin with its evil. I jerk away, cover the wound, but White Hands lifts a droplet and rubs it between her fingers. This is the cursed gold. She extends gold-stained fingers towards me. I watch them, mesmerized. Cursed gold. Such awful words. It's what marks you as inhuman, demonic. Tears prickle my eyes, a mixture of horror and futile humiliation. White Hands doesn't have to remind me of what I am. I know I'm a demon, foul and unclean, despised by Oyomo. No matter how much I beg, no matter how absolutely I submit, he never listens, never even hears me. Why won't you hear me? I'll try harder, I won't scream, I won't cry, not even if they dismember me again, knives slicing through fat, cutting past bone and... White hands grasps my chin, claws digging in deep, and my thoughts still once more. It also marks you as a precious commodity. She rises to her feet. The death shrieks have begun migrating, and the southern borders are nearly overwhelmed. The Jatu there will not be able to withstand the attacks much longer. Every day, those creatures come closer and closer to the Empire. It is only a matter of time before we are overrun defeated by them. I shudder from the memory, remembering the predatory look in the death shriek leader's eyes as they met mine. What does that have to do with me? White hands shrugs elegantly. Who better to fight a monster than another monster? Shame wells up again, and the tears burn hotter in my eyes. I can't even watch white hands anymore as she continues, you have died, what, seven, eight. 9. I tiredly correct, the methods flowing through my head. The heading, burning, drowning, hanging, poisoning, stoning, disemboweling, bloodletting, dismemberment. Several dismemberments, only one of which actually killed me. 
The elders bring out buckets, that gold lust surfacing in their eyes. We'll sell it in Norgorad. I know a merchant there who pays a fair price. Nine times. White Hans' voice wrenches me from my turbulent memories. You have died nine times and revived each time. That means you have already been proven. You are perfect for what the Emperor wants. He wants demons. I ask. No, he wants warriors. An entire army of impure ones, fighting for the glory of the One Kingdom. My eyes widen. There are enough other girls like me to create an army. Of course there are. All those sisters and distant cousins taken over the years. White Hands looks down at me. Once every hundred years, death shrieks migrate to the primal nesting ground, the place from which they all originate. This year begins a new migration, and Emperor Jizo has decided it is the perfect time to strike. In eight months precisely, when all the death shrieks have fully gathered at the nesting ground, his armies will march on them and destroy them and their accursed home. We will obliterate them from the face of Oterra. Her eyes pin me in place. Your kind will lead the charge. My kind. Foreboding shivers through me, mixing with a twinge of disappointment. For a moment, I hoped White Hands was an Alaki too. I force myself to return her stare. Even if that's true, why should I agree? I rasp. What would I gain from it, other than an eternity of painful deaths on the battlefield? Freedom from this farce. She gestures around the cellar. While you cower here in misery, those elders sell your gold to the highest bidder so nobles can make pretty trinkets from it. They enrich themselves off your suffering, parasites, quite literally draining the blood from you. Nausea swells my mouth and I struggle to swallow. I've known what the elders were doing, known that they were dismembering me for the gold. But I have to submit, have to pay the price for my impurity. Oyomo, forgive me, Oyomo, grant me. Absolution. My heart nearly stops when White Hands utters this word. That's the other thing you would gain. Everything is so quiet now. I barely hear her continue. Fight on behalf of Oterra for a period of twenty years, and you will be absolved, your demonic nature cleansed. You will be pure again. Pure? I repeat, all other thoughts disappearing, chased away by those incredible words, pure. Absolved. Human again, just like everyone else. No more tingling, ever again. I look up at the ceiling, tears stinging my eyes. You were listening. This whole time, you were listening. You heard me after all. I barely notice white hands as she nods in affirmation. The emperor's priests can ensure it, yes, she replies. By now, so many thoughts are whirling through my head, so many feelings, relief, joy, it's all I can do to keep from jumping up in agreement. Then I remember. What about the elders? My father? I ask. White hands shrugs. What of them? I am an emissary of Emperor Jizo himself. A living embodiment of his will. To go against me is to go against Oterra. Relief surges again, determination swift on its heels. I can be pure. I can find a place that accepts me and even belong for the first time in my life. I can have a future, a normal life, a normal death. He will finally allow me into his afterlands. A word of warning, Alaki. White Hands's voice interrupts my thoughts. The training will be ten times more brutal than that of the regular soldiers. When I cower back in alarm, she shrugs. You are an accursed demon, a despised abomination in the eyes of Oyomo, and they will treat you as such. As I look down, ashamed, she adds a few more words. However, given what you have endured here, I doubt there is anything you would encounter during training that will ever come close. She leans nearer, that seal dangles from her hands. An invitation. A warning. 
Well, have you decided? Decided? Is it even a question? All these days, I have been praying, submitting, in the hopes of belonging somewhere, and here I have it, the answer, the one I have been seeking. I look at her, my eyes certain now. I accept the seal. Yes, I say, I have. I agree, on one condition. An amused smile curls across her lips. Oh? You will make them tell my father that I am dead. 5. In the end, Elder Durkas doesn't even argue with white hands about my fate. All it takes is a pointed arch of her eyebrow, and I'm unchained and dressed with such extraordinary speed, it's as if the hounds of the afterlands themselves have risen to nip at the elders' heels. The elders may hate to lose the wealth I've brought them, but they dare not go against an emissary of the emperor. It's night outside when they lead me to the steps of the temple, and so dark the moon only barely sparkles on the snow-covered ground. A blast of icicold wind hits my face, sending tears to my eyes. It wouldn't sting so much if I had a mask to cover my face, but I'm an impure woman. I'll never be able to wear a mask now. I've been freed from the cellar. I never thought I would be. I never thought I'd feel the wind again, never thought I'd glimpse the sky again. This almost feels like a dream, the blissful ones I have whenever I die and my skin takes on the same golden sheen as my. Take these, Elder Durka snarls, shoving something coarse and heavy into my hands. They are an offering for the emissary's mounts. I look down, surprised to find a burlap sack filled with plump red winter apples. A sob chokes me. Winter apples are harvested only at the height of the cold season. If these are as fresh as they seem, I've been locked in that cellar for two full months, perhaps more. More sobs come, each one more racking than the last. Elder Derkaz's lips curl into a sneer at the sound. Wait here, he growls, walking towards White Hansy's wagon, a small, rickety wooden affair with tiny windows on each side and a single door at the back. Two large creatures are attached to it. They look almost like horses, but there's something funny about them. As I blink, trying to make them out through my tears, Elder Derkas calls out to White Hands, I've brought the demon, as you commanded. Demon. I should already be used to the word, but shame curves my shoulders, and I huddle into my coat. That is, until White Hands guides the wagon nearer, and I see the creatures clearly for the first time. The breath rushes out of me. Those creatures aren't horses at all, they're aquas, horse lords. They have human chests sprouting from their horse-like lower bodies and talons where hooves should be. Mother used to tell me about them, how they ran through the desert on their talons, herding horses and camels. Similar creatures roam the more remote mountains of the north, but they are larger and much more heavily furred. Strangely, these equus are wearing heavy coats over their glossy white bodies, and they even have furred boots over their talons. It must be too cold in the northern provinces for their kind. The larger one sees me staring and nudges the other as they near the steps where I remain, huddled into myself. Look, look, Masima, a little human to eat, he says. He has a stripe of black hair in his otherwise pristine white manet and his nose is so flat, it's almost a muzzle. The smaller one is pure white from head to tail, and his eyes are a large, gentle brown. Looks tasty, Bremer. Shall we share her between us, he says with a smile. I shrink back, alarmed, but White Hands turns to me with an amused smile. Do not worry, Alaki, Bremer and Masima are vegetarians. They only eat grass, and apples, she adds pointedly. I blink, then hurriedly remove two apples from the sack. Oh, here, these are for you, I say, walking over. I slowly offer them up, mindful of how much the aquas loom over me. Greedy, long-fingered hands snatch the apples out of mine. Um, winter apples. Bremer, the black-striped aquas exclaims, crunching into his. Suddenly, he doesn't seem dangerous at all, more like an overgrown puppy playing at being fierce. 
He's obviously the elder of the twins. I realize that's what they are now, because other than his larger size and the black stripe in his hair, he and his brother are identical, both beautiful in that ethereal, otherworldly way despite their powerful physiques. White Hands shakes her head fondly. You should be nicer, Bremer, she chides. Decker is our traveling companion. As I frown at this strange description of our circumstances, she turns to the elders. What are you waiting for, then? Hurry it up. The elders quickly do as they're told. Warm clothes and a few packs of food are bundled into White Hands's covered wagon, as are several flasks of water. The entire process takes only a few minutes, and then White Hands helps me up into the back of the wagon and shuts the door. To my surprise, someone else is sitting among the furs packed there, a girl my age with a plump figure and the blue eyes and blonde hair so typical of the northern provinces. She smiles at me cheerfully, her face half covered by an ocean of furs, and a tingle rushes under my skin, one distinctly different from what I felt when I first sensed the death shrieks. This tingle feels almost like, recognition. Could she be one of my kind? And a lucky too? Hello, the girl says and gives a pleasant little wave. She reminds me of Elfred, the way she seems so shy and eager at the same time. Only the accent is different, has flowing in the rhythmic up and down of the remotest northern villages, the ones so high in the mountains it takes weeks to reach them. I'm so taken aback to find someone else sitting here, I barely notice the clinking until I glance up to see Elder Dirk as approaching the front of the wagon, a pair of manacles in hand. White Hands is already seated at the reins, and she watches impassively as he nods at me, disgusted. That one is unnatural, even for an alaki, he sneers. Refuses to die no matter how many times you kill her. Best to keep her chained away from the other one, before her bad blood spreads its influence. I flinch at the words, shame growing, but White Hands' expression freezes colder than the wind now whipping through the air. I neither fear little girls nor need shackles to compel them, she says, ice dripping from her words. Now if you will excuse me. She clicks the wagon's reins. Just like that, I'm riding out of the only home I've ever known. Elder Derkers watches me, a chilling hatred in his eyes. Who will he bleed for gold now that I'm gone? As we pass the last houses on Erfurt's outskirts, White Hands gestures towards the girl. Decker, this is your traveling companion, Britta. She is going to the capital as well. Hello, Britta says again. Surprisingly, she doesn't seem scared of me at all, even after what Elder Dirk has said. But then, she's an alaki like me. I manage a small, shy nod. Evening greetings, I mumble. Britta will explain to you more about your kind, White Hand says. She should know. She's the same as you. Well, almost. I cautiously examine Britta from the corner of my eye. She catches my look and grins again. Other than my parents and Elfred, no one's ever smiled at me so much. I fight the urge to duck my head in embarrassment. So you're new to this Alaki business too, she whispers conspiratorially. I just heard the word for the first time today. I reply, glancing down. Britta nods eagerly. I didna know about it myself until I started bleeding the cursed gold during me menses. Me DA nearly keeled over when me ma showed him mine. But they did me right, called herself. She nods at white hands. She came and took me two weeks ago. Apparently, I'm one of the lucky ones. When I glance up at her, confused, she explains, a four, most girls got executed in the temples the moment they were discovered, and their families were punished so they'd never speak of it. Now everybody gets sent to the capital. They've even started taking the younger girls, the ones who haven't been proven by the ritual of purity. The minute they suspect ye, they cut ye and that's that. Despised are the marked or scarred, the wounded and the bleeding girls. The quote from the Infinite Wisdoms rushes through my mind, and I nearly laugh at the irony, the wickedness of it all. 
Now I understand why they don't want girls to get cut or wounded before the ritual of purity. It's so the impure ones like me don't discover what we are, don't ask any questions before it's too late. It's also likely the reason they don't kill impure girls before the ritual. Kill an impure girl any other time and her family will protest, the other villagers will ask questions, voice their objections. It's the ritual that gives legitimacy to the murder. An impure girl is despised by Oyomo, her very existence an offense to him. Her murder is sanctioned by the infinite wisdoms, and who can argue with the holy books? Who would dare even try? All the families can see from then on is the demon that somehow invaded their bloodline. The sheer wickedness of it stings. Britta looks at me, pity rising in her eyes. Must have been horrible, what those bastards did to you back there. I'm so sorry for what happened to ye. More memories, all so sudden and powerful, my body trembles from the force of them. The cellar, the gold. Blood rushes to my head, and light becomes pinpricks. I close my eyes against it, faint. Ye all right? Britta asks, concerned. I slowly nod. I am, I say. Then I clear my throat try to change the subject. So what did White Hands tell you about our kind? Britta's eyebrows rise. White Hands. That's herself's name? Her surprise is so unexpected, so genuine, I smile and shake my head. I don't know what her real name is. I gave it to her because of the gauntlets. Britta nods, quickly understanding. It's bad luck to ask the emperor's emissaries directly for their names. Never invite trouble into your house, as the saying goes. I prompt her again. So what exactly am I? What are we? White hands never explained fully. Demons, Britta says, the word of Shah device through my heart. Well, they're descendants, leastways. She leans closer, eyes wide as she whispers. She says we're the descendants of the Gilded Ones. The Gilded Ones? I repeat, alarm rushing over me. I know the Gilded Ones, everyone in Oterra does. For ancient demons, they preyed upon humanity for centuries, destroying kingdom after kingdom until everyone finally banded together for protection, forming Oterra, the One Kingdom. It took several battles before the first emperor was finally able to destroy them and he only did so using the might of Oterra's combined armies. Every winter, villagers enact plays chronicling the Gilded One's defeat. Elderly aunts wear masks carved in their images to frighten naughty children, and men burn straw figures in their likeness to scare away evil. And I'm being compared to them. Being called one of them. Heart drumming a sudden and panicked beat, I rummage in my pack and unearth the golden seal white hands gave me quickly counting the stars embedded in the ansifer. When I see what's there, tears sear my eyes. Four. For stars in the symbol. For gilded ones. Why didn't I suspect this? I should have known, should have at least suspected, the moment my blood ran gold. The gilded ones were female, after all, and they were always depicted with gold veins running over their bodies. No wonder Oyomo took so long to hear me, no wonder I had to submit to the executions, the bleedings, for so long. I am an insult to the natural order itself. Britta doesn't seem to notice my despair as she smiles at me. Oh, you got one of those too, she says excitedly, holding a golden seal identical to mine. White hands gave it to me when Mima and Da handed me over. Most saddened they were to see me go, but it was. You are telling me about the Gilded Ones? I quickly remind her, trying to stop her from saying anything more about her parents, about her life before now. She's not even horrified. Not even the slightest bit disgusted by what she is. But how could she be when her parents protected her, kept her from harm, from dismemberment, while mine? Tears prick at my eyes when I remember father's words, it would have been better if you had just died. Did he even cry when he heard of my death, or was he just relieved, grateful to be free of his unnatural burden? 
Does he even think about me anymore? I dig my nails into my palms to stop the thoughts from circling and try to focus on Britta as she answers my question. Oh yes, the gilded ones, she says brightly. By the time Emperor Emika destroyed them, they'd already intermixed and had all sorts of children with humans. We're the result, their grandchildren thousands of times removed, I suppose. So we are demons, I conclude, a dull, heavy feeling settling over me. Half, Britta corrects. Less than a quarter, probably. White Hand says we change only when we near maturity, which is sixteen for our kind. Once we begin our menses, our blood gradually turns gold, and that makes our muscles and bones stronger. That's why we heal so fast and are quicker and stronger than regular folk. It's cause we're like predatory beasts now, like wolves and such. Predatory beasts. Bitterness jolts me at the words. I remember the surge of strength I experienced when the death shrieks came, remember how I could see in that dark cellar even when there weren't any torches. Now I understand why. It's because I'm no better than an animal, a fiend skulking at the edges of humanity. Perhaps that's even why I could sense the death shrieks, why mother could sense them as well. But that doesn't make sense. Mother wasn't a lackey. If she was, she would have bled the cursed gold when the red pox turned her insides to sludge, and then she would have fallen into the gilded sleep, her body taking on a golden hue and repairing itself while she slept. Then she would have come back. She would have come back. By the time herself came, I could almost lift a cow. Britta grins. Very helpful when you're milking and they begin to get all unruly. I heard you're a farm girl too. I nod slowly, but my mind is far away. I have a lot to think about. A lot to grieve. 5. The next week passes swiftly, a blur of howling snowstorms, freezing roads, and frightful nightmares. Even though I'm no longer in the cellar, I sometimes have dreams that the walls are closing in on me again, that the elders are approaching, knives and buckets in hand, gold lust in their eyes. I wake up in the wagon crying, chest heaving with great sobs, while Britta edges ever nearer, concern in her eyes. I know she would hold me if I let her, but I'm not ready to be touched by another person's hands. Most days, I just feel like screaming until my throat collapses. Sometimes, when I wake, the furs covering me are in tatters. I've ripped them apart in my sleep, shredded the tough leather underpinnings as if they were parchment. Even the strongest men in the village couldn't manage such a feat more confirmation I'm unnatural, the spawn of reviled demons rather than a child of humanity. It's almost a relief when I look up after eight days of travelling to find we're in Gomelonis, the port city where we'll board the ship to the capital, Homera. The entire city is smothered in darkness when we arrive, the ramshackle, soot-covered buildings huddled against each other, dim oil lamps lighting murky interiors. Our ship, the salt whistle, creaks at the dock, an aged, squat passenger vessel with graying sails and chipped blue paint on its sides. Wiry sailors dart across the snow-slick deck, settling passengers, hauling baggage and supplies. Families huddle together against the cold, mothers in their plain brown travel masks, fathers with miniature copies of the infinite wisdoms on their belts to ensure traveling mercies. The moment we board, I find a quiet corner and look up at the night sky. Bright green and purple lights are rippling across it, the northern lights, heralding the return of Oyomo's chariot to its southern home. It's a sign, after all those weeks in the cellar, Oyomo has finally answered my prayers. I'm on my way to Himera, to my new life as a soldier in the Emperor's army, a life that will bring me absolution. Thank you, thank you. The prayer of gratitude circles my mind. Enjoying the view? White Hands is approaching, Britta and the Equus at her side. As usual, there's that look in her eyes, that amused smirk that's always visible under the shadow of her half-mask. It makes the skin on my arms prickle, an uneasiness I do my best to stifle. What if White Hands is lying? What if all of this is a trick? an underhanded plot to corral all our kind into the same place. 
I wouldn't put it past her. I've never met anyone so secretive in my life, not even the priests. Britta and I have spent over a week in her company, and she still hasn't told us her real name. We now call her White Hands outright, since she's made no objections. I school my features and turn to her. It's beautiful, I reply. Isn't it? Britta is in such a hurry to join the conversation now that I'm talking, she doesn't even pay attention to her surroundings as she walks over. Almost reminds me of the sky in ARGHH, she yelps, tripping over a mound of netting, but she's up in seconds, dusting herself off and smiling ruefully, not a hint of embarrassment to her. Almost broke me neck. Lucky our kind is hard to kill, ain't that right, white hands, she quips. The older woman shrugs. Most are lucky die very easily, actually, she murmurs. Britta's forehead wrinkles. But what about the gilded sleep, she asks. That happens only if it's an almost death. It's my turn to frown now. An almost death? I ask, walking closer. I've never heard of such a thing. For a lackey, there are two types of death, White Hands explains. Almost deaths and final ones. Almost deaths are fleeting, impermanent things. They result in the week-long gilded sleep, which heals the body of all wounds and scars, except, of course, those acquired before the blood turns. A chill shudders through me. I no longer have any scars not even the ones from childhood. They all disappeared the moment I had my first almost death. I'm so uneasy now, I barely notice Britta frowning down at a tiny scar on her hand. Guess I'll never get rid of this, then, she says and sighs. White hands ignores her and continues. An alaki can have several almost deaths, but she has only one final death, one method by which she can truly be killed. For the vast majority of a lackey, it's either burning, drowning, or beheading. If an alaki doesn't die from one of these, she's practically immortal. I suddenly feel lightheaded. Practically immortal. I don't want to remain undying forever, to live despised and reviled as I am. I don't want to remain like this one moment longer than I have to. I have to win absolution. I have to. Beside me, Britta has an odd look on her face. Immortal. She breathes. Then she gasps. Does that mean we can live forever? I said practically, white hands corrects her. Nothing is undying except the gods. Your kind does, however, age very slowly, hundreds of years to each human one. Add to that the swift healing, the ability to see in the dark. And no wonder people are so frightened of your kind, especially the ones that are hard to kill, like Decker. Britta's eyes flit to me again, and I tense, waiting for that look to come into them, that disgust I saw so often reflected in the elder's eyes. But she's not even looking at me. Her entire face is screwed in thought as she stares at white hands. White hands, she asks. When the older woman turns to her, she continues. We're not going to start eating people, are we? I mean, the gilded ones did, and we're their descendants with all these abilities in. Have you started developing sharp teeth? White Hands asks, cutting her off. What? Britta frowns, taken aback. I mean, no, but. Does the thought of eating human flesh appeal to you? Disgust mottles Britta's face. No, of course not. Then don't ask me any more stupid questions. Eating people indeed. White hands humps, shaking her head. She motions for us to leave. Run along and secure your beds. It's a long journey to Himera. As Britta and I walk towards the stairs leading down into the hold, Britta grumbles to herself. I don't think it was a silly question, she mutters. All that talk of predators and seeing in the dark and such, it was a logical conclusion. Britta sounds so offended, a laugh bubbles inside me, momentarily pushing aside my dread. 
I try to hold on to the feeling as we walk through the door and enter the hold. Here we are. Britta's cheerful voice is like a balm to my thoughts, which have been steadily darkening since I entered the hold. I try not to notice the shadows, the walls curving inwards. Try not to notice the black edging my vision, the sweat dripping down my back. This isn't the cellar. This isn't the cellar. I whisper to myself. The cellar was dark, still. It smelled of blood and pain, not sour wine and seawater. There were no torches flickering in the shadows, no passengers unpacking their belongings and settling into their spaces. I force my attention back to Britta, who's pointing at the corner we've been given, where there's just enough space to spread out two pallets and string a curtain for privacy. Once we put our pallets down, it'll almost feel like home, she says. There's a strange note in her voice, but she avoids my eyes when I glance at her, and hurriedly bustles about, chattering ever more cheerfully. Course, it could use a few touches. Meb a bright cloth or something. But it really is nice, really it is. Her voice sounds even more strained now, and when I look down, I see that her hands have clenched her skirts so tight, her fingers have turned the color of bone. Finally, I understand. Just like me, Britta has been branded impure, wrenched from everything she ever knew, and forced into a terrifying new life. Family, friends, even the village she grew up in is lost to her. For the first time in her life, she's completely alone in the world. And she's afraid. That's why she tried to get closer all this week, comforting me when I cried from my nightmares, pretending not to notice whenever I screamed for no reason. She's not like me, used to being alone, being hated. She needs to be accepted, to be part of a community. Except I'm the only community she has now, she and I connected by our demon ancestors and the golden blood that binds us. That's why she was always there, waiting if ever I wanted to reach out and talk to her. But I've been so focused on my own misery, I never did. I try to breathe back the crowding darkness as I turn to her. It must have been difficult, leaving behind your family, your village, I whisper. A tentative opening to conversation. Britta's eyes flick to mine, and her chin trembles slightly. It was, but they'll be waiting for me when I return. Her lips firm into a bright, determined smile. A mask that does its utmost to hide the pain, the uncertainty shining in her eyes. Once I'm pure, she declares, I'm going back home to me village. And then I'll see me ma and da and all me friends. I nod quietly, not knowing what to say. That's good. It's good to have friends. We should be friends. Britta leans closer, her mask of a smile desperately brittle at the edges. I know we just met, she says, and I know after what happened, you find it difficult to trust anyone, but Himera's a long way away, and I don't want to do this alone. You're the only one who understands what it feels like. Who understands? She extends her hand. Friends, she asks, hope and fear shining in her face. I look down, considering her extended hand. Friends. What if she betrays me like everyone else did? Like father, our owners, the elders. But no, Britta isn't one of the people who cast me out and tortured me, she's an Alaki, the first and only one I've ever met. And she needs me just as much as I need her. Friends. I agree, taking her hand. Britta beams, eagerly moving closer. I've been so afraid of going to Himera, of becoming a soldier, she confesses, a river of words rushing out of her. It's as if she's been saving them up this entire week, a dam just waiting to burst. Now that we have each other, Meb it won't be that bad. Meb you can even come with me back to me village when it's all over. I know yours wasn't the best. And anyway, everyone's friendly in Golma, and we have lots of handsome boys too. Course they won't be the same ones I left behind, but there'll be all sorts of lovely ones to pick from. She peers at me speculatively. Ye ever kissed a boy, Decker? What, me? 
No, never. Where did the question even come from? I've never spoken to anyone about such a thing before, but Britta, it seems, has no such reservations now that the gates have opened. I did once, during one of the village festivals. It was bad, very bad. His mouth tasted like sour milk. She wrinkles her nose, turns to me. So why didn't ye, kiss a boy, I mean? I look down, that awful feeling rising inside me again. No one ever wanted me, I whisper. Besides, Elder Dirk has always told us kissing led to impurity, and I tried so desperately to be pure, for all the good it did me. Britta frowns. Why? You're so pretty. She actually sounds perplexed. I'm not. I shake my head, awful memories of Iona's, smile on his face, sword in his hand, flashing across my mind. Girls as pretty as you. What awful lies he told. Britta's snort cuts through the awful memory. Ye are pretty, Decker, she says. Your hair curls around your face all pretty like, and your skin is nice and brown even in this deep winter. Then she adds, as if it's an afterthought, and you're shapely. Men like shapely women. And plump ones. She grins. They've always liked me. But they don't like southerners, at least, not in effort. Then maybe it's a good thing we're headed south, Britta says, patting my arm as the ship creaks into motion. I nod, sending a silent prayer up to Oyomo that this proves true. 6. Decca, Decca, wake up. Please wake up. We're here, we're here. Britta's voice comes as if from far away when I wake, the heat around me so overwhelming it feels like a boulder pressing down on my chest. The remnant of a dream teases at my thoughts, heavy and insistent. I try to grab onto it, but it disappears when a large, warm weight insistently shakes my shoulder. I'm getting up, I say, blinking open my eyes. To my surprise, the light around me has changed. It's not the cool blue of winter but the warm yellow of deep summer. Even stranger, the smells of the sea now are mixed with a new, exotic fragrance. Flowers. But I've never smelled flowers like these. These are subtle and elegantly scented, their fragrance shimmering around me on delicate waves. Where's the smell of ice and snow? Where's the cold? I turn to Britta, whose eyes are wide with relief. Why is it so warm? I rasp, confused. My tongue is as dry as our haystacks in midsummer, and sweat slicks my hair and clothes so they stick to my skin. Britta hugs me tightly. I thought you would never wake. It's been four weeks. White hands told me you would, but four whole weeks. Four weeks? I frown, pulling away from her. When my muscles protest this simple movement, I wince, startled. Why do they feel so tight? What do you mean, for weeks? You've been asleep for almost a month. This explanation comes from White Hands, who's watching me calmly from against the wall. Sunlight filters bright and warm through the door at the top of the stairs behind her. It shimmers over Brahma and Masima, whose heavy fur coats and boots are long gone. They're bare chested in the heat talons flexing against the wooden floor. Flies buzz around them, and they whip them away with their tails. A month? I echo, flabbergasted. Naughty Alaki, to make her friends worry. Masima TSKS, shaking his head. But the quiet one needed her rest, Masima, Brahma says, tossing his black striped hair. You were too if you knew you'd be traveling for weeks in a nasty, Nasty ships hold after being trapped by priests in a nasty, nasty temple cellar. But I'd at least tell you I was sleeping a long time, Brahma, Masima sniffs. White Hands gets annoyed by their back and forth. She points to the stairs, where the other passengers are now filing out towards the door. Upstairs with you both, she commands. Prepare the wagon. Yes, my lady, they chime 
their talons clacking up the wooden steps. I'm so sorry, I don't know why, how, I slept so long, I say, still in shock. I turn to white hands. Is that something that happens to a lackey? Is it normal? No, she replies. But you needed your rest. Experiences such as the one you had can take their toll. Even humans, when faced with your circumstances, sleep away their pain. Better now than when you reach the Warthu bearer. I frown. The Warthu bearer. I've never heard those words before. The training ground where me and ye are assigned, Britta says excitedly, tapping the old Himeran symbol on the back of her seal. That's what this symbol means. It's the most elite one. My forehead scrunches in confusion. Why would we be sent to the most elite ground when we haven't even done any training yet? I can't comprehend it. I can't comprehend anything right now. That dream resurfaces, a vague memory edging at my thoughts. It flitters away when white hands passes us each small sticks of what looks like charcoal. I recognize them immediately, Tazali. My mother used to line her eyes with it every day to protect them from the sun. Rub this on your eyes. You'll need it. We depart upon the hour. Yes, white hands, we say as she leaves. Once she's gone, Britta and I apply the tazali using a small jug of water as a mirror. My hands tremble as I rub the stick against my eyelids. My muscles have become so weak now, every tiny movement has them howling in protest. It's even worse when I begin packing up what remains of my things. When did I eat last? And how could I have slept so long? My limbs feel rubbery, new, the way they felt every time I woke up after the gilded sleep. Even worse, there's a strange feeling somewhere deep inside me, as if something is changing, growing. I can't help but feel that I've become different somehow, in a way I don't yet understand. Britta watches me the entire time, a perplexed look in her eyes. What is it? I ask, my mind still racing. Why is it that you survive even when you do not eat, she whispers. When I glance at her, startled, she explains, you didn't have a bite of food or even a drop of water. I had to eat all your meals so the other passengers wouldn't notice you were asleep for the entire journey. I told them you were sick, that's why you weren't moving or talking. But they would have wondered about you if you never ate. So I ate for you. I mean, I knew you were strange, but this. Her voice lowers to a whisper. This is unnatural, Decker. Unnatural. There it is, that word again. I know Britta didn't mean to hurt me, but the word still stings. Even worse, it's true. I don't feel any hunger anymore. It's disappeared, vanished to a place where I cannot find it. I shrug sadly, trying to push back all the horrible feelings rising inside me, the fears at this new, worrying sign of my impurity. I don't know. It's never happened before. It must be like White Hand says, I was sleeping away everything that happened in that cell. Are ye hungry now? she asks, quickly. I know she's interrupting so I don't have to finish the devastating words. I nod gratefully. I suppose I could eat. She quickly hooks my elbow with hers, offering me a bright smile. Then let's feed ye before your stomach starts dancing the northern jig, she says, pulling me up the stairs. We emerge to sunlight so blinding, I have to shade my eyes against the glare. Crowds upon crowds of people mill across the docks, their voices a formidable wave of sound emerging from every ship, street, and stall. There are too many people, too many sounds. I have to fight the urge to block my ears. Oyomo preserve us! Britta exclaims. Have you ever seen so many people in your life? As I shake my head, speechless, Britta waves goodbye to the sailors and other passengers. To my surprise, they wave cheerfully back. Travel blessings, Britta, a grizzled old sailor calls. Britta beams in return. And the same on your next journey, Kelma.
When she sees me looking, she shrugs. We became friends, she explains. Then she leans closer, whispering, they told me all sorts of things over the journey. Death shrieks have been attacking Himera. Every night, a few of them slip in, and no one knows how. My eyes widen. Death shrieks in the capital. How is that even possible? It said the walls of Himera are impenetrable, that the city itself has been made into a walled garden impervious to siege. That those creatures could already be here, so close, my mind shudders at the thought. And what do they say about us, the Alaki? I ask. She shrugs. People don't know about us yet. Only the priests and elders know. But then, they've always known. I nod bitterly, until a motion catches my attention, white hands, beckoning to us from the docks, where Brahma and Masima are already saddling themselves to her wagon. Hurry, hurry, quiet one, Brahma calls. The day is passing faster and faster. I hasten my pace, aware that people are giving Britta and me curious stares. We're two unmasked girls of ritual age, no male guardian present to oversee us. It won't be long now before we're stopped. Just as I think this, a plump, pious-looking man, embossed infinite wisdom scroll under his arm, separates from the crowd and begins walking towards us, a severe look on his face. Before he can reach us, however, white hands smoothly cuts in front of him, waving us onward. Come along now, girls, she says loudly. Himera awaits, as does your service to our great empire. The emperor's seal swings officiously from her belt. The man's eyes flicker to it, and then to us. He hisses under his breath about ungodly women as he walks away, disgusted. I hate pompous, puffed up meddlers, don't you? White hands humphs. Not waiting for us to answer, she points upward. Look. The gates of Himera. As my eyes follow her hand, my jaw drops when I see the colossal walls rising above the docks, twin warrior statues guarding each of its gates. So these are the walls of Himera father always told me about. Father. I stifle the thought by concentrating on the walls. There are only three. Three walls with three gates. Why? I turn to white hands to ask, but she's gesturing towards the nearest and largest entrance. We're headed for Gate Emika, she says, nodding at the twin statues of the same stern warrior with a crown upon his head. Emperor Emika, the first emperor of Oterra, I recognize him immediately. Tall and dark, hair closely cropped, except for the beard. His image is engraved in every temple and every hall. Those stern eyes, flaring nostrils, mouth tight and severe, are unmistakable, and so are the statues now soaring above us, their swords casting massive shadows on the crowds gathering below. I look up at them, fear and unease rushing through me. Well, here we are, I whisper, bracing myself with a deep breath. Here we are, Britta agrees, doing the same. Her face is even paler than usual, no trace of a smile on her lips. Her hand nudges mine, and I squeeze it, nod tightly. She doesn't have to say what she's thinking, I already know. She and I will survive this, together. White Hands leads us directly to Gate Emika, where a river of people and animals is already streaming into the city. Westerners, Easterners, Southerners, Northerners, they all vie for space with horses, camels, and other, more exotic animals I recognize only from father's scrolls. Aurelians, hulking silver-furred apes with strangely human-like faces, pull nearby chariots, their sharp horns blunted by curved golden sheaths. Mammoths plod at the front of caravans, multiple tusks protruding underneath their long, flexible trunks, ivory spikes all along their gigantic, leathery grey backs, and yet more spikes at the rounded ends of their tails. Caravan masters sit inside little tents atop them, blowing horns to herald their approach. I wish mother was here. She was always telling me about the southern provinces. Even though she never regretted leaving to marry father, 
She always missed the lands of her birth. All she ever wanted was for me to see them someday. To see the other side of my bloodline. She would never have imagined me coming here as a newly recruited soldier. Britta points to the Emperor's guards manning the gates. Would you look at all those Jatu, Dekka, she says, gaping. Unlike the ones we saw up north, these Jatu are wearing not armor and war masks, but splendid red robes, as they direct the lines of travelers and carefully inspect their documents. They all have the Jatu insignia, the golden lion against the rising sun, pinned to their shoulders. They look very officious, I reply, a twinge of unease running through me. I'm distracted from them by a flash of blue. A carriage rattles past us, led by two large lizard-like creatures with wings. They make strange squawking noises deep in their throats. Zerizards! I gasp, excited. Another type of creature mother told me about. They're found only in the south, where the sun is warm and the forests are endless. I squint, trying to take in their feathery blue tails, the bright red plumage crowning their heads. My mother loved riding them when she was young, I say. They're beautiful, Britta replies, in awe. Bremer sniffs, tossing his black striped hair. They're not as impressive as us, are they, Masaima? Certainly not, Masaima agrees. You're both very beautiful too, I soothe. The Equus twins stomp their annoyance as they lead the wagon away from the main gate towards a small side entrance, where a line of ominous-looking wagons gathers. The drivers are wearing black robes similar to white hands's, their faces hidden by heavy cloth hoods. At the sight of all those iron-barred doors and windows, my blood races faster and faster. These must be the wagons carrying the other alaki. Each one looks big enough to hold at least six. Britta shifts uncomfortably in her seat. It's the others, isn't it? Most likely, I reply. I can almost feel the despair rising from the wagons. Britta reaches out her hand, and I take it. We remain silent while White Hands leads the wagon to the front of the line, where two Jatu are playing Awara, a southern board game Mother loved. The moment they glimpse her, they jerk to attention. My lady. They salute, rushing to open the narrow gate. To my surprise, they are both speaking Otteran instead of Himeran. But then, Himeran is the language of the nobles and the aristocracy, the language used in the infinite wisdoms. The only reason I even know how to understand it is because father's father forced everyone in the family to memoize the infinite wisdoms as penance for our long ago impurity. I don't know why I expected common Jatu to use it. The gate comes open with a small squeak, and I return my attention to the road before me. My eyes widen nearly past their sockets. There, just beyond the gate, is a massive lake, which shimmers into the horizon. The city rises from its center, a series of lush green hills connected by high, arching wooden bridges. Rivers and waterfalls cut through like streets, with cheerfully painted boats gliding across them, their embroidered umbrellas protecting passengers from the sun. Oyomo preserve us, Britta breathes, staring at all the sights. Have you ever seen anything like this in your life? As I shake my head, unable to voice an answer, something else seizes my attention, the majestic building thrusting up from the peak of Himera's highest hill like a jagged crown. I've seen it numerous times before, printed on every Otteran coin. Oyomo's Eye, the ancient palace of the Himeran emperors. The Kuru, Oyomo's sacred sun symbol, decorates its multiple spires, and groups of smaller buildings, the halls of administration, cluster among the hills below it. I recognize them immediately from every description of the capital I've ever heard. It's all so splendid, so, much, I can barely comprehend it. So this is Himera, the city of emperors. Be careful to close your mouths before flies invade them, says White Hands, laughing at my astonishment as the Equus canter happily into the bustling thoroughfares. It's good to be home, brother, Masima says, grinning. No more the itchy furs and the cold, brother, Bremer agrees. 
The deeper we go into the city, the more crowded it becomes. Zerazard and Equus pulled carriages battle for space on tightly packed streets. Along the pavement stroll pedestrians, most of them male, all of them luxuriously robed and groomed, with precious jewels threading red clay starched beards, Tazali swirling in elaborate patterns around masculine eyes. The few women about are even more elaborately masked here than they are in the north, gold and silver gleaming on every face instead of wood and parchment. There are several variations, round sun masks to glorify Oyomo, silver fertility masks, cheeks exaggerated like the pregnant moon, oval good luck masks, beaded symbols to invite blessings on the forehead and chin, black formal masks, horns curving from smooth obsidian foreheads. Even some of the little girls here wear half masks, visible representations of their family's wealth molded in gold and silver. A pang of sadness passes over me whenever I see them. I'll never wear a mask now, never be able to adorn myself in the sacred coverings of purity. The thought flitters away as we head deeper into the city. Something else has attracted my attention, a dull, almost indistinguishable humming that becomes louder the closer we get to the central bridges. By the time we reach the massive bridge that leads towards the central hill upon which the palace and other administrative buildings stand, it's a roar reverberating in my bones. Do you hear that? I ask Britta. She nods, brows furrowed in confusion. What do you suppose it is? Emika's tears, white hands replies, turning to us. I frown at her. Emika's tears. White hands points, and I follow her finger towards a gap in the city's walls, where a single statue rises, this one female. Keep watching, she instructs, leading the Equus towards the topmost portion of the bridge. The moment we reach its peak, the breath rushes out of me. There, at the very edge of the city, a massive waterfall cascades into the endless sea below. Now I understand why Himera has only three walls. The capital is a city on a cliff, the waterfall at its edge an unscalable barrier against any force that would seek to attack from the sea. The statue I saw thrusts from the edge of the waterfall, a woman with tightly curled hair and a slender but sinewy build. She gazes out into the water, her arm outstretched towards the horizon in warning. Fatty the Relentless, mother of the first emperor and keeper of the waters around Himera, White Hands explains, her words piercing through my awe. There's a tone in her voice, an emotion I don't understand. Sadness. Regret. A fitting sight to end your journey. Now it's on to Jaw Hall. She gestures towards the administrative buildings rising just below the palace. Prepare yourselves. I silently nod, anxiety knotting in my chest as the Equus continue onwards, talons clacking over the main bridge. Oyomo's eye looms above us, a silent condemnation. Our journey will soon be over. Our new lives are about to begin. By the time we reach the streets bordering the administrative buildings, dread has coiled like a hooded snake in my stomach. I barely notice how orderly the streets are here, barely notice the lush gardens clinging to grand, towering buildings almost as old as Oterra itself. All I can think about is my impending change in circumstances. What will Hemera hold for me? Will it be as White Hands promised? Will any of her promises hold true? There's still that lingering doubt, that prickle of unease I get whenever I'm in her presence. Please let them be true, I pray silently as we make our way down the street. We're approaching an enormous red building, the Jatu insignia prominently displayed on its banners. Jaw Hall, the Hall of Administration for the Jatu. Father spoke so often of it from his time in the military, I recognize it by sight. Lines of girls are wrapped around its side, an acrid, unpleasantly familiar smell wafting from them, the stench of unwashed bodies. I know then, even without asking, that those girls are a lackey. The same shivery feeling I felt with Britta trickles through me. Nausea churns my gut the nearer we pull to them. The other alaki are all painfully thin, their clothes torn and dirty, their feet bare and scabbed over. Not a single mask covers their faces, no cloaks or cowls protect their modesty from the burly, 
black-robed guards who leer as they check the symbols on the back of their seals before directing them into different lines. A few are wounded, blood dripping from their robes, scars crisscrossing exposed arms and shoulders. They haven't died, at least not recently. Their wounds and scars would have already been completely repaired by the gilded sleep if they had. But then, physical death isn't the worst thing an alaki can suffer. I can tell from the haunted expressions in the other girls' eyes, from the way they don't resist when they're roughly unloaded, seven, eight at a time, from the backs of wagons, that they've all suffered greatly. Even when the guards prod them towards Jaw Hall, its banners flapping sullenly in the breeze, most of them don't make a sound. What methods did the other transporters use to keep the girls in line? A chill shivers through me just thinking about it. Thank Oyomo for white hands. A surprising thought, but nonetheless true. Despite all my doubts about her, the most she ever did during our journey was lock the wagon's doors at night so we wouldn't run away. She never hit or abused us, never belittled us with foul words, though I suspect all these things and more happened to the other girls. I wait, anxiety growing, as she stops the wagon before the hall, then walks over to open the back for us. This is where we part ways, Alaki, she says, beckoning for us to dismount. I do so tentatively, arms folded tightly over myself. The guards are watching us now, scowls burning into my shoulders. I suddenly wish I had my old cloak, the one I left in effort. It was tattered and shabby, but it always protected me from view, always made me feel safe. Here, I have no such shielding, not even the half-mask I'd imagined I'd be wearing by now. As I shuffle to the front of the wagon, stomach lurching, palms sweating, the Equus twins turn towards me with mournful expressions. We must say goodbye now, Alaki, Brahma says with a pout. We liked all the winter apples you gave us, quiet one, Masima adds, glancing at me. They were very delicious. Next time we see each other, I will give you more apples, I say softly, petting him and his brother. They nod, and I turn to white hands. The side of her mouth is quirked, as usual, but her eyes are shuttered behind her half-mask. She seems almost regretful as she glances at me, although I don't understand why. White hands, I. I must leave you now, she says, stopping me with a gesture. She glances from me to Britta. Do not be stupid, and you won't die too many times. We both nod quietly. She reaches over and squeezes our hands. It's the most affection she's ever shown us in the time we've traveled together, and the very gesture heightens the fear rising inside me. I try to stifle it as White Hands continues her farewell. Remember, this will be tough, but you will overcome it. May fortune guide you, she whispers. I wish the same for you, I reply, but she's already walking to her wagon. She rides on, Brahma and Masima waving goodbye. As she disappears, that fear coils tighter inside me, accelerating my heartbeat. Please, please, please let me be able to endure what's next. 7. They were hurt, weren't they? the other girls. Britta asks some minutes later. I don't answer, my muscles too tight with tension to even speak as we walk down the dark, cavernous hallways in Jaw Hall. Each leads to a chamber for one of the different Alaki training grounds. Judging from the number of lines, there are ten. As Britta and I keep pace with the line headed towards the chamber for the Warthu Bearer, the training ground White Hands told us about, the other girls cower against one another, some of them sobbing under their breath, others trembling with every step. They're scared of the Jatu patrolling the corridors, the ones with the Ansatha, the star symbol, gleaming on their shoulders. White Hands warned Britta and I about these Jatu, told us to treat them with caution. They've been specially trained to subdue both Alaki and Death Shrieks and, as such, are much more brutal than their compatriots. They are the reason the odor of sweat and fear has been rising steadily ever since we entered the hall. Well, one of the reasons. 
The other is the girls with torn robes and hooded eyes that shuffle beside us, their movements slow and stiff as if their souls have been snatched right out of their bodies. I recognize that look, that posture. It's the same one elder Durkas as temple maidens sometimes have. The one that tells everyone they're not maidens anymore. Once again, I'm grateful for white hands. What would have happened to us had we had other transporters, male ones? I shudder to think of it, the price some of the girls here have already paid to earn their absolution. Decker? Britta prompts, her eyes flicking back to the empty-eyed girls. They were hurt in more ways than we can imagine, I finally answer, my expression grim. She glances at me, fearful tears glazing her eyes. We were lucky, weren't we? I squeeze her hand. We still are, I whisper firmly. We have each other. And I mean it, mean every word. I'm lucky to have Britta at my side, to have someone else to endure this with. She nods as we reach the double doors at the end of the hall. The room we enter is so immense, it's hard to see the other side of it. Ornate golden carvings decorate glossy black stone walls, and the floor is much the same. I struggle to keep my mouth closed, I'm in such awe. The only black stone I've ever seen was in Erfurt's temple, and there was only enough of it to decorate the altar. The amount in this room could keep every family in Erfurt fed for a thousand years or more. Even more daunting is the line of boys waiting for us, all of them wearing armor and war masks. I nearly stumble at the sight. There are about 100 boys in total, roughly the same number as we are lackey, and they're standing at attention, back straight, hands over their hearts. They range in age from 16 to about 20, and they all seem stern and forbidding, their eyes filled with disgust behind their war masks. My heartbeat doubles into a frantic, fearful beat. I have to physically resist the urge to clasp my arms over myself. What's happening? Why are they here? Britta asks, moving nervously closer to me. I shake my head. I don't know. I'm so unnerved by the sight of all those boys, it's some moments before I notice the platforms. Ten in number, they thrust, solid and imposing, high into the air above us, stairs trailing up either side. Officials sit in eight of them, yellow robes spread out, scrolls and ink pots at their fingertips. The center two, however, are occupied by Jatu commanders, both tall and dark and wearing war masks. My eyes are immediately drawn to the commander on the left. It's not just his hair, which is braided in an intricate style and daubed with bright red clay, but his stature, which is smaller than the others and more graceful despite its muscularity. He seems almost female, but that can't be possible. Women are not allowed to be Jatu commanders. Straighten the line, the guard beside us calls, startling me out of my gawking. As he pushes the girl in front of me forward, an angry shout suddenly echoes through the hall. Get your filthy hands off me! It comes from the end of the hall, where a tall, thin girl is struggling against a group of transporters, at least four of them. She pushes so fiercely, a few go flying into the wall. I rub my eyes, blinking again and again to make sure I'm seeing what I'm seeing. She shook the transporters away like they were fleas. I've never seen that done before, not even by a man. Is this the alaki strength White Hands told us about, the one that sometimes allowed me to rip apart the fur blankets as I slept? When she grabs a sword from one of the transporters and brandishes it threateningly, a few of the Jatu run over, spears raised. Within moments, they're circling, sharpened spear tips inches from the girl's throat. Let her go. Everyone turns, as do I, towards this sudden and powerful command. It comes from the tall, well-muscled boy now emerging from the line, each of his steps slow, deliberate as he walks towards the proud girl. She is a soldier in the war against the Death Shrieks, he declares in the clipped and clearly articulated manner of someone more used to speaking Himeran than Otterin. And soldiers have rights. Rights? The word circles in my mind, shimmering and unbelievable. 
Rights are the domain of men and boys, not women, and certainly not a lackey. Even so, the word blossoms, like a distant hope I'm afraid to even touch. Is that not so, Captain Kelechi? The boy glances at the taller commander. To my surprise, the commander nods. Indeed, recruit Cater, he replies. Everyone here has rights, although there are some that would stretch them to the bounds of common decency. He turns a disapproving eye towards the proud girl, who spits on the floor in disgust. Making an irritated sound in his throat, the commander motions the boy, Cater, forward. Inform her of her rights as a new member of the Emperor's army, recruit Cater. Yes, sir. Cater walks towards the proud girl, removing his helmet and war mask as he goes. I'm startled to discover his dark like me, well, darker, although his hair is so closely cropped as to make him look bald, and his eyes are golden and sharp as a hawk's. He's about sixteen or so, but there's a hardness to his eyes, an experience that speaks of a deeper maturity. Who is Cater, that he knows the commander so well? His armor seems different from that of the other Jatu, more ornate. Father once told me that each Jatu's armor is inscribed with Himeran symbols celebrating battles long ago fought, victories won. Katers has several more symbols than any Jatu armor I've ever seen, and an emblem of a snarling Aurelian adorns each shoulder. Perhaps it is an heirloom passed down to him by a father or uncle. The aristocracy have several such items. Either way, it marks him as something more than the Jatu surrounding him. Richer, undoubtedly. He must be one of the Himeran nobles I've always heard so much about. It would explain his relationship with the commander, as well as why he feels so comfortable speaking out of turn. Mistrust lines the girl's proud, refined features as he approaches. Come no closer, she snarls, her dusky brown skin flushed with anger. I will listen to no more of your lies. Soldiers in the Emperor's army? Absolution. Lies, all lies. You just want our blood on this floor, so you can sell it, you worthless bastards. She jabs her sword towards him. Cater lifts his hands in an appeasing gesture. It is the truth. You are free to do as you like, he says. He glances to the rest of us. You are all free to do as you like. If you wish to leave now, you may do so. Whispers rise into the air, uncertain but hopeful. Beside me, Britta shifts. Do you think it's real, what he says? For one brief, glittering moment, I allow myself to believe in Cater, allow myself to believe in his words. Then I remember Iona's, remember how he thrust that sword into my belly only hours after telling me how I pretty I was. Tension clenches my body again. Cater will be no different when the time comes. No matter what he does now, he will show his true colors soon enough. They all do. No, I say, shaking my head. I watch with jaded eyes as the other Jatu turn to the commanders in protest. But, Captain Kelechi, one Jatu gasps. Surely you will not let this stand, another pleads. The taller commander lifts his hand for silence. Recruit Cater is correct, he booms. Either the Alaki want to be here or they don't. An unwilling soldier is a useless one. You're all free to leave if you desire, but remember that you are impure, and the world outside will only ever see that. Not to mention death shrieks will come hunting for you wherever you hide. He nods and the Jatu reluctantly open the door, following his command. I watch all this, tense, as does Britta. Around us, the girls murmur among themselves, wondering what to do. Cater steps forward once more. We can guarantee your safety to the border of Himera, he says. After that, it's up to you. He glances pointedly at the proud girl, and whatever hope I had crumples like ashes in my mouth. There it is, the condition. Yes. We can flee here, but once we leave Himera's gates, we return to our old lives, to the death mandate, the constant threat of death shrieks. 
Kata is just like all the rest, giving us impossibilities and calling them choices. The proud girl seems to know this, because she looks from the open door back to him. We have your word, she asks distrustfully, glancing from him to the commander, who nods. I swear upon Oyomo's kuru, Kata replies, referring to the sacred sun symbol. I will, however, say this, you can make something of yourself at the training grounds. You can be fighters, and once you're done, you will be given absolution. Or you can spend your lives as outcasts, always fearing the death mandate. The truth of the matter is simple, you're either with us or against us. The choice is up to you. Giving her a quick, short bow, he returns to his position in line. I'm thankful he's gone, angry at myself that I almost believed their words. Why did I think, even for a moment, that he would be different from my owners and all the others? My attention returns to the girl now standing in the middle of the hall, her eyes shadowed and dark. She looks towards the door again, and then back at the line. Her gaze flickers between the two, door, line, line, door. I can see her mind racing, making the same calculations mine has. Finally, she makes her choice. She straightens her back and walks over to her line, as regal as a queen. She's staying. I can almost feel Kata's pleased smile as, slowly but surely, the other girls follow her lead. 8. Once all the girls are back in line and everything is as it was, the taller commander walks to the edge of his platform and removes his war mask. His face is both haughty and commanding at once, so dark it's almost the color of the midnight sky, and so severe, his severe, dark brown eyes pierce us from above cheekbones sharp as knives. I am Captain Kelechi, commander of the Jatu assigned to the War Thubera, your honor training ground, he declares, his voice ringing through the hall. Before you stand the newest recruits to the War Thubera. He gestures to the line of boys, who quickly remove their helmets and war masks. They are here to serve as your Yuruni, your brothers in arms. After your first three weeks of initial training are completed, they will join you and provide aid for the coming months of combat. It is our hope that you will form lasting and deep partnerships with them, which will extend well past the time you leave these walls. Brothers? Britta whispers under her breath, her dismayed expression echoing my own. I can't imagine any of those haughty looking boys as our new brothers. Beside us, a girl with long braids scoffs under her breath, more like spies, ensuring that we remain firmly in our places. The captain continues, ignoring the rising whispers, as you all no doubt know, death shrieks have begun massing in their primal nesting ground near the Enoyo Mountains, hundreds of thousands of them. Hundreds of thousands. Britta whispers, an echo of my panicked thoughts. I knew there were a lot of death shrieks, but I could have never imagined the true scope of their numbers. What you may not know is that Himera lies on their path. That is why Emperor Jizo has decided that all Alaki, even the neophytes, must go on monthly raids, both thinning out their forces and preparing yourselves for the campaign. You must know everything about your enemy, every strength, every weakness, before you face them on the battlefield, and the recruits will aid you in this task. Whispers explode. Monthly raids. Does he mean we'll actually have to face death shrieks out in the wild? As my breath catches in horror, Captain Kelechi continues, in the coming months, you will face the most fearsome monsters in all of Oterra, but you will not face them alone. Your new Yuruni will be with you every step of the way. Even when you're completing your initial training, they'll be just on the other side of the wall, waiting to join you, your brothers in arms. He motions to the recruits, and they march to form a single line behind him, their bodies at attention. The smaller commander, who has remained silent all this while, motions for us to do the same. It takes us a little more time, the Jatu shoving at us, but after some moments, we are standing in an opposite line, so that the two commanders face each other. Once we're in place, the captain and his silent companion motion again, and the recruits take one step to the side, then slowly begin to file past our line. 
Now I understand. This is how we receive our partners, by matching with whichever Jatu stops next to us when Captain Kelechi calls for a halt. My heart rises to my throat with each step the recruits take. Please don't match me with a cool boy, or one who hates a lackey, I silently beg Oyomo. Ionazi's face flashes in my memory, and I push it away, praying even harder. Please, please, please. The procession continues, seeming to stretch on forever as the recruit line continues slowly and deliberately towards the end of hours. Boys walk past, tall, short, plump, thin, southerners, easterners, westerners, northerners, all with similar forbidding looks on their faces, many with barely hidden sneers. I'm so nervous now, my hands are sweating and my stomach is in knots. I'm suddenly keenly aware of my shabby appearance, tattered hair and robes, unmasked face. I lower my eyes and then keep them studiously fixed on the floor, unable to look any more. There's no way my prayers will be answered. The boys seem as reluctant to be here as we are, some of them even angry, unwilling to look at our faces. I can only imagine what they think, knowing that they will have to work with impure girls. Descendants of demons who are strong enough to toss them away like the proud girl did. I keep sweating, my eyes firmly lowered, until I finally hear the command, stop. For a moment, I can't look up. What will I find if I do? Disgust. Fear. I swallow deeply, steeling myself for disappointment. Then I raise my head. To my surprise, standing before me is a short western boy, hair black, three tattooed lines from chin to lip. When he smiles at me, brown eyes kind and gentle, I feel a tremor of relief. He's not one of the larger boys, the threatening ones. In fact, if I squint, he looks almost girlish, with his long lashes and shy smile. I smile back, the knots in my stomach loosening. Then Captain Kelechi calls out, Recruits, take one more step and face your partner. Take one more step. Horror douses me as the western boy shrugs ruefully in apology and then obeys the command, going to stand before a girl with flaming red hair. I look up and despair washes over me. Stern golden eyes are peering down into mine. Recruit caters. He's my new partner. I barely hear Captain Kelechi when he speaks again, barely hear anything past the panicked beating of my heart. Make your introductions, he commands. Kata looks down at me, his face expressionless. I am Kata, he says. Kata of Garfatu. It takes everything I've got to force myself to continue looking at him instead of ducking my head in shame. Finally, I manage a reply. Decker of Affet, I mumble. He nods. By now, Captain Kelechi and his partner have turned to face each other. Hold out your hands, the captain instructs us, extending his hand to the silent commander, who is still masked, unlike all the other men. Now, more than ever, I'm certain she's female. She clasps his forearm, and he does the same, an obscene imitation of the marriage ritual. Extend them to each other in the spirit of fellowship. Kata and I face each other and do the same. I shiver when his hand touches mine. It's warm, calloused. He has capable hands, a swordsman's hands. The type of hands I own as used to thrust that sword through my belly. The memory shakes me, and I have to force myself not to jerk my hand away. I look up into his eyes, trying to push past my fear. But his eyes slide away, a cold expression shuttering his face. His grasp on my arm loosens. I'm almost thankful when Captain Kelechi speaks. From now until the moment of your deaths, you are bonded, he says. Brothers and sisters in arms. Yuruni. The words send a shiver through my spine. It feels almost like, foreboding. When I look up again, Kata's expression is darker and more severe than ever. I can barely breathe, barely remain standing so close to this boy who will now be my connection to the normal world. A world I'm not certain I want any more part of. 
a world that certainly wants no part of me. Well met, Kata, I say, forcing myself to push my discomfort away. He nods brusquely back. Well met, Decca of Affort, he replies. Then he lets go of my hand. With that, the ceremony is at an end. The boys file out from the other end of the hall, the commanders following behind them, and the transporters file back in. It all happens so fast, I barely notice two yellow-robed officials take their places on the empty platforms, barely notice as we line up once more, this time before the platforms. Now the actual intake begins. Girls walk up to the officials, who examine them and inscribe their details into scrolls with the help of the brown-robed assistants now scurrying to and fro like ants. The girl at the front of my line, a frail, sickler-looking southerner, sobs quietly while the assistants poke and prod her, loudly calling out her details. Height, five hands, three knots. Severely malnourished. Primary indications of scurvy. A frown knots itself into my brow. Malnourished. How is it that this girl is malnourished and I'm not after all those weeks asleep in the ship? Unnatural. The word whispers in my head again, banishing all thoughts of Cater and the cold way he stared down at me. I ignore my whispering fears, try to think of other reasons why there are differences between me and the girl. Perhaps some are lucky are sicklier than others and some, like me, are just naturally healthier. There are so many potential explanations. The girl's transporter, a stocky bearded man, raises loud objections when he's given only half a bag of gold as payment. I was promised sixty otas a girl. Sixty, he splutters. The assistant's reply is loud and implacable. That one is sickly and ill-fed. You were warned not to maltreat the emperor's property. The emperor's property. Disgust sweeps over me at the words. I thought we were supposed to be soldiers. By now, all the transporters have made their way to the middle of the chamber except for White Hands, not that I'm surprised she isn't here. I don't think she really needs the gold they're doling out for the transporters' services. Our journey seemed more of an amusement for her than anything. Not for the first time, I wonder who exactly she is and why she would embark on such a journey for what seemed like the sport of it. As I turn the question over in my mind, a horrible burnt smell wafts past my nostrils, desperate screams following just behind it. I whirl towards the sound, muscles strung tight. There's an assistant dipping a red-haired girl's hands into an urn of what looks like liquid gold. The cursed gold, our own blood. My mouth sours, vomit surging up, but I swallow it down, glance at the girl, who's now weeping uncontrollably as she stares at her hands. They've been gilded, golden now from fingertip to elbow. It's almost like she's already dead, halfway into a gilded sleep. The thought forces little rivulets of sweat down my back as the line advances again. The gilding won't hurt, I tell myself encouragingly. It'll only sting a little. Just a tiny bit. But I know that's not true. That burnt smell is intensifying now, fresher and more visceral than the smell that sometimes plagues my memories. There's something about the cursed gold in that urn, something about the way it's been prepared, that causes it to stick to a lucky skin. More screams rise, and darkness edges my vision. I feel like I'm jumping out of my skin, like my entire body is on edge. Decker, breathe. Decker. Britta's voice comes as if from far away. Soft arms encircle me. Safety. Warmth. I'm here, Decker, her voice whispers. You're safe with me. Safe. Safe. It takes some moments, but finally, I take a ragged breath and manage to nod. I'm fine, I croak. I swallow back my nausea and straighten just in time to glimpse the assistant guild the girl in front of me. When she removes her hands, the gold now gleams on her skin. My hands tremble. It's my turn next. The eastern official sitting above me is pale and intimidating in the dim light. Step forward, child, he beckons, 
adjusting his spectacles in an imperious manner. Once I do so, he turns to his assistant. Name, he asks the assistant. Decker of Erfurt, the assistant dutifully reads out. Are you here of your own free will? the official asks. Yes, I whisper. Across the chamber, another girl screams as both her hands are dipped in the urn. The smell of burning flesh rises, and with it, my fear. Louder. Yes, I am, I say. I try not to look at the urn again. Do you seek absolution? Yes, I do. The official nods, satisfied. I stiffen as one of the assistants begins to examine me, rough hands tugging at my body. Weight, moderate, height, five hands, five knots, hair, black, eyes, grey, no distinguishing marks, excellent health. Once this assessment is done, the assistant directs my attention back to the accountant, who continues his questions. I crane my head up towards him. Do you swear fealty to Emperor Jizo and his armies? This was a question I had not anticipated, so it takes me a moment to answer. Yes, I finally reply. More screams sound, cold sweat drenches my back. You were brought here by the Lady of the Equus. The Lady of the, it takes me some moments to understand he is talking about white hands. Of course they would nickname her that, because of Brahma and Masima. She treats them more like companions than steeds, after all. Yes, I answer, forcing the words out past my panic. The official nods again. She did not physically harm you nor attempt to sell your virtue to others. I blink, taken aback by the question. Now I understand what happened to the empty-eyed girls. The transporters weren't supposed to harm them. But one thing I've learned in the past few months is that people often do things they aren't supposed to. A vision of the elders flashes behind my eyes, their knives and buckets looming as they prepare for yet another bleeding. I inhale, exhale out the memory. No, I finally answer. Well, that's a relief, the official says under his breath. No additional scrolls to fill with this one. My teeth grit. Girls had their virtue forced from them, their lives devastated, and all he cares about is doing more work. He's like the Jatu that just left with their false promises of rights and freedoms. I have to exhale again to keep the rage from showing on my face. He turns to his assistant. The gold, he commands. As the assistant moves to bring over the urn, the official directs his eyes to me. This gold has been formulated specially to mark you as the emperor's property. It will fade with every year that passes and disappear once you reach your twentieth year of service. A gilded sleep will not fade it, so don't try killing yourself to lessen your time. Don't try, killing yourself. I'm in such a state now, my thoughts are barely more than half-formed things. By the time I finally piece together what he's saying, the assistant is already pulling my sleeves up, then he's dipping my hands into that urn. A whimper escapes my lips, even though all I feel is a brief, icy stinging before the gold covers my skin. I try not to react to the smell of my burning flesh, but my body trembles again and the sourness in my mouth intensifies as that horrible odor wafts past my nostrils. She is gilded, the assistant says. She is duly accounted for the official concludes. Now he looks down his spectacles at me. Bring pride to Itera in the coming years, Alaki, both you and your Yuruni. I vomit the moment I'm led out of the hall. 9. There's nothing in my stomach. Nothing but bile and dust. And that's the only thing that saves me from the wrath of the two Jatu overseeing my group when I retch violently outside the hall. My hands are still raw and stinging from the gilding, but I can already feel them healing, new skin forming under the thin sheen of gold, which, strangely, is just as supple as the skin underneath it. There really is something uncanny about the gold they used. The shorter Jatu sneers, disgusted. Get a hold of yourself, creature. 
He shoves me towards the line of hulking, prison-like wagons waiting in the back of the hall. There are twenty wagons in total, each a different color designating the different training grounds scattered on the hills at the very outer edges of Himera. Britta and I are headed for the forbidding red wagons waiting at the very end of the line. They're the ones destined for the war Thubera. At least one hundred girls will be taken there before this night is ended. The Jatu recruits are no doubt already on their way, ready to do their own initial training. The scent of fear grows stronger the closer we get to the wagons, girls clutching each other desperately and whispering to each other, rumors, suppositions, anything they've heard over the course of their journey. But Britta's mind is still on our new Yuruni. Wonder why they don't want us to start training with them now. She murmurs. There's a strange note in her voice. I glance over to find she's tentatively pressing the gold on her hands. She hisses softly, tears flooding her eyes, and I move closer to her. The skin under it will heal soon, I whisper. Everything will be all right, you'll see. Britta inhales shakily, nods. Did you hear, the red-haired girl I saw gilded whispers, drawing our attention to her. The training grounds are going to be overseen by shadows, the emperor's personal spies. I heard that they were all female, another replies, this one short and dark. The memory of the smaller commander immediately flits through my mind. Female, says another girl. That can't be possible. Whoever heard of female teachers? I certainly never have. The infinite wisdoms forbids women from working outside the house except in service to their husbands and families. And yet there might be female teachers at the war Thubera, female spies. I've heard of the Emperor's shadows, everyone has. They are the ones sent whenever the Emperor needs something swiftly and silently done. It's said that they have powers above those of normal people, that they can blend into the shadows that are their namesakes and strike down enemies from enormous distances. They might be our teachers. I can't even fathom it. Beside me, the red-haired girl shakes her head. I heard they had no choice but to use women. Too many incidents happened with the male transporters. You saw some of the girls. Britta, Asha, Adwapa, Belkalis, Decker, the short Jatu barks, reading our names from a scroll. Move your asses. I hurry along struggling to ignore the subtle tremors still racking my body as I rush towards the wagons. The gilding wasn't that painful, but that smell, that awful burning smell, still lingers in my nostrils, wafting up memories I would prefer stay firmly buried. As the Jatu and his partner open the door to deposit us inside, I glance at Britta. She seems a little better now, some of the color returned to her face. Any better? I ask. She nods as the short Jatu locks the door securely behind us. Loaded, the tall one shouts, banging the roof. Proceed, the short one shouts. Proceed, the tall one echoes, banging again. The wagon lurches into action, rattling onto the street. As we head away from Jaw Hall, I glance around the wagon's interior. There are three other girls here with us. Two of them are twins, both so midnight dark I know immediately that they must be Nibari, a fiercely independent tribe that lives in the mountains of the remotest southern provinces. It must be a very unfortunate series of events that brought them here. The Nibari are fiercely loyal to each other, and Mother once told me that they don't really worship Oyomo, only some secret god they have kept from the time before the many tribes became the One Kingdom. Even more alarming is our last passenger, the proud girl. She huddles as far away from the rest of us as she possibly can, black hair wild around her face as she fixes that determined gaze upon the grated door separating us from the outside world. Perhaps she's already regretting her decision to stay. There's no escape, I want to tell her. Even if metal grating wasn't barring the door, there would also be the Jatu to deal with. There's a contingent of them assigned to each caravan of wagons, and all of them are the ones specially trained to deal with a lackey. I wouldn't even be surprised if there were some recruits among their number, 
riding along to accompany their new sisters. I have to swallow back the bitterness that rises at the thought. The wagon rattles on, its wheels loud against the cobblestones. Despite this, the silence is deafening, as is the tension that swells around us, as smothering a smoke. Britta squirms beside me. She's one of those people who hate awkward silences, or any silence, for that matter. Well, here we are, she says, summoning her most cheerful smile. When everyone's eyes turn to her, she shifts uncomfortably but gamely soldiers on. Anyone have any idea what's waiting for us when we get there? Other than the recruits, that is. She laughs nervously at this painful attempt at a joke. Do you think this is a game, the proud girl snaps, aquiline features whipping, hawk-like, towards Britta. Do you think that we're off to court, to learn how to be proper maidens and do needlework? The girl leans closer, a sneer on her face. We're monsters, and they're going to treat us like monsters. They're going to use us, bleed us, and when they're done, they're going to find whatever our final deaths are and execute us one by one. She leans back against her seat, scoffing. Yuruni, can you believe the lies? More like spies, here to ensure we don't step one foot out of line or run off during the raids. She turns hardened eyes to Britta. The sooner you understand that, the better off you are. Britta reddens, tears springing to her eyes, and anger abruptly swells inside me. Who is this girl to speak so harshly to Britta? And today of all days, after everything we've just endured, after all the humiliations. Why add to the pain, the suffering? Why attack the one person trying to make things better? I turn to the proud girl. You don't have to do that, you don't have to scare her, I say. Eyes the color of midnight glance at me. I don't. You may be under illusions of what this is, being partnered with recruit Kata and all. She sneers mockingly, but I'm not, and I would prefer to prepare myself in silence. Heat blazes over me before I even notice it. Who I'm partnered with has nothing to do with my feelings, I snap. And, to be clear, you chose this, same as us. You had a choice, and you decided to remain here. No, the proud girl says. I chose to escape the death mandate, if only for a few more days. I chose to survive, rather than being executed the moment I walked out that door. Don't mistake my decision for anything more. Oh, please, we all chose to escape the death mandate, an annoyed voice interrupts. When we turn, two pairs of eyes are watching us, irritation plain in them. The taller twin's bald head gleams in the darkness of the wagon as she draws, that's the path we all chose. Whether we were forced or not doesn't matter. We're here now. We make the best of it or we die, simple as that. I'm surprised she spoke on my behalf. Northerners and Southerners never fare well together, and my accent very clearly marks me as a Northerner, despite my appearance. Perhaps she doesn't care about the grudge between the Northern and Southern provinces. I can only hope everyone else here feels the same. She and her sister seem older than us, perhaps 18 or so, although she's much fiercer looking than her shorter, smaller sister, whose black hair is braided in tiny rows down her back. When she shrugs, moonlight dances across the intricate scars on her cheeks and shoulders. My heart tightens in recognition. Those are tribal scars, probably carved well before her blood turned and the cursed gold began healing all wounds. The southern tribes use them to mark their members. Mother had two on each cheek. Then let's make the best of it by becoming friends, Britta says. The others turn to her, and she shrinks inward for a moment. Then she stiffens her shoulders. Or allies, el leastways, she stammers. True ones, I mean, not like our new partnerships. I can't help but admire her for her bravery. Britta's right, I say. We are all going to a place we don't know to face horrors we cannot imagine. We could bear it alone. A dark cellar. Golden blood on stones. Or we could band together, help each other. 
Brit has helped me before. I slept through our entire journey across the sea, and she ate my food so others would not start asking questions about me, about how I could survive without eating. Must have been such a sacrifice for you. The proud girl's eyes examined Britta's plump form dismissively. A few days of feasting to your heart's content. Her sarcasm prickles me. It was four weeks, I say coldly. Almost a month. Now her eyes widen. A month, she gasps. The Nibari are shocked as well. A month, the taller one muses. You look healthy for not having eaten for a month. The smaller one nods in agreement but still does not speak. I'm starting to wonder if she can. I don't think our kind dies of starvation, I reply. We don't. The grim expression in the proud girl's eyes says she knows this from experience. We do, however, show its ill effects. Our ability to heal goes only so far, and we need food to fuel it. She looks me up and down. Your hair is full, and your body isn't thin. Your skin's unwrinkled, and you don't have sores around your mouth. How long ago were you starved? As I try to remember, Britta leans forward. She still hasn't eaten yet. I blink, startled to realize she's right. When last did I eat, or even have a drink? I try to pin down the day, but my memories shift away the same way they've been doing since my time in the cellar. The proud girl's lips curl into a sneer. You're unnatural, she says, disgusted. As I wince at the word, the shorter Nibari rustles beside me and turns to the proud girl. We all are, you as well, she sniffs. Like her sister, she has shrewd eyes and a defiant expression. Ritual scars also cover her cheeks and shoulders. How else do you think you tossed away all those guards in Jaw Hall? What human woman do you know who possesses such strength? The girl stiffens. Of course I know. Can't sneer at someone else for being unnatural when you're considered exactly the same by other people, the shorter Nibari interrupts. All the more reason we should band together, Britta announces, extending her hand out to the twins. I'm Britta, she says. The twins look at her hand, then at each other. The taller, bald one takes it first. I'm Adwapa, first daughter of Tabello, High Chief of the Nibari. And I'm Asha, second daughter of Tabello, High Chief of the Nibari, the shorter one says, braids swinging as she nods. When both turn to me, I extend my hand as well. Deca of Affet, I say, clasping each of their hands in turn. Well met, they intone together. We all turn to the proud girl. At first she just looks at us, disgusted. Finally, she sighs and rolls her eyes. Very well, I am Belkilis of Walpa, she says, naming a far western city near the border to the unknown lands. Well met, we all say. This does not make us friends, she snarls. Britta's broad smile exposes the dimple in her left cheek. But it does make us allies. I nod. Let us watch each other's backs and aid each other as much as possible. This stipulation seems to calm Belkalis. As much as possible, she says, then adds, but understand this, I will flee this hellhole as soon as possible. Britta's brows gather. Don't you want to be pure, then? Blessed are the meek and subservient, the humble and true daughters of man, for they are unsullied in the face of the infinite father. That's what the infinite wisdom says. Balkalis rolls her eyes. You actually believe that dreck? Purity is an illusion. So is absolution and anything you read in that cursed book. You'd think you fools would understand that by now. My jaw nearly drops. I've never heard anyone talk about the infinite wisdoms that way before, much less about purity. I quickly glance upward, sending a quick prayer for forgiveness from the infinite father. Please, please, please don't punish us for this, I beg. I turn to the others. Perhaps we should pray, 
I suggest. If you're so moved, Adwapa says with a shrug. It's clear she has no intention of doing so. Neither do her sister or Belkalis. Is there something about the southern provinces that makes people defy the infinite father so? I don't want any part of it. I don't want any part of anything that could lead back to that cellar, back to all that blood, that pain. I'm relieved when Britta squeezes closer. I'll pray with ye, Decker, she says, reaching out her hand. Thank you, I whisper as I take it. We silently pray together as we begin making our way towards the edges of the capital. Our destination, as it turns out, is a series of isolated hills at the very outskirts of the city, just next to the wall. Night has fallen, so an oppressive gloom engulfs the caravan of Alaki wagons threading towards the hill. Despite the darkness, I see everything perfectly, the large building at the top of the largest hill, its windows as small as pinpricks, its walls slick and red. There's an imposing, almost ominous feeling about it, but that's the way it's designed. Those walls, those tiny windows, they're as much to keep the inhabitants inside as they are to keep others out. This must be the War Thubera, our new training ground. My mouth slackens at the sheer size of it. Those rolling hills, the lake in the middle, the War Thubera is large enough to house a village. In fact, it's very much like a village, all those smaller buildings surrounding the big one at the very top. The only difference is, everything here is built for war. If I squint, I can see what looks like a sandpit in the distance and sharpened spikes jutting from the depths of the surrounding moat. I don't have to ask to know they are there for any Alaki who thinks of escaping using that route. Look out towers thrust from the walls, all of them swarming with armoured Jatu. Our new captors. Kata and the others may claim that we're soldiers with choices, but I know better. Even regular soldiers are punished for desertion, and we're as far from regular as can be. It's an unpleasant thought, so I try to push it away as the gate opens and we cross the bridge to begin our ascent. Finally, we reach the courtyard of the largest building, where orange-robed middle-aged women are lined up beside a statue of Emperor Jizo. Shock jolts me when I realize they're all unmasked, their heads uncovered, with what look like short wooden walking sticks sheathed at their sides. I turn my eyes away, overwhelmed by the sight. Are these the women who are going to train us? My tension builds, the blood prickling under my skin, as the wagons roll to a stop. Dismount. The cry echoes from Jatu to Jatu. Release the Alaki. When keys click in the wagon's lock, Britta and I look at each other one last time. Be strong, she whispers to me her face pale in the darkness. You too, I whisper back. It's still warm outside when we exit the carriage, joining the mass of girls gathered in the courtyard. Temperatures don't plunge here the way they do in the north, it seems. The air is moist and tinged with a sharp, metallic odor. I don't have to inhale deeply to know that it's blood, cursed gold. After my months in the cellar, I can recognize the scent with barely a whiff. My tension rises when a robust matron with a formidable chest separates herself from the group. She almost resembles a bull, all jutting brows and tiny, beady little eyes. I look down, unnerved by the sight of her unmasked face, and that's when I notice the small, sun-like tattoo on the back of her hand, its bright red color immediately distinguishable. A gasp wrenches itself from my throat. The Yelemkuru, the emblem of the Red Sunday. The emblem of the temple maidens, those unmarried women unfortunate enough to be bound into service to temples and other places of worship. Now I understand why all these women are revealed, their faces unmasked even in the presence of the Jatu. They aren't our new teachers, they are the women serving them. Follow me, neophytes, the matron barks, walking into the building. I've never heard the word neophytes before today but I know she must be talking about us. I fall into line behind the other girls from the wagons, following her through the massive archway. There's that eclipsed sun symbol on the largest stone above the entrance, although it is beaten and weathered. A frown furrows my brows. 
Something about the weathering has changed the symbol, made it seem more familiar, like I've seen it somewhere other than on the Warthu Bearer's seal before. But where? Hurry it along, the matron bellows, rushing us down the steps into the bowels of the building, to an underground bathing chamber consisting of a series of tiled baths. Assistants in yellow robes stand beside each bath, thin towels and sharpened razors at their sides. My heartbeat doubles at the sight of them. Disrobe, the ball-like matron barks. As we all turn, startled by the command, she fingers the hilt of the stick strap to her side. We take off our clothes, all of us doing so swiftly to ensure we aren't seen. My cheeks heat, my eyes dart to the floor, the ceiling, anywhere but to the other girls' bodies. Even then, I catch glimpses, bodies of all sizes and shapes, some covered in hair, others smooth except for the hair on their heads, a few like the Nibari, with tribal scars or tattoos from the time before their blood changed into cursed gold. I'm stunned by how different the other girls' bodies are. Mother and I were never welcomed in the women's baths in Erfurt, so she's the only woman I've ever seen fully naked before, her body dark and shapely like mine. Soon, only one girl remains clothed. Belkalis. She wraps her arms around her body, a defiant gesture despite the uncertainty, the shame, now flickering in her eyes. The matron walks over to her and lifts her chin with the butt of her whip. I heard it said there was a troublemaker among you, she says in a heavily accented voice, R.S. and L.S. rolling like waves across her tongue. It must be you. Tell me, Alaki, why do you refuse to heed my order? I don't wish to disrobe, Belkalis grits out. A modest one, are you, the matron sneers. If it pleases you. It pleases me for you to disrobe. I hear the stick before I see it, a low whooping sound through the air, just as its weighted hilt cracks into Belkalis's back. She lets out a hollow, gasping sound as she falls to the floor, golden blood spurting down her back. Air catches in my throat. That walking stick isn't a stick, it's a rungu, a club soldiers throw at opponents. I've seen one in action before witnessed father practicing with it and the many other weapons he kept from his time in the army. His, however, didn't have barbs on the weighted end for ripping into flesh and bone the way the matrons does. So this is how they will keep us in line. The matron walks over, puts her foot on Belkalis's back, pressing her deeper into the floor. Belkalis grunts, pained, but the matron doesn't move her foot. She just smirks down at her a chilling look in her eyes. Insolent beast, she sneers, ripping the rungu out. I clap my hands over my mouth, stomach lurching as more golden blood goes spurting into the air. The sight of all that blood is sickening, but even worse is what's underneath, a mass of scars, each one laid so thickly across Belkalis's back, even the rungu's barbs couldn't penetrate completely. Now I understand why she seems so defiant, why she doesn't retreat when threatened by authority. She's used to being beaten, bled, even starved. Her exposed ribs, gaunt spine, and flat, removed expression all tell a story, one of unspeakable horror. Is that the way I looked in the cellar, that detachment, that resignation? The matron grows impatient. She strokes the rungu again. You will not listen, a lackey she sneers. You will not follow the path. Then I suppose I will just have to beat you across it. She raises the stick again, and Belkalis flinches. It's a broken, ugly movement. No. I gasp before I can stop myself. Please don't hurt her. The matron turns to me, a chilling expression of amusement on her face. What's this? The troublemaker has a friend. Abandoning Belkalis, she walks over to me. Now I see her face close up, jaw squat and severe, nose blade thin. Her brows furrow, those tiny eyes gleaming under them. You have a familiar look about you, she murmurs. Have we met before? I shake my head. 
Part your lips and speak up, Alaki. Terror dries my throat, but I somehow find the strength to swallow. No. We've never met, I rasp. She humphs. Very well, then, she says. Now, you had something to say about your friend. What was it again? My eyes flicker to the golden blood snaking across the stones. I remember that blood, remember how it pooled around me in the cellar. Don't hurt her, please, I whisper. I swallow to push back the darkness as the matron steps closer, strokes my neck with the weighted end of her rungu. Her tiny eyes gleam when she notices me wince from the barbs. I didn't mean to offend, I croak, only to say that Belkalis is very, devout. She's not used to being bared near others. Devout. The matron guffaws at my lie. As if Oyomo would give his attention to any of you infernal beasts. As I wince at this insult, she turns to Belkalis, a thin smirk slicing her lips. And you, so your name is Belkalis. That's good to know. Across the room, Belkalis shoots me a baleful glare, an alarm ripples over me. I didn't mean it, I try to explain with my eyes. The matron approaches her again, but this time, one of the assistants steps in front of her and respectfully bows her head. Matron Nazra, the hour approaches. The karma codes await you. Matron Nazra huffs. Very well. Ensure that the girls are all clean, especially her, she points at Belkalis, and give them all the closest of shaves. There will be no lice in the Warthu bearer, she barks as she walks out. Once she leaves, the assistant who spoke turns to the girls. Wash yourselves, hurry now. Time grows short. She directs another assistant towards Belkalis. Take her to a private chamber. I'll not have cursed gold in the water. The assistant bows, escorting Belkalis out. Yes, mm, she says. When they pass me, Belkalis catches my eye. Next time you have the urge to aid me, don't, she hisses. Then she's gone, and the rest of the girls, including me, enter the water. One of the assistants approaches with a blade and scrapes it over my head. I try not to see the curly strands of black hair falling into the water, try not to give in to the tears pricking at my eyes. I don't even know what to think anymore. Exhaustion, emotion, the gilding, they all overwhelm me now, making me teary-eyed with confusion. But I will survive it all, I remind myself sternly. I will survive this and whatever else happens next. Oyomo, help me endure it. 10. In less than an hour, I'm clean and clothed in scratchy green robes and leather sandals. I'm also as bald as all the other girls subjected to the assistant's razors. If I ever had any doubts about my new status, they were erased the moment my hair was tossed into the furnace like it was nothing. The infinite wisdom states that a woman's hair is her greatest pride, the source of her gracefulness and beauty. Now none of the girls here have any. As of this moment, I'm truly nothing more than a demon, my last claim to femininity stripped away. The realization roils inside me, a nausea that builds as the matrons and their assistants usher us down the building's warren-like halls into a massive central hall. A line of girls is waiting there, each one clothed in leather armor and bearing wooden swords. Like ours, their hair was shaved clean, but it's regrown to nape length for most. I suppose that means they've been here a few months at least. These must be the girls who were sent here before us, the older Alaki. At the very front stand a trio of unmasked women, the red and gold banner of the Warthu bearer rising proudly behind them. My eyes are immediately drawn to the woman in the middle. She has dark brown skin, powerfully muscled arms, and a stern, unflinching gaze. Most striking of all is the bright red clay that daubs the intricate braids coiled around her head. It's immediately familiar, as is the woman's silhouette. The silent commander from Jaw Hall. It's her, only now she's unmasked and wearing dark green robes, a large golden pin at her shoulder. On it is the eclipse symbol from the archway. 
Where have I seen it before? The question niggles at me. I have to force myself not to look down when she steps forward and raises her hand in salute. Around me, other girls do the same, pained expressions in their eyes. This is probably the first time they're seeing so many unmasked women too. Hail, our honored Alaki neophytes, the stern woman calls out. Hail, the armored girls echo her, their voice is a single, powerful entity. Chills rush through me at the sound. The stern woman continues talking, her booming voice echoing through the hall, on behalf of His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Jizo V, honored sovereign and ruler of the One Kingdom, our beloved Oterra, I bid you welcome to the War Thubera. Welcome, the armored girls repeat. I am Kamoko Thandai, the woman says, head instructor at the War Thubera, the glorious training house in which you stand refer to me with any other title, or mispronounce my name, and I will cut out your tongue for your insolence and put it in a jar to keep me company. At her words, the atmosphere chills and girls look at each other, frightened. I silently try to sear her name's pronunciation into my memory, then D.E. Way, then D.E. Way. Kamoko Thandai continues her speech. To my left is Kamoko Calderis. She motions, and a brunette of almost bear-like proportions lumbers forward and examines us with the single bright blue eye not covered by a leather eye patch. The eclipse pin gleams at her shoulder as well. She will serve as your weapons master in the coming months. Kamoko Thandau motions again, and Kamoko Calderis steps back with a curt nod. To my right is Kamoko Huon, Kamoko Thandau says. A small, kind-looking woman with pale skin and dark eyes steps forward. Her black hair cascades like a river down her back tiny jeweled flowers adorning it. She doesn't seem like a warrior at all, and her gentle smile as she nods at us only reinforces this impression. She also wears the eclipse pin, and when she absently strokes a finger over it, my heart beats faster, though I don't know why. She will serve as your combat master, Kamoko Thandai says. The kind-looking woman steps back, her dark eyes glancing almost tentatively over us. Again, I silently wonder how this woman was chosen to become our combat master. She's like a butterfly, so delicate and beautiful, you could crush her if you weren't careful. Kamoko Thandau continues, from now until such time as you leave the war through Bera, we, your Kamakos, your teachers, will serve as your guides. Each of us standing before you has served as his imperial majesty's shadows, the deadliest of all his assassins. We have all earned notable places in the Heraldry of Shadows, the book that lists the exploits of our kind, the book that sits here, in the famed War Thubera, the House of Women. We are proud to have been trained within these very walls, and are even prouder to give you the same honor. From now until you leave this training ground, you will work harder and feel more pain than you have ever felt in your life, until we mold you from the weak, useless girls that you are into warriors, defenders of Oterra. Conquer or die, this is our motto here. My eyebrows gather. Warriors? Defenders? Are the Kamako certain they're talking about us? I peer at Kamoko Huan again, trying to imagine her as a deadly assassin. If she of all people can be a warrior, perhaps the same is possible for... Something is coming. The unwelcome premonition tingles under my skin, and I stiffen. Britta, I rasp, my breathing shallow as I turn to my friend. Does she feel it too, heightened awareness, panic crawling up her spine? Do the other girls? They all seem as calm as ever, but they have no idea what's about to happen. I remember all too keenly what happened at the village the last time I felt this way. The blood, the fear, the bodies littering the snow. What is it? Britta whispers back. Death shrieks, I whisper. They are here. What do ye mean, here? As Britta glances around, panicked, Kamoko Thanda walks towards us, her eyes stern. You have all heard of death shrieks, yes. Around me, the girls nod their heads. Have any of you encountered them before? 
When the girls nod timidly again, Carmoco Thandile bellows, open your mouths and use your tongues. The correct response is yes, Carmoco. I nearly jump out of my skin, her voice is so powerful. I've never heard a woman speak like that, never heard such authority coming from a female throat. My heart beats even faster as I reply along with the others. Yes, Carmoco, I gasp, my throat roar. Louder, she commands. Yes, Carmoco. Better. She nods. She glances at the girls who answered yes. Consider yourselves most fortunate to have encountered such monstrosities and survived. For the rest of you, allow me to even the score. Even the score? What score? Carmoco Thando gestures, and the older girls march towards us, footsteps steady and sure. Step back, neophytes, the one at the front, a short, slim girl with the black hair and light brown skin of the Mideastern provinces, calls. She has a jagged scar all the way down the side of her cheek, old but harshly puckered. Another one who hasn't experienced a recent death. Move back. Move back, she shouts. I hurriedly do as I'm told, shuffling backwards until soon I'm at the very edges of the room with the other neophytes. The older girls spread into a single line before us, a barrier, keeping us firmly in place. By now, my palms are sweating, and my heart is beating so fast, it feels like it'll leap out of my chest. They can't really mean to bring death shrieks here, can they? I thought Captain Kelechi said we would encounter them on the raids. What if those monsters escape, attack us the way the ones in Erfurt did? What if I react the same way I did before, my eyes changing color, that demonic voice emerging from my throat? I whimper, the thought of everyone witnessing it almost too much to bear. Who knows what the Karmakos would do to someone like me, someone with abilities beyond what is common for an ordinary Alaki. I swallow back the thought as Karmoko Thando gestures to Matron Nazra, and the matron presses a small, circular metal structure in the wall. A low rumbling rises as the floor slides apart, revealing a dark subterranean cave, a stone staircase leading to a group of iron cages arranged in its center muffled, inhuman grunt sound from those cages, mist clouding around them. My entire body stills, my fears now confirmed. There are death shrieks underneath the wall Thubera, and the Karmakos intend to bring them up. The scarred girl walks with a group of the older girls down the stairs, heading towards the largest cage, where an ominous sound rises, the rattling of chains. Sharp, predatory black eyes gleam inside the cage, the outline of a gaunt, gigantic figure barely visible in the shadows. A death shriek, chains binding it. My heart hammers, teeth clench, sweat pours rivers down my back. Britta shifts closer to me. It's all right, Decker, she whispers, I'm right here. I nod, inhale deeply for courage as I return my attention to what's happening in the cavern below. The death shriek still hasn't come out, and the scarred girl is getting impatient. Get it out, she commands the others. They quickly do as they're told, a tall, dark-skinned girl darting forwards and opening the cage door while the others wait, swords drawn. Strangely, the death shriek makes no movement. What is it doing? Why is it just standing there? My muscles go taut from the tension. Finally, the scarred girl has had enough. She darts inside the cage, tugs at one of the death shriek's chains. With a muffled howl of outrage, the death shriek lunges for her, the quills in its pale silver fur a whirlwind of motion, black eyes slitted with fury. But the scarred girl and the others don't jerk back or flee. Instead, they grab its chains, then use inhuman strength to force it up the stairs until it's just before Komoko Thandai, who casually flips it to the ground, then slams her foot into its throat, pressing harder and harder until it slumps unconscious. The blood roars in my ears. Astonishment has taken me by the throat, so it's some minutes before I remember how close that death shriek is, remember what can happen when I'm in the presence of one. I turn to Britta, alarmed. 
Is there anything wrong with my eyes? I ask. She peers down at me, frowns. No, is there supposed to be? Relief coursing through my veins, I shake my head and face forward again just as Kamoko Thando removes her foot and points to the unconscious death shriek. This is a death shriek, the enemy that is now invading the One Kingdom, she states. Your natural enemy. All across Oterra, death shrieks hunt your kind, but here in the Warthub Burra, you will learn how to withstand them, their cries, their infernal strength and speed. You will learn how to transform from the hunted to the hunter, how to train harder, more ruthlessly, until you become the best, the most fearsome warriors in all of the Emperor's Alaki Regiment. Then, when you have served the Emperor for twenty years each, you will be rewarded with the rite of purification, a sacred ceremony by the high priests to cleanse you of your demonic blood. She looks across the room now, her eyes pinning each and every one of us in place as she declares, you will be pure again. Pure. Breath catches in my throat. The next twenty years can't pass quickly enough. Around me, whispers sound, exclamations of joy and relief. Did you hear that? A girl near me says, gaping. Katia, I think her name is. She's the one from the line to the wagons, red hair so bright, it looked like a fire springing from her head. Now she's as bald as the rest of us, even her eyebrows shorn from her face. We're going to be pure. Truly pure, she exclaims. She looks almost as excited as I feel. Even though Kamoko Thandai has just repeated the same sentiments Captain Kelechi did, something about her delivery set a fire in me. Or perhaps it's the fact it was a woman that said them. Not everyone is as impressed, however. Adwapa manages to somehow seem bored as she murmurs, well, that's a relief. Being already bald, she was spared the indignity of a shearing, but her sister Asha's head now also gleams when she nods in agreement beside her. Kamoko Thando holds up her hand for silence, and the hall quiets. Look to your left, she commands. We quickly obey. Now to your right. Again, we obey her words. Standing on either side of you are your sisters, both in blood and in arms. Blood sisters. They will live and die with you on the battlefield. They are your family now, is this understood? It takes me a moment to realize she means for us to answer. Yes, Kamoko Thandai, I reply, joining the chorus of voices. Now look to your elder blood sisters, the novices. She points to the armored girls. From now on, you will refer to them always as honored elder blood sister. They have been here for a year now. They will show you the way. As we nod, she turns to face us once again. I would have you understand one thing. Of all the hundreds of Alaki that have come to Himera, you are the fifty most talented, the fastest, the strongest, the most deadly. Most of you were noted by your village elders before you underwent the ritual, or as you tried, futilely, to escape your fates. You all showed promise. Strength, cunning, resilience, much more than the average Alaki. That is why you were chosen. I suddenly remember Britta telling me how she was so strong she could almost lift a cow, remember white hands marvelling at all the times I'd died and been resurrected. Remember this well, the Kamoko warns, because you are here for one purpose and one purpose only. In ten months precisely, the Emperor will go on campaign against the Death Shrieks, and he has chosen the Alaki who will lead the charge. She glances around the room, her eyes deadly serious. You will be at the forefront of the Emperor's armies, she declares. You will ride into battle and fight for the glory of Oterra, and you will win the war against the Death Shrieks or you will die trying, however many times that may take. 11. In the aftermath of Kamoko Thandai's speech, silence descends over the hall. My breath comes in short, ragged bursts, her words ringing in my ears. Win the war against the Death Shrieks the forefront of the Emperor's armies. My hands shake, and I clasp them together. 
Knowing the bargain I agreed to is one thing. Actually being here, seeing the death shrieks hidden underneath my feet, the monsters I will one day fight against, is another. I barely see the novices hefting the unconscious death shriek and returning it to its cage, barely see matron Nazra closing the floor behind them, then bows deferentially to the Karmakos. Only when Kamoko Thandile nods at us do I return my attention to the present. That's when I see something strange. The Kamoko is staring right at me, a peculiar look in her eyes. It's almost as if she recognizes me. The expression is gone before I can blink, but I know my eyes weren't deceiving me. You have a familiar look about you. Matron Nazra's words ring in my head. As if my mind summoned her, the matron walks to the front of the hall and claps her hands for attention. All right, neophytes, move it along. Time for dinner, she bellows. I obey along with the rest of the girls, following her into the next hall, which is filled with long wooden tables and similar chairs. As I take a seat beside Britta and the others, my mind whirls, darting back to the symbol on the Karmako's eclipse pins, to the strange feeling I had when Karmoko Huan traced it with her fingers earlier. I mentally trace it again, imagining the shape of that shadowed sun gliding under my own fingertips, its edges softened by years of daily use. A gasp explodes from my chest. I've felt that symbol before, touched it a thousand times before I ever saw it on the seal white hands gave me. It's the same symbol that's on my mother's necklace, the one I could never make out because it had become so worn, and it's everywhere I look now, the archway above the door from which the assistants are emerging, steaming plates of food in hand, the centers of the tables, even the middle of the ceiling, which soars high above us. I point up at it and ask the girls beside me, do any of you know what that symbol is? All this time, and I've never once asked. Belkalis and Asha shake their heads, but Adwapa nods. It's the Umbra, the emblem of the shadows. My brow furrows, thoughts rushing faster. Mother had it on her necklace, wore it every day. And symbols like that, ones connected to the Emperor, can be used only with special permission. Even mistakenly carving one warrants a death sentence, the smallest child knows that. The ground tilts under my feet as a strange, impossible theory slithers into my mind. What if mother was a shadow? It seems far-fetched, impossible even, but it would explain so many things, the reason she was always so careful to remain at the periphery of the village, the fact that she moved all the way to Erfurt in the first place. Most women never leave their home villages, and if they do, it's to move the next village over, not an entirely different province. Some of the village men back in Erfurt used to gossip that the emperor collects strange people to serve him, people who defy the natural order but have been granted special dispensation by the priests. What if mother was one of them? If she was, what does that make me? There have to be answers here somewhere. As the assistants place plates of herbed chicken and rice in front of us, Britta's eyes narrow. Ye have a funny look on your face, she says, eating a piece of chicken using her hands, as is the tradition of the southern provinces. Mother used to do the same, even though father wanted her to use utensils. She always said hands were good enough. The thought sends a twinge of sadness through me. It chases away the uncomfortable smell of chicken which has sent my stomach twisting in on itself. Ever since I was burned, I can't stomach the smell of roasted meat. I look into Britta's eyes. I think my mother was a shadow, I whisper. What? There's this necklace she always wore, never went anywhere without it. It had the umbra on it. It sounds so strange saying this out loud, silly even, but voicing my thoughts solidifies them. I know I'm right, I can just feel it. And that awful matron said you looked familiar. Excitement lights up Britta's face and she gasps. What if she knew your mother? What if they trained together or something? That's what I'm thinking. Britta's voice lowers to a whisper. Does this explain how you knew the death shrieks were down there? 
She huddles over her plate of food so the others won't hear us talking. Does it? I turn the question over and over in my mind. I don't know, I admit. I just get feelings sometimes. And she did too. I glance at Britta, steeling myself for her reaction, horror, fear. But she just nods. We have to get that book, then, the heraldry the Carmoko talked about. If all the shadows are listed there, perhaps your mother is as well. Perhaps we can learn more about her. She looks so determined, so eager, something loosens in my chest. Here I was frightened she'd laugh at me or turn me away. I nod. And if she's not, at least I'll know for sure. Either way, it'll get our minds off things. All that talk about going on raids and being warriors. How can I be a warrior? Me, Britta of Golma, a cabbage farmer's daughter. I can't imagine it. None of us can, Belkalis says beside her, startling me. I've been so absorbed in discussing mother, I'd almost forgotten that she was sitting there. That all the other girls were as well. To my surprise, they haven't separated themselves by province, the way visitors to Erfurt so often do, northerners and southerners particularly. Instead, they all lean closer, nodding in agreement with her words. I want to go home. This fearful whisper comes from Katia. Conquer? Warriors? Dying? She turns to us, bald eyebrows drawing together like pale caterpillars. I never asked for that. All I want to do is get married, have children. I just want to go home, go back to Rianne. Rianne? I blink. You had a betrothed? Katia nods. When they came to take me, he ran after the wagon. He told me he'd wait, no matter how long it took. She looks down at her newly gilded hands, her voice low with tears. He's waiting for me. He's still wait, she stops abruptly, hiccuping back sobs, and Britta puts her arm around her. I just watch, unsure of what to do. The moment my blood ran gold, everyone I knew abandoned me, father left, the villagers turned against me, even Elfred fled. Sixteen years of friendship gone, just like that. But Katia's betrothed stayed with her. Tried to fight for her. Even though he went against his village elders, the priests. I'm unable to fathom the idea of such loyalty from a man, from any person, actually. Are there truly people in the world like that? Could there be someone like that for me? I don't even know if it's possible, if someone, somewhere in this vast world, will ever love someone like me, the unaging unchanging offspring of a demon, but I want to find them. Want to survive long enough to experience that kind of love, loyal, unflinching, steadfast. The kind of love that mother gave me before she died. The kind of love that Katia and Britta seem to command so easily. And I don't have to do it alone. I glance at the other girls, Katia's eyes wild with fear, Britta's with uncertainty. If this was anywhere else, we wouldn't even speak to each other, but we're all in the same boat now, all of us faced with years of pain, suffering, blood. Blood sisters, that's what Carmoko Thandal called us, a word that gives me courage. I send a little prayer to Oyomo before I turn to the others. I don't know about you, I say, but I intend to survive long enough to leave this place. I've already had enough of dying. Katia's eyebrows knit together. Already had enough? Wait, do you mean you've actually already died? Nine times, I whisper, the words like thorns in my mouth. Her eyes widen nearly past their sockets. Nine times. As incredulity mottles her face, and the others turn to me with identical expressions of shock, I explain, I was subjected to the death mandate before I came. Only they couldn't find my final death, so they tried again and again, I cut myself off. I don't want to experience that again. I don't want more deaths, more pain, I want to have a life, a real one this time. A happy one. 
But to do so, I have to survive. We all do. I glance from one girl to the other, take a deep breath to summon my courage. Kamoko Thandai said that we were blood sisters, so let's help each other. If we're to survive the next 20 years, we have to do so together, not just as allies but as friends, family. I extend my hand, my heart lodged in my throat. Blood sisters. I ask, a thousand thoughts barraging my mind. What if I'm asking for too much? What if they turn away, scorn me the way everyone in the village did, what if they? A soft hand settles over mine. Blood sisters, Britta declares when I look up, startled. She grins. Now and forever, but ye already knew that, Decca. As I nod, relieved, Katia leans forward as well. Blood sisters, she whispers. I know we just met, but if you're going to join together, I want to be a part of it. I nod, returning her anxious smile. It's the twins' turn, and for once, they seem almost serious as they look at each other and shrug. Might as well, they say to each other, placing their hands over ours. Blood sisters, they declare together, smiling at me. Warmth spreads over me, a glow of happiness. They're actually saying yes, all of them. As I grin, another hand settles unexpectedly on mine. Belkalises. Blood sisters, she says, mouth tight as the others smile and embrace her. Just like that, we're bonded. Blood sisters. Happiness sparking inside me, I pick up a handful of rice and begin eating, careful to pick around the chicken bits. I have to build up my strength. Survival is hard work, after all. And so we'll be finding the truth about mother's past. 12. It starts with a sea of unwavering black, ancient yet familiar. I'm floating inside it, warm, motionless. Voices, female and powerful. They call out to me. Decker. They whisper. One of them almost sounds like mother. I turn towards the voices, not at all startled to find a golden light shimmering in the distance. A door, waiting for me to open it. As I swim over, weightless in this vast sea, I hear something else. Raise your lazy asses, neophytes. I gasp awake, blinking in the darkness, as two novices rush into the common bedroom, shoving girls off their beds if they move too slowly. There are more novices in the hallway their shouts timed by the frantic beating of nearby drums. What, ha, huh, what? Britta snuffles, jerking upright. We have to get ready, I say, almost wrenching her out of bed. The novices have positioned themselves just in front of the doorway. One of them is the scarred girl from last night, the other a plump, almost cherubic-looking brown girl with dark, loosely curled hair. Both are wearing dark blue robes, a uniform, just like the green ones we were given yesterday. Morning greetings, neophytes, the scarred girl barks. Morning greetings. My reply is as uncertain as the other girls when we gather around her. She takes a step forward. I am Gazal, your honored elder blood sister. You will refer to me as honored elder blood sister Gazal, or honored senior blood sister. All other forms of address will not be tolerated. The air immediately thickens, tension rising until the plump girl steps forward. Compared to Gazal, she's warmth and sunshine personified as she grins at us. I am Jennifer, your honored elder blood sister, she says cheerfully. I hope in time we will become friends. My tension begins to ease. Jennifer seems like one of those happy people who get along with everybody. I barely have time to nod back at her before it's Gazal's turn to speak again. Jennifer and I have been tasked with overseeing this common bedroom, she explains. Together, we'll lead you through your first week at the Warthubera and, in time, your entire tenure in this training ground. That is, if you survive it. As a tense silence falls, all the neophytes glancing at each other uneasily, 
Jennifer steps forward and claps her hands for attention. All right, neophytes, you have 15 minutes to clean yourselves. Go! 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 Her words are like a lightning bolt, sending girls rushing towards the cleaning chamber as fast as they can. I hurry along, not wanting to get left behind, but when I catch sight of the chamber's polished bronze mirrors and ten stone sinks with water jugs and other bathing supplies carefully laid out on them, I slow, awed. In effort, the only sink I ever saw was the one in the temple, and that was reserved for men. I stop in front of one, gasping when I see my hair has already grown back into a fluffy little cloud. It's the same with all the other neophytes, but I'm only noticing now because I'm not as disoriented as I was when I woke. This must be an effect of a lucky healing. Finally, a benefit to being impure. 14 minutes, Jennifer calls out. I jolt back into action, wiping my face with the cloth and water. When I'm done, I glance at the small stick of wood beside my water jug, perplexed. What is that? Britta whispers, voicing the question that's on the tip of my tongue. Chewing stick, Belkalis answers, using hers to scrub her teeth. I hurriedly do the same, gasping when an icicle flavor explodes in my mouth. No wonder Himerans prefer these to the cloths we use in effort to scrub our mouths clean. Once I'm finished, I scramble to put on my green robes and leather sandals, and by the time the drums sound again, I'm dressed and ready to follow Jennifer to the courtyard. It's still dark by the time I emerge, only a few dim torches light our path. Even then, it's nice and warm, the early morning air balmy with the scent of exotic flowers. For a moment, I remain where I am, savoring the feeling. Sunrise was always chilly in effort. This heat should be uncomfortable for a northerner like me, but somehow, it feels perfect. The umbra carved into the archway seems to glare at me as I walk under it, a reminder that I have to read the heraldry of shadows to discover whatever I can about Mother's past. I make a mental note to ask Jennifer where it is. She seems nice, compared to the other novices. Carmoko Thandai is standing calmly before the statue of Emperor Jizo, Gazal at her side, when we reach the courtyard. The novice has one hand behind her back and the other across her heart in rigid military posture. She looks even more intimidating now than she did when she woke us up this morning. Good morning, neophytes, Kamoko Thando calls out, that muscular body ramrod straight, red clay braids gleaming in the darkness. I hope you've had a good sleep. We look at each other. Yes, Kamoko, we reply. Komoko Thandai smiles. Still not quite right. Gazal steps forward and slams her folded hand across her heart. Neophytes, when in the presence of the Karmakos, stand at attention. She demonstrates. Back straight, right hand across heart, left behind back. We quickly do as we're told, Jenaba checking us to ensure our compliance. The other novices assigned to the different common bedrooms help their own portions of the line. As they inspect us, I see movement in the upper windows. The matrons are watching. This, apparently, is entertainment for them. Once we're all standing at attention, Kamoko Thando addresses us, in order to be warriors, you must be strong in body and spirit. That starts with running. Every morning. My eyes bulge. Running. Women aren't allowed to run in Oterra. Any girl caught walking faster than a sedate pace is whipped for her insolence. Light and graceful are the footsteps of the pure woman, the infinite wisdom's cautions. The reminder sends a subtle nausea roiling through my stomach. Let's go, neophytes. Gazal barks, jolting me from my thoughts. Move it. She demonstrates by jogging down the path at a quick, steady pace, the other novices behind her. The other neophytes and I tentatively do the same, huffing and puffing as we struggle to control our breathing and the burning in our leg muscles. By the time Gazal finally stops at the bottom of the first hill, 
I'm so exhausted I lurch over, hands on my knees to steady myself. All right, neophytes, Gazal barks, seeming almost energized now as she addresses us. Your bodies should be fully worn. Time to double the pace. She darts back up the hill, moving even faster than before. I shake my head, horrified. I can't go any faster, I rasp to Britta between breaths. My legs are on fire. Britta's breathing is just as ragged as mine. Me neither. Oh, stop complaining, Adwapa proclaims breezily, running past us. She and her sister are the only ones who seem unfazed by the fact that we're running. Then again, they're Nibari, their tribe only ever pretends to obey the infinite wisdoms when priests or emissaries venture into their deserts. At least, that's what mother always told me. There must be truth to her words, because Adwapa's almost skipping as she declares, it's only a light run. Back home, we used to run for miles. In the heat, Asha adds. On top of mountains. Then why don't you just run your asses back to your mountains and leave us here to die, Britta snaps. Then she wheezes, instantly regretful. I'm sorry, I did not mean that. I'm so tired. I think I'm going to die me first almost death from this. I nod in weary agreement. That's the truth if I've ever heard it, I say reluctantly beginning to run again. This second round is even worse than the first, my muscles blistering under the pace. To my astonishment, however, the longer I run, the easier it gets. It's almost as if my muscles are gaining power, stretching to their fullest potential. Soon, my discomfort is a thing of the past as I zip up and down the hills, my feet barely touching the ground. The scenery around me begins to ripple, soft, shimmering waves, as if the trees are underwater. Air distorts, sounds become more distinct, I've stepped into a completely different world, one where everything is sharpened to brightest clarity. I grin from ear to ear when a dewdrop descends slowly before me, its crystalline beauty easily perceptible with my sharpened vision. I've never felt this happy before. Never felt this free. Is this what birds feel like? Britta shouts excitedly. No wonder they never wanted us to run. And I stumble, the reminder as piercing as an arrow. The infinite wisdoms forbids running, as it does most things that don't prepare girls for marriage and serving their families. Girls can't shout, drink, ride horses, go to school, learn a trade, learn to fight, move about without a male guardian we can't do anything that doesn't somehow relate to having a husband and family or serving them. Elder Dirk has always told us that's because the infinite wisdoms were trying to show us how to live happy, righteous lives. What if they were meant to cage us instead? I force the thought back, guilt flooding through me. The way of the faithful is trust and submission, how many times has Elder Dirk has told us that? I may not understand it now but Oyomo has a greater plan for me. All I have to do is submit and have faith. Even though I'm here, doing things that go against the teachings, I have to believe that Oyomo understands my heart, that he sees that I'm trying my best to be faithful. I will submit. I will be faithful. I won't think any more dangerous thoughts. Gazal finally leads the way back to the courtyard. The moment we reach it, I buckle to the ground, suddenly too exhausted to remain standing any longer. The others do the same, but they're laughing and giggling as well, savoring the discovery they've just made, the joy they've just felt. The joy I'm still trying to forget. Oyomo, oh, forgive me. Oyomo, oh, forgive me. It's not right, the euphoria I felt while running. I must cast it from my thoughts. I'm almost grateful when Gazal glares at us with her usual cold expression, distracting me from my thoughts. That's enough for this morning's warm-up, neophytes, she says. Make your way back to your rooms. You have twenty minutes to clean yourselves and change into the clothes you have been given, then ten more for breakfast. Lessons start promptly. 
That's the only information she gives before we hurry back to our rooms. 13. Look, there's Geneva, Britta says, pointing to the cheerful southern novice as we stream outside later in the morning. By now, I've washed, dressed, and eaten the breakfast of oats and honey the assistants set out for us. The accompanying sausages, I gave to Britta, since the smell of them turned my stomach. I don't think I can eat meat anymore. You wanted to ask her about the heraldry, remember? Britta says, before hurrying towards her. Honored Elder Blood Sister Jennifer. Honored Elder Blood Sister Jennifer. Jennifer turns towards us. Neophyte Britta, she says. Is something the matter? No, just got a question for ye, Honored Elder Blood Sister, the heraldry, where is it? In the Hall of Records next to the library on the upper floor. She pauses, glances at Britta. Was it your mother or grandmother who was a shadow? Mother, possibly, I say, drawing her attention to me. One of her eyebrows raises. So it's for you, Neophyte Decker. How intriguing. Well, good fortune to you getting there. When Britta and I glance at her, confused, she explains, neophytes are allowed into the library only on free days, and you get those only after the first three weeks are ended. So again, good fortune to you, neophyte. The moment she's gone, a whirl to Britta, horrified. Three weeks. I can't wait that long. Who knows what will happen between now and then. What if we start training with death shrieks? The novices told us at breakfast that they didn't do so until their third month at the Warthubera, but that was because they were training only for raids against local death shriek nests. Now that the death shriek migration is upon us, everybody's preparing for the campaign, which means we'll be trained even more intensely than they were. I wouldn't be surprised if we had to spar with death shrieks starting this week. There has to be another way, there has to. I say to Britta, panic rising. What if my eyes change color again in their presence? What if someone sees, exposes me? Dread chokes me as I think of what could happen, the Karmakos forcing me into the caverns beneath the Warthu bearer to conduct tests the way the elders did back in Erfurt, the Jatu dragging me away to be executed again and again. I can't do that again, I can't. I have to learn about mother, find some method to control whatever ability is growing inside me. Right now, the heraldry is the only hope I have. I try to calm my thoughts as Britta replies, there will be, Decca. We just have to search for it. Besides, isn't it a good thing you can sense the death shrieks? I still. What? Think of how useful it'll be when we go on raids and such. It could be very valuable. We could use it on raids, spot the death shrieks before they ever appear. It might give us an advantage. Britta shrugs, completely unaware she's just upended my entire world view. Valuable. All this time, I've been terrified of my ability. But what if it's a useful weapon, a sword to unsheathe when the situation requires? And Britta saw so easily what I could not accepted so easily what even my own family couldn't. Tears sear my eyes and I blink them back. I watch as she continues, perhaps instead of trying to hide it, you should try to master it. Control it. You have a point, I finally manage to say. I do, don't I? She seems very pleased with herself. Let's find out what we can about your mother, and then we can start training after we finish these first few weeks, that is. She pulls me onwards, following behind the line of other girls. Our first lesson for the day is in a small, plain wooden building that sits in the middle of the hill. The sun has only just begun to stretch itself in the sky, but it's already hot when we enter. Kamoko Huan is sitting cross-legged on a reed mat, a pale yellow half-mask covering her from forehead to nose, waiting for us. This morning, she's wearing a pretty blue robe embroidered with pink flowers, 
and her hair is held up by an ornately jeweled comb. A pair of heavily armed Jatu stand behind her, arms folded menacingly. Find your seats, neophytes, she says in her soft, calm voice, pointing at the reed mats that have been laid out in two orderly rows. Britta and I look at each other, then quickly do as we're told, dipping a knee in greeting to her before hurrying to the mats at the very back, along with the twins, Katia, and Belkalis. As I settle into a kneel, I'm dimly aware of Gazal glowering at us from the shadows, where a few other novices have taken their seats. There are about five or six of them, but Gazal and Jennifer are the only ones I recognize. Kamoko Huan claps her hands. Welcome to your first combat class, neophytes, she says. I am Kamoko Huan, and I will teach you to use your body as a weapon. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintances. She bows formally to us. We all look at her, unsure of how to reply to this new greeting. Bow to the Kamoko. Gazal barks. When we quickly try to comply, fumbling in our attempt, Kamoko Huan holds up her hand. I think, Gazal, she says, amused, we have to demonstrate first. She turns to us. Like this, she says, touching her head to the floor. This is how you greet your Kamakos when you are on the mat. Now you try. We quickly replicate the bow. Kamoko Huan's mouth quirks. Good. Not perfect, but good. We turn to each other, relieved. At least we did not completely disgrace ourselves, Britta whispers to me out the corner of her mouth. I suddenly wonder whether the recruits are having the same troubles we are. Not likely. A memory of Kata's sword calloused hands rises, and I shiver it away, turn back to Kamoko Huan as she gracefully rises. Now, then, she says decisively. In order to engage in combat, you must first know your forms. Forms are battle stances, each one a tiny part of the dance you will soon become intimately familiar with. The dance of death. My eyes narrow. How is a dance going to help us fight death shrieks? On the other side of me, Adwapa scoffs under her breath, dance of death. She's going to get us killed, this one. A hairpin slams into the wall behind her, something pinned underneath it. A piece of flesh, golden blood still dripping from it. Adwapa turns, sees it, and her eyes widen with shock. My ear, she gasps, holding her left ear. The top half of it is gone. Kamoko Huan smiles mildly, rearranging the portion of her hair that's now fallen from the rest of her pins. For the first time, there's a look of steel in her gaze, the power hidden behind that ornamental exterior. She calmly stretches out her hand towards Adwapa. I seem to have lost my hairpin, neophyte. Can you fetch it for me? Clutching her bleeding ear, Adwapa slowly retrieves the pin, then, trembling, hands it to Kamoko Huon. The Kamoko smiles gratefully and dismisses her with a nod. Once Adwapa's returned to her seat, Kamoko Huon turns to the rest of the class. Shall we continue? Yes, Kamoko, we quickly say, still in shock. Kamoko Huan nods, rises. I shall now demonstrate the first form. She plants her feet apart and shifts her weight so it's concentrated on her lower body. When she spreads her arms in a graceful but precise movement, her expression stern, something inside me trembles. Kamoko Huan reminds me of white hands, pretty on the outside, deadly on the inside. In the immovable earth form, you are centered, at your most powerful, she says. You are in the perfect position to attack, or evade. She demonstrates quickly, her movements precise but fluid. I will show you. She beckons to the larger of the two Jatu behind her, a hulking beast of a man, then bows formally when he approaches. He quickly bows as well. He launches into an attack, and we all watch, rapt. How will the Kamoko handle this head-on attack? 
To my surprise, Kamoko Huan flips him on his back before he can even touch her, then twists his wrist to an odd and painful angle. Yield. I yield, the Jatu cries out, his eyes bulging from the pain. The Kamoko tuts, but her eyes are as cold as icicles. First lesson, neophytes, alaki do not yield. You conquer or you die. For an alaki, for any warrior, death should be a familiar friend, an old partner you greet before you step onto the battlefield. Do not fear it, do not shy from it. Embrace it, tame it to your will. That is why we always say we who are dead salute you to our commanders before we ride off into battle. A strange, uneasy feeling builds inside my gut. Death should be a familiar friend. I can barely fathom the concept. Kamoko Huan finally releases the Jatu's hand and bows to him again. My thanks for your aid, she says sweetly. The burly man gives a pained nod, then limps off, wincing. By now, we're all quiet, tense. Kamoko Huan turns to us. Do you know why I chose to demonstrate that move with him, neophytes, she asks. We shake our heads slowly. Because I wanted to show you that size does not matter, she explains. No opponent is infallible, no matter how big he is. Death shrieks may be bigger, but no matter how frightening they seem, how intimidating they may be, you are just as strong, just as fast, especially when you enter the combat state which you experienced this morning when you ran and your senses became heightened, your reflexes sharpened. We will explore this more as time goes on. For now, let us continue the lesson. 14. Raise your lazy asses, neophytes. I don't need this aggressively shouted reminder. Two and a half weeks in, the schedule is second nature to me now so I'm already washed and dressed by the time Jenaba comes to lead us to the courtyard. The recruits are waiting there, the leather armor on their bodies gleaming under the flickering light of the torches. I blink, startled by the sight. I haven't seen any of the recruits since the day we were matched in Jaw Hall. Heard them training, of course, their voices carrying over the wall. But even on lunar days, when we all have a full afternoon to ourselves, we haven't crossed paths, not that I expected it. Unlike us, they're free to go into the city that day, free to mix with the people beyond the war through bearers' walls, as are the assistants and matrons. The only people who never leave the war through bearer are the Alaki, not that we're allowed to roam inside the training ground either. I've confirmed this trying to enter the Hall of Records the last two lunar days. Assistants and matrons constantly guard the corridors, ready to greet any alaki who strays off the beaten path with the barbed end of their rungus. Just as Jenaba said, neophytes are not allowed in any of the restricted areas until our first three weeks end. Thankfully, they're almost over. In three days exactly, I'll enter the Hall of Records. Then I'll read from the Heraldry of Shadows and answer the questions that have been plaguing me ever since I entered this training ground. I can almost imagine it now, seeing my mother's name there, reading about her life, her deeds, learning about her abilities, about mine as well. Anticipation races through me at the thought. As I savor the feeling, golden eyes meet mine across the courtyard. I stiffen, unnerved, when Kater nods at me, his expression cold as it was the first time I met him. The novices are directing us to merge lines so I reluctantly shuffle towards him, grateful that my hair has already regrown to its former length, courtesy of my alaki healing. I'll have to cut it again soon. It interferes with training. Most girls have taken to hacking theirs off every morning like the novices do, and some, like Adwapa, keep their heads perfectly bald. Once we're standing side by side, Kater nods down at me. Morning greetings, Decca, he murmurs. Morning greetings, I reply, fighting the urge to duck my head. Just as before, I feel uneasy when I'm near him. Something about him makes me remember Iona's and what happened the last time I got close to a boy. Maybe it's his height. He's just as tall as Iona's, and that's no common thing. 
I forcibly return my attention to the front of the courtyard as Carmoko Thandau steps forward, dark brown skin gleaming against her clay-daubed hair. This morning, she's wearing midnight blue robes and a half-mask painted darkest onyx. All the other Carmikos behind her and Captain Kelechi wear similar masks, as they always do whenever men are about. I don't envy them. I can only imagine how impractical those masks would be during training, with all the sweating and dirt we have to deal with. In the past two and a half weeks, Komoko Thandai announces, you have learned the basics of speed, strength, weaponry, and combat. Today, you will begin training in pairs, starting with your daily run. Remember, you are partnered from now on, and you must account for each other's strengths and weaknesses. Understood? Yes, Kamoko, I shout along with the other girls. She nods at the Zul, who steps forward, her Yuruni, a slim, blonde northern boy, just beside her. Let's go, neophytes, move your asses, she commands, setting off in a quick jog. I follow behind her, easily keeping pace. Over the past few weeks, the run has become my favorite part of the day. I can already notice the air slowing around me as I move faster up the hill, muscles loosening, senses coming alive. I'm slipping into the combat state, much more easily than when I first arrived. I turn to glance at Britta, about to chat with her, as always, but she isn't there, and neither are the other girls, now that I'm looking. They're all at the bottom of the hill, shuffling at least five steps after the recruits, even though their muscles must be spasming and twitching from the effort of running so slowly. They are doing exactly what they would have done in their home villages, holding themselves back so they don't show up any potential husbands. But the Warthu bearer isn't a home village, and there are much greater dangers here than upsetting a few boys. The memory of the corpses in Erfurt's snow flashes across my mind and I dig my nails into my skin. I dart over to Britta and the others, not caring when the recruits stop and watch, astounded by my speed. You can't slow down for them, I say. You have to make them keep up with you. Decker, Britta whispers. She glances at the gawking recruits, embarrassed. You can't let them see you like that, in the combat state and such. It'll frighten them. The other girls around her nod in agreement. She's right, Katia says. Frighten them? I can't believe what I'm hearing. Do you think we're here, learning all these new things, endangering ourselves, just for the sport of it? There are death shrieks outside these walls, and they will kill us if we don't learn how to fight them. We will die out there. Memories bombard my mind, sudden and violent. The gold, the blood. I gag, nearly tasting it dripping into my mouth the way it used to do. Have you ever died, Katia? I ask. She blinks. Well, no. It's agony, greater than you've ever felt, and if it's not your true death, you wake up dreading that it'll happen again. Then, after it happens multiple times, you begin wishing for a true death, a final death, just so you never have to eye break off, shaking from the force of my emotions. Tears are blurring my eyes, and a few drop down before I can stop them. I have to take a breath, calm myself, so I can look back at my friends, at the other neophytes now gathering behind them, their eyes wide with horror. The majority of them haven't faced death yet. They came from towns and villages near the capital and were taken to Jaw Hall immediately after their rituals. Whenever we have discussions about how we came to the Warthu bearer, they always say the transporters were already waiting in the temples. They've never experienced the icy coldness of a sword as it slices into the flesh, never had to endure those long and terrifying moments before merciful oblivion. It was only the ones like Belkalis and I, the Alaki so far from the capital, it took transporters months to reach us, who were unlucky enough to experience the death mandate and the terror that came with it. But we both survived somehow. Unlike all the girls who didn't make it past their first two or three deaths, we both lived. And we have to honor that. I breathe back the memories as I turn to the other girls. 
Our whole lives, we've been taught to make ourselves smaller, weaker than men. That's what the infinite wisdoms teaches, that being a girl means perpetual submission. That's how it was back in effort, me always accepting everything because I thought it was Oyomo's will. Was it Oyomo's will, the village turning its back on me, the elders dismembering me so they could sell my blood? Was it his will for them to cut out my tongue so I couldn't scream? What about all the things in the infinite wisdoms, the rules against running, laughing too loudly, dressing in certain ways, all of it his will? The truth is, girls have to wear smiling masks, contort themselves into all kinds of knots to please others, and then, when the death shrieks come, girls die. They die. I glance from one blood sister to the other. The way I see it, we all have a choice right now. Are we girls, or are we demons? Are we going to die, or are we going to survive? I've been trying so desperately to keep myself from thinking such thoughts, what does it matter if I'm here anyway, about to face death once more? What does it matter if we're all here, risking our bodies and lives in service to Oterra? The other girls stare back at me, eyes wide with fear, horror, but I remain silent, letting them decide for themselves. I already know my answer. I will not die here in this horrible place. I will not die before I discover the truth about myself. I'll survive, and I'll do so long enough to leave this place, long enough to find someone to love me who cherishes me the way Katia's betrothed did her. I just have to be brave for once. All I have to do is be brave for once. I remove one of the pins from the side of my robe, stab it into my palm. It stings, a sharp, searing pain, but I don't even wince. My weeks here have already made me tougher, deadened my skin. Gold begins dripping, and I wipe it across my chest, marking the same place they would have cut me during the ritual of purity. The blood gleams there, the cursed gold that I am now bleeding for my own cause, not anybody else's. What are you doing a girl begins, but I ignore her. I'm a demon, I declare, and I will survive this to win my absolution and a life for myself. Me too. Belkalissa's voice comes from behind me, and when I turn, she's there, holding up her bleeding palm as well, an expression in her eyes that tells me that she understands, that she feels the way I do. I'm a demon. I'm a demon, the twins echo, chests glistening as they wipe blooded golden palms across them. And now other girls are doing so as well. Even Britta and Katia, who were so horrified at first, walk up to me with bleeding palms. I'm a demon, Britta says, wiping her hand across her chest. The recruits whisper to each other, confused, alarmed by this sudden and bloody display, but it's too late to stem the tide. Demon. I am a demon, each girl declares, bleeding herself to display her golden blood. The blood we have so long been told is cursed. The blood that binds us to each other. Before long, all the girls are standing together. Bleeding. And this time, when we run again, we don't hold back. As I walk over for breakfast, an unwelcome presence falls in step beside me. Kater. That was an interesting speech, he says, by way of conversation. Human girls or demons. Clever way to motivate the others. I stop mid-step, trying to ignore the familiar high-pitched shrieks echoing in the distance as I look up at him. We're standing next to the entrance of the caverns where the death shrieks are kept, and they are agitated, as always. A word of warning, however, he says. The commanders may not look too fondly on any of you embracing your heritage too keenly, Decker. Fear shivers over me, but I exhale it away. I'm done being afraid. Is that a threat? I ask. No, a warning. Then I'll take it under advisement. Something almost like a smile darts over his lips, and he steps closer. You know, I'm relieved. Why? I ask, curious. He shrugs. When we were partnered, I thought you were too delicate to be a soldier. Too delicate? 
I echo, surprised. No one has considered me delicate since the moment my blood ran gold. I'm an alaki, I remind him. Kater nods. That may be true, but not everyone is suited to killing death shrieks. Are you? Kater shrugs. I'm told I'm good at exterminating them, he says simply. There's a look in his eyes, an absolute belief. I was worried you wouldn't be suited to it, that you would be a burden on the battlefield. Perhaps I was wrong, perhaps you will be able to withstand your fear, he says. The calm assuredness in his eyes nettles me, but I know better than to show it. Instead, I smile sweetly at him. You know, I'm relieved too. Why is that? I was afraid you were too pretty to get your hands dirty. His eyes widen with surprise, and, for a moment, the side of his lips quirk. Well, we're both full of surprises, aren't we? He says as he walks away. 15. I can't believe we're finally here. Britta's voice is high-pitched with excitement as we walk through the library, the dark, cavernous chamber on the topmost floor of the war Thubera, Katia, Belkalis and the twins at our side. With each step, my anticipation builds higher and higher. In just a few moments, I'll be there, standing before the heraldry. Then I'll read from its pages, finally find the answers to the questions that have been plaguing me since the day I entered this training ground. At least I hope I will. There's always the possibility there are no answers in the heraldry, and I've wasted everybody's time coming here. Perhaps I should have just bolstered my courage and spoken to Matron Nazra or Kamoko Thandai about my suspicions. It would have been so much easier than walking past these bookshelves, eagerness and dread lining the pit of my stomach. But no, Matron Nazra is hateful, and Kamoko Thandai is much too frightening to approach. Better to do this with my friends. Britta doesn't notice my introspection as she continues, just think, in a few moments, you could have all the answers you seek. Or you could have nothing, Belkalis humps, because you created an entire farce out of nothing, and us being here, on our one lunar afternoon, is indeed a farce. Trust her to always state my deepest fears out loud. Must you always be such a pissfart? Katia TSKS. Pissfart? Adwapa stops and looks at her. Did you just make up that word? Britta dimples. I did. Rather fitting, don't you think? It has a certain. We're here. Katia nods towards the heavy wooden door before us, the entrance to the Hall of Records. Isatu, the midnight dark assistant assigned to our common bedroom, is organizing the scrolls on the shelf beside the entrance. She grins when she sees us, her smile filled with goodwill and cheer. Unlike most of the assistants and matrons, she was immediately assigned to the Warthu Beryl when she became a temple maiden two years ago, so she has retained the happiness that would have been snuffed out had she had to serve priests. Ah, there you are, neophytes, she says, unlocking the door. Right this way. As a reminder, you're never to speak about anything you read in this book to any outside person on pain of death. If you do so, remember the walls always have ears, especially when it comes to shadows. I nod, trying to push back the chills rushing through me as she ushers us into a small, circular room, light filtering in through the heavy glass roof. Scrolls line the shelves attached to the walls, their edges aged and delicate, as if they've been here for hundreds of years. Flames flicker from the sconces, and an umbra has been carved into the floor. It's not the most interesting sight here, however. The large stone pedestal in the middle of the room is, or, rather, the thick leather-bound book on top of it. Isatu walks over to it, opens the book. You said your mother was twenty-five years old when she had you? I nod and she explains, most potential shadows are taken in for training when they're ten, so if you're sixteen now, your mother would have first entered the war through Bera about thirty-one years ago. She flips through the pages until she finds the one she's looking for. You can start from here. Shadows are listed alphabetically according to their year, and each entry has two pages each. 
All right, then, I'll leave you to it. Nodding, I approach the book. The moment of truth. I murmur, muscles tense. The moment of truth. Britta smiles reassuringly at me. I flip through the pages, names flying past, Arda, Annalise, Binta, Katka, Nimir, Tran. When I get to the use, I slow down, my heart hammering in my chest. Mother's name was an uncommon name in Erfurt, but what if it is the opposite here in Himera? What if there are several women with her name and I can't tell which one is hers? But, no, every shadow has a different identification badge listed under their entry. I should be able to recognize it once I see it. I continue flipping until finally, I'm at the last few names. Yue, Uda, Yukami, Yuna, Yuzad, Asma. I stop, flip the pages back, my breath short. I didn't see mother's name. I flip again and again, but no matter how many times I turn the page, the result is the same. She's not there, I whisper, tears blurring my eyes. She's not there. I walk to a corner and slump on the floor, defeat weighing on me. All these weeks, I've been imagining finding mother's name, getting answers to all my questions about what she was, what I am. But there are no answers, because she was never here. I made up an entire fantasy in my head to distract myself from the fact that I'm just a... Decker, look. She's here. I jolt up as Britta calls excitedly to me. She's standing beside the book, pointing to a page. I didn't even notice her walk over. I found her. She was here a year earlier than Asati thought. What? I gasp, surging up. Yumiu of Punthan, nine years old, dark brown skin, black eyes, short brown hair, Arthemni tribal markings, two on each cheek. Identification badge, golden necklace, umbra inscribed. I suddenly forget to breathe. That's her. I say raggedly, tears searing my eyes as I look down at the entry only a paragraph long. She was here. She was a shadow. The confirmation of everything I've suspected is too much to bear, and I begin crying, great big tears falling down my cheeks. Oh, Decker, Britta says, hugging me. As she holds me, Katia reads on. Retired after 15 years of service due to personal reasons. Then she stops. What else does it say? I urge. Katia shakes her head. That's all there is. All there is? My eyebrows gather. That can't be all. What about what she was like? What she studied, did she have any special characteristics? Special characteristics? Katia frowns. No, that's all it says. Let me see. I wriggle out of Britta's arms and look down at the entry, chest tightening even further when I see it's just as Katia said. There's nothing more. No mention of any abilities, no further entries, nothing. My chest tightens again. What about the tingling, the ability to sense death shrieks? What about the way my eyes and voice change when I'm around those monsters? I thought the heraldry would have answers, but there are none here, nothing that can help me at all. I'm right back where I started, and even worse, my first lessons with death shrieks are only a few weeks away. As I walk towards the armory later that evening, I'm in such a mood that I don't even notice the smell of blood coating the air. It takes a scream, wretched and all too human, to return my thoughts to the present. Britta and I look at each other, eyes wide in the growing darkness. We both know what that scream means. A new raiding party must have returned from the outskirts of Himera without killing their required quota of death shrieks. The novices who didn't kill their share are being flayed. I've glimpsed it numerous times over the past few weeks, matron Nazra peeling skin from novices' backs as easily as she would from a citron. I've seen the golden blood dripping, heard the pitiful cries of the girls unlucky enough to be punished, and then the silence, the awful, awful silence. Suffering makes demons stronger, 
the matron always explains, a macabre smile slicing her lips. If that's the case, all the alaki in the Warthu bearer must be hardened to the point of steel. Another scream splits the air, and my hands clench into fists, the skin on them stretching so tight they could split. First, mother's uninformative entry in the heraldry, and now this. What more will I have to endure before this miserable day ends? Don't listen to it, Cater says, glancing at me as he marches onward, a bundle of wooden atticas, our long, flat practice swords, in hand. He and two of the other Yuruni are helping us return them to the armory before they go back to their barracks. Just push it to the back of your mind. His words set my skin boiling with anger. Even though we've settled into an uneasy truce, Kata is not my friend. Very few of the boys are. After what happened during the run, they are wary of me and the other girls, frightened of our power. Now they know how much greater our strength is than theirs, and that it's only going to continue growing. Easy for you to say, I reply, turning to him. You're not the ones being flayed. We're not the ones who can regenerate, Akalan, Belkalus as Yuruni, sniffs. A tall, burly northerner, he has a sour, pious look that reminds me of Elder Durkas when his feeling is specially sanctimonious. Even if that were the case, Britta humps at him, which it's clearly not, ye lot still wouldna be punished, and ye know it. It's true, Katia agrees. They never punish the boys. Even when girls die. But Oyomo forbid a recruit tastes infinity, I add. That's when every girl in the raiding party is flayed. So, what, you want us all to bleed now? Akalan sneers. You want us to suffer like. Let's not argue, Shuram, Katia's Yuruni, quickly interjects in his calm, gentle manner. He's the boy I once thought I'd matched with, the smiling, tattooed westerner. We're almost at the armory. Let's just... I'm no longer listening to him. A sudden, panic tingling is surging through my veins, and it only takes me a second to recognize the cause. Death shrieks, but not the ones in the caverns under the wall through bearer. Heart pounding, I follow my senses to the wall just beside us, where I quickly spot four horrifically familiar figures creeping down the stones, their white pelts gleaming past the mist wreathing their bodies. Leapers, the death shrieks that jump onto their victims and rend them apart using claws and teeth. They're really on the walls, just as we've been warned so many times they could be. The others don't seem to have noticed them yet. They are much larger than the ones the novices use for sparring practice, these death shrieks, their bodies muscled and healthy, their eyes alert in the darkness. So this is the difference between captive death shrieks and free ones. I'd almost forgotten, but now my vision is sharpening, so I can see them clearer, and my ears are muffling everything else out, so I can hear their low, isolated footsteps. I'm already slipping into the combat state, just as Kamoko Huan taught us. I don't need a run to stimulate it, it's rising by instinct. I put down the extra atticas I'm carrying, doing it slowly so as not to attract the death shriek's attention, aware of Kata's eyes darting towards me. This is the first time I've ever seen him so attentive outside combat practice. Perhaps he senses them too, feels the cold of their mists now creeping towards us. What is it? he whispers. I flick my eyes towards the wall. Death shrieks, four of them on the western wall, all leapers, huge ones. Everyone stiffens, alarmed, but I quickly tally the odds. Six of us to four of them. But it takes three to four girls to topple one death shriek during a raid. And usually those girls have real swords. We're outmatched, Britta whispers. We need to run to main hall and raise the alarm. Kater nods, his eyes squinted against the darkness as he tries to pick them out. Like the other boys, he can't see as keenly in the dark as we are lucky can. Everyone, he says, turning to the others, all of them stiff and tense now after my words, I can't see them, so we run on Decker's mark. And we do so silently. 
But Akalan begins, bluster in his voice. Kata sternly cuts him off. We're the only ones out here, and we have no real weapons and no helmets to protect us against their screams. On Decker's mark, he repeats, nodding at me. I glance at the death shrieks. The first of them is just now stepping onto the ground. When it notices me looking, it glances up, its eyes meeting mine. There's a look in them, a predatory intelligence. It opens its mouth. Now! I shout, taking off down the path. A blur passes me, Katia already leading the way, her eyes wide with terror. D-H-H-S-H-O-I-E-K-S, she screams, panic making her disregard Kata's instructions. Death shrieks are attack. A massive white form slams into her, sending her tumbling into the bushes. As she falls, the death shriek goes after her, but Shoram quickly blocks it, Atika at the ready. The death shriek hisses at him, teeth and claws bared in annoyance. Damn it, Katia! Kata growls, bolting over. I do the same, shocked to find the other three death shrieks splitting off behind us to head off the novices and recruits now running to answer Katia's call. Why aren't they shrieking, I wonder. We're the closest ones to them, why aren't they trying to attack us? I barely have time to think this before the death shriek in front of Katia moves, claws raking down to easily slice through Shuram's wooden sword. He whimpers as it falls apart in his hands. The death shriek raises its claws again, about to deliver the death blow, but Katia lunges up, pushing him out of the way and then darting backwards. For just a moment, I'm sure she's safe, sure she's evaded the claws. She's one of the fastest girls in the Warthu Bearer, after all. But then I hear the sickening crunch of bone, see the claws protruding out through her chest. Oh, she gasps, eyes wide with surprise. Her spine rips back, pulled out by the death shriek's claws. Time seems to suspend, my entire body caught in amber, as I watch Katia bleeding out through that gaping hole in her back. A strange blue color is racing out of it, a shade of blue I've never seen on anything before. Her body twitches once, twice, then stills. I know, without having to ask, that she's gone. There's no golden sheen of an almost death, no gilded sleep for her. Katia. I whisper, my chest deflating, horror leadening my limbs. I turn to the death shriek, which remains where it is, watching her. It almost seems, surprised. Shocked that it killed her so easily. A low, deep feeling rumbles inside me, a heated volcano that turns my blood to fire and my breath to ash. Get away from her, you beast. I rage, the words erupting from my mouth. My voice is laird, powerful now, as I repeat, get away from her. The death shriek's entire body immediately goes rigid, its eyes rolling in its head. It staggers away, limbs jerking as if they're on strings. Adwapa and Asha swoop into the space it left, quickly plucking Katia's body up. The moment they do so, exhaustion crashes over me, a wave of tiredness muffling everything around me, dulling my senses to their lowest. All I see is flashes, the other death shrieks grabbing the staggering one and then running back over the wall the way they came, Adwapa gently resting Katia's body on the ground as novices and Karmakos finally arrive, Shoram rushing to Katia's side, tears in his eyes. Kamoko Thando gestures for the novices to pull Katia's body away from him. Who raised the initial alarm, she asks, glancing around. Decker did, Britta replies. Then, Katia. She stops, her voice breaking. I ignore her, my eyes fastened on Katia's corpse, on that horrible blue color seeping from her spine. Just a few moments ago, she was darting in front of me long red hair gleaming in the dark, and now, now. My entire body buckles, suddenly unable to hold up its own weight. Even after almost a month here, a month seeing at least one Alaki corpse return from every raid, I still didn't understand how easily we could die. After all, those were novices, older girls far removed me from me and my friends. But Katia, how could she succumb so easily? 
How could the death shriek's claws strike true the very first time? As tears fall freely down my eyes and exhaustion weights my limbs, fingers snap, forcing me to look up. It's Kamoko Thandai, frowning as she stares down at me. Your eyes, Decker, she murmurs wonderingly. Whatever's happened to your eyes? That's the last thing I hear before darkness reaches up to claim me. 16. I saw what you did last night. Kata's voice is an unwelcome whisper in my ear. It's evening and we're at the lake, observing Katia's funeral rites. A lackey aren't allowed burial in the ground, so we're burning her on the water, in a small boat we've turned into a funeral pyre. In the absence of a male guardian, Shuram is in charge of her rites, and he reads solemnly from the infinite wisdoms. He'll be leaving Himera the moment the funeral rites have ended returning to his home in the western provinces. He can't take the thought of witnessing any more comrades' deaths. I don't blame him. If I had the choice, I'd leave too. It doesn't matter that mother was once here, that there are still questions I need answers to. I want to escape this place, want to run somewhere far away. But I'm bound to these walls, just as Katia was. Her skin is the deep indigo of the summer sky now and her long red curls flake in tiny patches as the fire flickers over them. She never cut her hair after that first day here, not even when it got in the way of training. I always thought the matrons would punish her for it, but they never did. It smells like apples as it burns away, the big red ones from the northern provinces she once told me she was fond of. I don't know whether this is fanciful thinking or not, but it drives away the metallic odor of blood from my nostrils, the lingering memory of her ripped out spine, the look in the death shriek's eyes when I addressed it, the same look I saw in the earth at death shriek's eyes. I inhaled the smell to banish the horrible thought before I turned to Kata. What do you mean? I murmur. I'm so numb now, I'm not even afraid that Kata suspects me, that Kamoko Thandai likely does as well. What kind of life have I chosen that people die so easily? That friends die so easily? One much better than what you had before. I stifle the unhelpful thought. I don't want to think practically right now, don't want to think about what happened yesterday, when the death shriek stood over Katia, and I spoke. Kata moves closer. I won't tell anyone, he says. And, if it helps, I don't think Kamoko Thandai will either. This assurance does nothing to dull the twitchy, agitated feeling that's crawling over me. What exactly is it that you want? I ask, looking up. If there's one thing being here in the constant presence of death shrieks has taught me, it's that Britta was correct, my gift is valuable, which means other people will do awful things to get their hands on it. On me. A memory of the cellar flashes through my mind, golden blood on the floor, the elders approaching, buckets in their hands. I push it away, wait for Kata to reply. It takes him a moment. The same thing I want from everyone, he says, determination in his gaze. To help eradicate the death shrieks. What does that have to do with me? Don't play stupid, Decker. Whatever that is that you did last night it seems like it might be useful. I think we should explore it, in secret, of course. I nearly laugh at the irony. Just weeks ago, Britta suggested the same thing. I force myself to pay attention as he continues, I don't think my commanders would take kindly to such things, much less the priests. These last words, the priests, stoke my agitation, and that memory flashes again, Elder Durkaz's hand, a knife inside it. I breathe to calm myself. Why should I trust you? If you saw what you think you saw, why should I believe that you won't betray me to the priests or your commanders? He shrugs, golden gaze meeting my own. There are monsters at our gates whose very screams can cause a person's eardrums to explode, and whose claws can saw through bodies smoother than a knife through butter. Don't you want revenge? There's a look in his eyes now, a bitterness. He isn't just talking about me, but also about himself, perhaps even the other Yuruni as well. Aren't you tired of losing people to them? 
always losing to them. I find myself nodding, anger abruptly boiling inside me. More images rush through my head, the attack on the village, all those corpses lying in the snow, then the cellar, golden blood pooling on the floor, and finally, Katia, claws piercing through her chest. Death shrieks have already taken everything away from me. What else am I going to let them take? I know I can command them, that I can force them to do my bidding. I need to learn more about my ability. Need to use whatever this thing inside me is to get back at those monsters. To get revenge for Katia. I am tired, I whisper, suddenly thinking of everything I've lost. Mother, father, my life back in effort. I think of Katia, who only ever wanted to go home, to be a wife to Rian, have a family. I'm so very, very tired. Kata nods. Me too, which is why I'll gladly swear my loyalty to you, protect you with my life, if what I saw you do can help us kill more of them. As I glance up at him, startled by this fervent declaration, he holds out his right hand. I mean it. Partners, in truth, this time. I stare at his outstretched hand, confusion rising. No man has ever offered me his before, as if we were equals, but that's exactly what Kate is doing. Perhaps he truly does mean everything he's saying. Or perhaps this is a trick, one that could end my life. Either way, he already has his suspicions about me. Perhaps it's better that I ally with him, watch him for any weaknesses I might exploit. A devil's bargain, to be sure, but what isn't in this life of ours? I take his hand, marveling at how odd it looks against mine. Skin versus gilding, brown against gold. Partners, in truth, I say. This time, Kata squeezes my hand before he releases it. My breath catches, though I don't know why. Perhaps it's all the exhaustion. 17. See any changes? Kata asks, his voice echoing off the damp, dark walls. It's early morning, and we're in the caverns under the war thubera, using the spare few minutes we have between lessons to test out our theory about my ability. The others are back in Carmoko Huan's lesson hall, still packing up from combat practice. I've warned them to stay away until I'm more certain about Kata. I'm still not certain what his motives are. As he stands lookout at the end of the passage, I stare down at a bucket of water, my skin tingling feverishly. Death shrieks are caged in the next cavern over, and their muffled grunts and clicks are causing my blood to pull faster and faster, moving in tandem with all the mist now crawling around me. They secrete it whenever they're agitated, and they're always agitated down here. I examine my reflection, then sigh. My eyes are still as boring and grey as they were ten minutes ago. No differences, I say to Kata. I pick up the bucket to empty it then stop, think. What if I get closer? What? No, they're not wearing their gags. Just keep watch, I interrupt, rushing away. The next cavern has been hollowed out into a makeshift stable, cages on either side. Lights flicker dimly in the sconces, illuminating the rushes on the floor, the chains binding each cell's monstrous occupant. Death shrieks become more aggressive when they're in the same cage, so the Karmakos separate them. There are about twenty here in total, the bulk of the death shrieks at the war Thubera. About ten more are kept in the other caverns. My skin prickles faster, my heartbeat rises, as I approach them. The ones here aren't gagged, so a single scream from them could end me. But no, that's not true. I remember how it was in Erfurt, everyone's ears bleeding when I alone could continue standing. It was the same thing when Katia died. I could hear the shrieks, feel their power, but I wasn't affected by them the way the others were. I just have to concentrate on my breathing, keep my mind on the present the way Kamoko Huan taught me. I'll be fine. Taking a deep breath for strength, I walk down the center of the caverns, aware of the gleam of predatory black eyes, the rustling of chains, as massive bodies stretch in the corners. The heavy, Pungent aroma clouding the cavern strengthens, as does a lighter, 
sickeningly sweet smell I cannot identify. I ignore the low growls, the fear rising inside me, as I walk over to the largest cage, the central one. A subtle hissing starts between the cages as this one's occupant slowly rises, distinctive, silvery claw-like projections on its back immediately recognizable from our first evening at the Warthu Bearer. When it staggers forward, massive body shimmering in the dull light, my mouth goes dry. Rattle, the alpha death shriek of all the ones here. The chieftain. I look up at him, at those eyes gleaming with hatred towards me. Go on, scream, I whisper. I want you to. Something has risen inside me, a dark and abrupt feeling I would almost call rage, except it's riddled through with the razor's edge of another emotion, grief. I think of Katia, think of those hateful claws ripping through her body, and I walk closer. Just out of reach of those claws. I'm aware now of the other death shrieks stirring around me, velvety white leapers, their long-limbed arms allowing them to climb up their cages bars with ease, the massively tall, massively gaunt workers at the corners making chittering sounds. Kamoko Thandai taught us how to classify them all, how to understand their weaknesses, their strengths. I ignore them, focus on Rattle. I know, from the Kamoko's warnings, that he commands the other death shrieks here. Death shrieks are pack animals, always with a chieftain to direct them. They may lack human intelligence, but that doesn't mean they aren't smart. Why aren't you doing anything? I ask him as he growls softly in the darkness. He isn't making any movements, isn't reaching to attack me. It's the same with the other death shrieks, all of them chittering away as they watch. Why aren't they attacking? Why aren't they fighting me? It's almost like they're duller, slower somehow, than the ones that killed Katia, or even the ones back at Erfurt. Their lack of fight prickles at me. Enrages me. What's wrong with you? I hiss, glaring at Rattle. Suddenly, I don't care that I'm so close to his cage he could reach out and gut me, don't care that the matrons who attend to the death shrieks could discover me down here and give me a beating for my insolence. All I can think of is Katia, that look in her eyes. The fear. Scream. I rage. Threaten me. Do something. But he does nothing. That clicking sound rises, he and the other death shrieks clicking at each other, their voices building and building until. Decker. Kata's call comes as if from far away. Decker, we have to go, the drums are sounding. I exhale. Glance down at the water bucket, not surprised to see that my eyes are still normal in the reflection. I don't know why I was expecting otherwise. I empty the bucket in a nearby trough, then inhale to compose myself. Coming, I finally call back, as I walk out of the cavern. The death shrieks continue clicking after I'm gone. I emerge to find Kata waiting for me in the connecting passageway, worry in his eyes. The very sight grates at me. I don't know why he's pretending to care. What happened? he asks. Are you all right? Did they shriek? I shake my head. Nothing happened. And my eyes didn't change, at least, I didn't see them do so in my reflection. He nods, seeming to compose himself. Well, that's disappointing, he murmurs. We walk down the passage, each of us lost in our own thoughts, until something shifts in the shadows. It's Gazal, standing at the entrance to the next cavern, the one matron Nazra opened the floor to two months ago. It's our classroom for battle strategy, the class where we learn how to conduct raids and how to fight effectively during the campaign. Neophyte Decker, she says. You will remain after the lesson. There is something Kamoko Thando wishes to discuss with you. This announcement sends a cold sweat down my back. Does the Kamoko want to ask me about what happened that night with Katia? I force myself to exhale away the panicked thought as I nod respectfully to Gazal. Thank you for informing me, honored elder blood sister, I murmur. 
Satisfied, she walks into the main cabin, Kata and I following behind her. My muscles tense, senses on high alert, as I notice Kamoko Thandai standing at the center, the other neophytes and their Yuruni already settling into the wooden desks before her. The lesson is about to begin. Please don't ask me about what happened with the death shrieks, please don't ask me about what happened with the death shrieks, I desperately pray as Kata and I join the others. Thankfully, Kamoko Thandai doesn't even seem to notice me as she walks to the front of the desks, a scroll in hand. She turns it towards us, displaying a picture, one that never fails to produce tremors of fear inside me. You all know of the Gilded Ones, the Alaki's infernal ancestors, she says. I nod, reluctantly taking in the monstrous golden-veined beings depicted on the scroll. There's four of them, one so white she's glowing, another brown with a pendulous belly and protruding breasts, the third red and scaled over with wings like a dragon, and the fourth amorphous in shape and as dark as an inkblot. The sight of them fills me with unease. To think that I'm descended from them, from being so frightening, so nightmarish a form. I may have come to terms with being a lackey, but reminders like this still unsettle me. I push back the thought as Kamoko Thando hands the scroll to the neophyte nearest her, a short, doe-eyed southerner named Merut. Today, we will begin learning about the demonic heritage the Gilded Ones have left you and how to harness it against the death shrieks, she says. Open your scrolls to section 3. Let's get started. When the lesson ends, I remain seated, anxiety building. What does Kamoko Thando want with me? I'm so tense, everything she taught us about a lackey physiology has disappeared, replaced by a thousand horrific scenarios involving bloody rungus and questions about my true nature. My fears spiral higher and higher until Kata walks over, places a hand on my shoulder. I shiver from the surprising warmth of it, my thoughts abruptly calming. If Kamoko Thando wanted to report you to the Jatu, she would have done so by now, he says quietly, so remember that before you panic. I don't even know how he sensed my feelings, but I exhale. I'll keep that in mind, I whisper. He nods, heads for the door, but now the others have noticed. I'm not following behind them. Ye not coming, Decker? Britta asks. In a moment, I say, waving them away. Save me dinner. Kamoko Thando wishes to speak with me. What did you do? Lee, Britta's Yuruni asks. He's a lanky boy from the eastern provinces, all smiles and easy manner. Nothing that I know of, I quickly say. Then I frown. And why would you think I did something? Akalan humps pompously. Well, what else would it be? She never asks for you. Let's hurry and eat, I'm starving, Lee complains. You're always starving, Britta notes. A case of the river condemning the stream for rushing too fast, isn't it? Lee sniffs. Kata turns to me, a silent reminder in his eyes. Don't panic. I'll save you dinner, Decker, he says. I force myself to nod. My thanks. Their voices disappear down the hallway. Now I'm alone with Kamoko Thandai in the large, forbidding cavern, tension worming its way through my insides as I watch her put away her teaching scrolls. Finally, she turns to me. Follow me, Decker, she says quietly. I nod. Yes, Kamoko. My nervousness grows as she leads me out of the caverns up to a narrow stairway I've never seen before. Its sides seem to gather closer the farther up I go. What does the Kamoko plan for me? Does she want to imprison me, study and bleed me? My thoughts whirl faster and faster until finally, I can't bear the anticipation any longer. I stop, apprehensive. Kamoko Thandai, I say. Yes. Is this about before? About what happened with the death shrieks? She turns to me with a frown, seeming confused. Something happened when the death shrieks came. I cannot recall. 
As I blink at her, perplexed, she steps closer, whispers in my ear. If something did, however, happen then, I would be wise to keep it to myself, would I not? Just as I would also be wise to explore it at the most opportune time. Shock washes over me like a wave. She's not going to lock me away. Study me like the death shrieks caged under the wall through bearer. My muscles feel weak. My entire body feels unbalanced. I don't understand, I say, looking up at her. Kamoko Thando shrugs. I have no intention of hurting you, Alaki. You are Yumi's daughter, are you not? I blink, startled at this casual acknowledgement after all my weeks of skulking about. You knew my mother. She nods. She was four years my junior. An admirable shadow. Ferocious, determined. A pity what happened to her. She could have been a legend among us, but then she got with child. You, I presume? I nod, then glance up at her. So that's why she left? Because of me? She nods. It was quite the scandal. Shadows are not allowed to marry, so an execution order was sent out. Luckily, she had some noble as a benefactor who protected her. Got her away in time. I can't imagine how she did it, running away in the last week of rainy season, flooding everywhere. I'm grateful she survived. How is she? Dead, I reply, in a daze now. The red pox. Kamoko Thando blinks before she nods again. Then, did she live a good life? She was happy till the end. I look at her. I have a question. Was she like me? Did she have any abnormalities? As far as I could tell, she was perfectly human. Kamoko Thando looks down at me, her eyes piercing mine. Truth be told, of all the Alaki I've met in the two years since the Emperor's Mandate, I've met none like you. None other, I stop mid-sentence when a familiar whistling pierces my ears. It's coming from the top of the stairs, where an open door leads to a small private garden beside the courtyard. White hands. Is that what you call the Lady of the Equus? Kamoko Thandio's eyebrows rise. She steps to the side, clearing space for me on the stairs. She's waiting for you. Gasping, I rush past her up the stairs and out into the garden, where White Hand sits on a mound of pillows. A feast is spread out before her, and the Equus twins are curled at her side, stuffing themselves. The hazer sweet scent from her water pipe curls around the garden, mingling with the warm evening air. The Lady of the Equus. I gasp, hurrying over. Brahma, Masima, you're all here. The twins look up from their meal of yellow apples and other exotic fruit. Hello, quiet one. Masima grins fondly. Have you missed us? Brahma adds, rising. I rush over, joyfully petting them, and then waiting as they nuzzle me. Masima begins nibbling my hair, but I don't even mind it. I've missed you both so much. I say, hugging them. How long it has been since I last saw them both, sweet talking their way into eating all the apples in the wagon. I hug them even tighter, grinning when they hug me back. The world is so much more beautiful when we're around, is that not true? Bremer muses with a flick of his black striped tail. Surely so, brother, Masima agrees. We make all things better. I blink to push back the tears burning my eyes. Well, you've both certainly made my day better, I say, releasing them. Then I turn to white hands, nervous. If it wasn't for her, I'd still be in effort, still be in that cellar. And now she's here. Why is she here? Lady of the Equus, I say respectfully, walking over. White hands will do, she replies with a wave of her hand. I'm quite fond of that name, actually. When I stop just short of her, uncertain of what to do next, she looks up at me, amused. 
Tell me, is this awkward little approach how they teach you to greet your elders at the Warthu Baron nowadays? She asks, taking an idle puff of her water pipe and blowing little smoke rings into the air. No. I dip a knee to the ground in the formal greeting the Karmakos prefer outside of lessons. Evening greetings, white hands, I say. Evening greetings, Decca. She looks me up and down, then adds, you've certainly become more exuberant these past days. The Warthu bearer must be good for you. I shrug. Somewhat, I say, thinking of Katia. My thanks for sending Britta and me here. I know now that had it not been for her intervention, we would have probably been separated and sent to lesser training grounds, as so many Alaki are. She's the one who decided that we were worthy of the Warfu bearer. And it was a good thing that she did. I have to blink away thoughts of what Kamoko Thandio told me about mother. Something about what she said is still niggling at me, though I'm not exactly sure what. And how is our ever cheerful Britta, she asks. I smile. Even more cheerful, now that she's tossing boys across the sandpits. Exuberance must be in the air. White Hands puts down her water pipe, then nibbles delicately on a fruit. Imagine my surprise when I hear that you of all people are now bleeding yourself and calling yourself demon. You, the Alaki who nearly dissolved in a puddle of shame every time I said the words cursed gold. I take it you're no longer unsure of the truth of my words. My blush heats me all the way to the roots of my hair. I didn't know she knew I doubted the promises she used to lure me here. No, I am not, I say truthfully. The Warthu bearer is exactly as you promised. I am, no longer ashamed of what I am, I say. No matter my origins, there is worth in what I am. To my surprise, White Hands gives a full-throated laugh. Well, that certainly is good to hear. And much better than you moping around in the wagon. It quite put me off my feed. Carambola. She offers me a plate of the delicate yellowish-green fruits shaped like stars. I shake my head. No, thank you, I say respectfully. We'll take it, Bremer says, a greedy gleam in his eye as his fingers reach. No use letting a good fruit go to waste, Masima adds. White hands smacks their fingers. Not for you, she says sternly. You may go eat over there, test the figs on that tree. She points. As the equus pout and canter away, she turns to me. Here's a lesson for you, Decca. When someone, particularly your elder, offers you food, you eat. This is the way of the southern provinces. I nod and hastily take the plate. My thanks, white hands, I say. As I carefully sit across from her, I have a thought. Why are you here? Did you bring more girls to the Warthu bearer? I glance through the garden gate over to the courtyard, where the moon shines down on the statue of the emperor. There's only one wagon there, the same one that brought us all the way from the north. White hands shakes her head. No, the Warthu bearer has enough girls. Now I'm confused. Then why are you here? Because I teach here, of course, she says. Teach? I echo. The lady of the Equus is being modest, so as not to impress you with her grand stature, Komoko Thandai says as she walks towards us. She oversees the Warthu bearer, in addition to all the other training grounds. I feel my mouth slackening as I turn to white hands. You. Oversee all the training grounds. Yes, I suppose I do. She shrugs, then places a slice of cheese on my plate. Try this, it pairs excellently with the carambola. I shake my head, still in shock. If she oversees all the grounds, that must mean she's a noble, only the rich and powerful are given tasks as important as that. I can't eat with you, I say. It wouldn't be respectful, you're. You're new Carmoco? Of course I am, White Hands finishes smugly. As my head whips from her to Carmoco Thandai, she continues, 
I occasionally take on a student or two to prepare them for the most demanding raids, which is, of course, why I brought you and Britta here. Although your friend Belkalis also fascinates me, as does the ever angry Gazal. I frown. You know Belkalis. And Gazal? Undoubtedly. I keep my eyes sharp for promising students. You four will be my first new trainees. Lessons start tomorrow. You'll report to her after dinner, Carmoko Thandio adds. Promptly. I bow to her. Yes, my lady, I say. You mean, yes, Carmoko, white hands corrects, smiling at me. Well, that's that. Unless you want to remain here and smoke with us. The very thought appalls me. I rush upright. No, Kamoko, I gasp, then I bow and scurry away, leaving white hands in the garden, Kamoko Thandai was standing behind her. I'm halfway back to the common bedroom before I understand what bothered me about Kamoko Thandai's words. She said mother ran away the last week of the rainy season. But I was born in the month of the silver woolven, more than ten months after that. I've watched Kamoko Thando recite entire passages from memory in class. She's always correct when it comes to dates. But the timing she gave me isn't humanly possible. If she's correct, mother was pregnant at least a full month before she met father. There's no way I'm his natural child. There's no way I'm natural at all. So why am I turning her words over in my head, wondering if there's something there? 18. When I arrive at the lake the next evening, White Hands is seated on a small carpet, a bronze goblet of the potent local palm wine in hand. It's been a warmer Hemeran day than usual, and the smell of night jasmine wraps everything in a haze of sweetness. The scent so intoxicates me, it takes some seconds before I see the weapons laid out beside White Hands, their metal glinting in the low evening light. Panic beats a heightened pulse in my veins pushing away the thoughts that have been plaguing me all day, my conversation with Kamoko Thandio, my doubts about who my father is. All I can see now is those weapons, gleaming sinisterly in the fading light. Neophytes are required to use wooden weapons for the first two months, and the end of my second month isn't even near yet. I'm only supposed to use metal weapons in the third month, as I prepare to go out on raids. And yet here is an array of metal weapons, clearly meant for use. A thousand questions suddenly flit across my mind. What exactly did White Hands mean when she said the most demanding raids, and why has she chosen us for, Britta, Belkalis, Gazal, and I, to accomplish them? I glance at the three other girls, not surprised to see that they all seem unnerved too, except, of course, for Britta, I told about White Hands' surprise arrival last night. Evening greetings, Kamoko, she says with a wide grin, doing a quick kneeling greeting to White Hands. White Hands' mouth quirks into a smile. Evening greetings, Britta, she replies. Then she turns to the rest of us. You're all on time. Wonderful. I hate latecomers, don't you? When we look at each other, unsure of how to respond, she rises, dusting herself off. She's wearing the sedate brown robes of a Kamoko, and I'm not surprised to find they suit her even better than her old traveling blacks ever did. She walks over, nods at us. I am your new Kamoko, she announces. You may call me Kamoko, or Kamoko White Hands. I'm very fond of that name. She winks at me as she says this. I quickly bow. Evening greetings, Kamoko White Hands, I say, echoing the other girls. Evening greetings, she returns. Then she spots us watching the weapons. You've noticed my teaching tools. Wonderful. As you may have heard, I've specially selected you all to go on certain raids for the Warfu Bearer, and as such, I feel there's no point insulting your natural abilities by giving you practice swords and weaponry to train with. The four of you are lucky, you can and already have faced worse, mostly. She glances at Britta when she says this, and Britta blushes, 
embarrassed at being singled out. That's why I have decided to hold these lessons. Now that I'm here, it's time I molded the champions of this school. Champions? Belkalis repeats. White hands doesn't answer. She's now walking over to Gazal, an expression of concern on her face. I frown as I see the same thing she has. Gazal's forehead shines with sweat, and her eyes are slightly unfocused. She's staring at the lake, as pale as a ghost. I almost wonder if she's sick, but her lackey don't get sick. Once our blood begins changing, we become immune to most illnesses, our bodies healing them just as fast as it does everything else. You don't look at all well, White Hand says softly. Gazal, is it not? Yes, Carmoko. Gazal nods, her eyes flicking to the water. As White Hand's eyes follow Gazal's gaze, a calculating expression surfaces. She casually takes the novice by the elbow. Why don't we go over to the lake? Call you off. No. The word barks from Gazal's lips, and she jerks herself out of White Hands' hands. A quiet knowing rises in our new Carmoko's eyes. It's the lake, isn't it? When Gazal doesn't respond, she repeats her words. Isn't it, novice? Gazal reluctantly nods. Why? Gazal shakes her head frantically that frightened expression taking over. My eyes widen, watching her. I've never seen her unnerved before. I can't, I. You have to say it in order to overcome it, White Hands insists calmly. The lake can't change, and I certainly won't, so whatever it is, you have to address it now, so we can move on with our lesson. Please, Gazal whimpers, her eyes fixed on the dark water. Please what? Please, I don't want to be near that, I don't want. I've never seen Gazal so distraught, didn't even know it was possible. I suddenly feel deeply uneasy, as if I'm witnessing something I shouldn't. This isn't right, Britta whispers beside me. I nod. White Hands likes to play with people, but this is a shade too far. Her expression is implacable now as she turns to Gazal. Why don't you want to be near the water, she asks, then adds, I can't do anything if you don't tell me why. Gazal only shakes her head, her eyes wilder. The thought of talking about it obviously terrifies her. Very well, White Hand says, grabbing her by the arm. She drags her towards the lake. No. No. Gazal shrieks, digging her feet in, but White Hands is unyielding. She keeps pulling Gazal closer and closer until finally, the novice can't take it anymore. They locked me inside it, she screams. Gazal collapses, tears falling from her eyes. She's sobbing so hard, her entire body is racked by the force of her cries. They locked me in a cage, under the lake. They thought I would die, but I didn't. I just kept drowning. I just kept drowning. Tears are pouring down her eyes, and her whole body shudders. Over and over and over and. White hands grabs her up. Who are they? she asks. My family, Gazal sobs. White hands shakes her head. Your blood sisters are your family. Who are they? The house of Ugawal, Gazal answers, confused. Tears are still pouring from her eyes. White Hands grips her by the hair, pulls her along. I said, who are they? I can no longer watch. White Hands, please stop, I say, hurrying over. You don't have to frighten her. White Hands turns to me, her eyes deadly calm. Interrupt me, Decker, any of you interrupt, and I will deliver you pain such as you have never before imagined. We all step back, horrified. White Hands continues pulling Gazal by her hair, not even budging when Gazal fights so hard, her feet dig into the lake's muddy banks. She pushes Gazal down until her head is nearly to the water. Who are they? she roars. No one. 
Gazal wails, finally understanding. They are no one, please, Carmoko. They are nothing to me anymore. This answer satisfies White Hands. She releases Gazal's hair, then walks back over and selects a sword. She looks down at it, her eyes considering the blade. If you'd had a sword in those days, no one would have been able to do that to you. She walks over, flings the sword at Gazal's feet. You have one now. What will you do? Trembling, Gazal picks up the sword, looks from White Hands back to it. White Hands picks up the rest of the weapons and hands them to us, giving Britta the war hammer last. Finally, she turns back to Gazal and nods. You can come at me, but that will be a very short venture. Or you can choose. She waves to us. Choose an opponent. I know, almost instinctively, whom Gazal is going to choose. Her, she whispers, her voice going cold as she points at me. I choose her. White hands claps, delighted. Excellent choice, novice. Decker is the perfect opponent for you. Gazal approaches, murder in her eyes, and something stills in me, a subtle shifting as my senses sharpen. I take a step back, take a deep breath, and tighten my grasp on my sword. Gazal's out for blood, I can tell just by looking. Nevertheless, I'm ready for her. As Kamoko Huan always says, first rule of combat, be prepared to engage at all times. I widen my stance as White Hands nods to Gazal. Have at her, she waves. Gazal rushes me so fast, I move only seconds before her sword slices where my neck would have been. Surprise rips a gasp from my throat. She's not just out for my blood, she's out for my head, the easiest way to kill an alaki. But I'm prepared to die in combat, just as Kamoko Huan taught me. And, more to the point, I already know that beheading is not my final death. I use this reminder to breathe, to focus on tracking Gazal as she attacks me again, her assaults lightning fast. In her combat state, Gazal is like the wind, the fastest alaki in the war Fubera, now that Katia is gone. That means I have to be smarter, or if I'm not careful, this lesson will end with her taking my head. Watch out, Decker. Britta calls. I will, following this cry to find Gazal already at my back. I have mere seconds to jerk away before she can thrust her sword through my stomach. I dodge, but I'm still not fast enough. The sword slices into my forearm, and I wince, clenching my teeth against the white sweet pain. Gold springs up, stinging the wound. I ignore it. I've felt worse pain than this, experienced much worse things. This is only a scratch, I tell myself. White Hands laughs again, raising her cup in a toast to me. Conquer or die, Decker. Either way, you learn your lesson. Lesson. The word reverberates through my body, a reminder that I've had many other such lessons in the past month. Lessons aimed at teaching me survival, no, victory, against all odds. Conquer or die. I'm not dying again. Not today, anyway. I look at Gazal, her body seemingly overtaken by the wildness shimmering in her eyes. There'll be no reasoning with her. No talking. Gazal needs to let out her pain, and I'm the one she's selected to do so. The only honorable thing I can do is fight. Win. Conquer. I lift up my sword. Attempt me, I say. Gazal does so with a scream. When she lunges, however, I whirl to the side and slam the pommel of my sword into her skull. She only barely manages to grab my sleeve before she slumps down, unconscious. It'll be at least an hour before she wakes up, judging from the size of the knot in her head. White hands walks over, clapping. Splendid, splendid. Such quick thinking, Decker. I slump, my entire body shaking now. Simply masterful. I knew I made the right choice. Choice. This question comes from Belkalis. 
she spent the entire battle in quiet contemplation, as is her habit. Why her? Why us, of all the girls in the war Thubera, Komoko, she asks. White hands shrugs. You have rage, deep wells of it, she replies. Then she points at a still unconscious gazelle. That one has pain, an entire lake's worth, as you just saw. It's Britta's turn now, and White Hands's finger points towards her. That one is strong, loyal, and will do what must be done. As Britta blinks in surprise, White Hands turns to me. And that one, she says. That one is unnatural. There it is again, that hated word. Unnatural. But I don't feel the shame and nausea I used to. Now I know my ability has value, my main reaction is curiosity. White Hands knows where my ability came from. I'd already guessed this back in effort, but now I know it for a fact. That's why she's using that word to describe me. It's not a condemnation but a truth. What do you mean, unnatural? I ask. What exactly am I? Am I even a lackey? This last question rushes out of me, a fear I've kept so deeply hidden, I've never even acknowledged it until now. An amused smile curls White Hands's lips. Are you even a lackey? She laughs. What a silly question to ask, Decker. Of course you are. You're the most valuable Alaki in all of the war Thubera. I frown at her, confused by this declaration, and she takes a step closer, peers down at me. Of all the girls here, only you have the ability to command death shrieks. Even though I already knew this, the confirmation still comes as a shock. As do other realizations. If White Hands knows about my ability, then she was probably aware of what I was as far back as effort, might have been searching for me then. Which means she knew about me, knew what I was. Does this mean there are other girls like me? I dismissed the possibility, but now, I'm not so sure. All I know is that White Hands has the answers I seek. Are you the benefactor? I blurt out. All day I've been thinking about it, the mysterious benefactor Kamoko Thandai said helped mother escape. I thought it was one of the Kamakos at the Warthubera during that time, or perhaps even a Jatu or an official, but what if it was White Hands? She's a noble, she has money, power, the ability to transport people wherever she likes. Are you the one who helped my mother escape the Warthubera? White Hands just blinks. Your mother was in the Warthubera? Fascinating. She says it in that non-committal way of hers, so I can't tell whether she's lying or not. All I know is that she knows more than she's telling. What do you know about me? About what I am? I plead. She shrugs. I know that using your power exhausts you. That you become vulnerable after using it. I know that you are valuable to us. To this fight. Blood drums in my ears. Valuable to us. The way she says those words, looks so meaningfully at me, I know exactly what she's thinking. She intends to use my ability during the campaign. She intends to expose it for everyone to see. My muscles clench into knots, my breath comes in spurts. A primal wail begins building somewhere deep inside me, but white hands clicks her claws, forcing my mind back to the present. I know you have questions, Decker, she says, and I will answer them all before the campaign is over. But for now, know that I won't put you in harm's way. Just like that, the whale dissipates, and I can breathe again. If there's one thing I know about White Hands, it's that she's a woman of her word, even though her intentions are always murky. She turns to Britta. You once asked me why you were chosen. It's for this, to protect Decker during her vulnerable periods, to keep her from being hurt during that time. She points at Britta's warhammer. With that warhammer, Britta, you will be Decker's protector. Britta looks down at the hammer, her brows knitted in a frown. That's why you took me, she says slowly. That's why you brought us together. White Hands does not bother to deny it. 
As the strongest representatives of the war bearer, you four will be sent on the most difficult raids. The ones where the death shrieks are more numerous or cunning, where the terrain is more unforgiving, the ones where Decker's voice is required. She glances across our faces, her eyes finally resting on Britta. Not only are you strong, Britta, you truly care for Decca, which is why she needs you. A protector to keep her safe. A friend to keep her sane in the horror of the coming months. Are you up to the task? I turn to Britta, my questions about white hands pushed aside by an even more important emotion, fear. What if she's frightened of me? What if she hates me for putting her in such a dangerous situation? It's an irrational thought, I know, but the mere spectre of it is so painful, I can barely breathe. But then Britta hefts the hammer and smiles. Decker and I are blood sisters. We belong together. White Hand smiles. I am glad to hear it. Now she turns to Belkalis. And you, Belkalis of Walper, what are your thoughts? Belkalis snorts. I don't know what all this nonsense about Decker's value is, but I just want to survive my term so I can leave this place. If Decker can help us defeat the Death Shrieks faster, I'll protect her as well, she says, walking over to Britta and me. Relief shudders through me, so sudden it almost makes my knees buckle. Belkalis doesn't hate me either. She's still my friend. White Hand smiles. I thought you might. After all, you, more than anyone else, understand the pain that Decker endured. It is the same that you endured. You, more than anyone else, understands what needs to be done. Suddenly now, I remember the scars on Belkalis's back, the ones that once massed over each other, like a map. They've faded now, but I'll never forget them. Never forget that she suffered just as much as I did. Belkalis nods curtly and white hands continues, for the meantime, keep Deck a secret between this group. Only you and the Karmakos know and we would like to keep it that way for now. When the others nod, giving their word, she picks up a sword, considers it. Now, then, which one of you wants to attempt me? 19. Tell me about your dreams, Decker, White Hand says. It's our fourth day of lessons at the lake. Our usual no-holds-barred combat has ended, and Britta, Belkalis and Gazal have returned to Main Hall but White Hands asked me to stay afterwards, though she wouldn't tell me why. White Hands is very good at not answering questions. I should know, I've pestered her with enough of them. All she ever tells me is that she'll explain everything in good time, which is sometime before the campaign ends. I suppose I just have to be satisfied with that for now. I could ask Carmoko Thando instead, but I have the feeling she won't know anything near what White Hands does. My dreams? I finally echo, confusion building. What do my dreams have to do with anything? You've been having nightmares, she says. Recurring dreams as well. When she sees my shocked expression, she shrugs, smiles. Don't look so worried. All Alaki have such dreams. The unnatural ones especially. Tell me about yours. I clear my throat embarrassed. It always starts in the ocean, at least it feels like an ocean, I begin. It's dark, but there are these, presences there. I don't know if they're different or all one thing, but they call to me. What do they say? My name. They say my name, and they beckon me towards this, door. It's golden, all shining. I turn to her, biting my lip now almost afraid to speak. What is it, Decker, she prompts. They use my mother's voice, I whisper. When they call to me, they use mother's voice. But I know it's not her. Mother's dead. Gone. The words surface some of that old pain, and I rub my chest to soothe it. White hands nods, seems deep in thought. The door, have you ever been through it? she asks. I shake my head. Never. She turns to me, 
a strange expression on her face. This time, when they call you, go, she says. I frown. But I don't control when the dreams. A sharp pain pricks my neck. All I see is the faint smile on White Hand's face as she says, remember, when they call you, go. Then everything turns dark. Complete blackness, an ocean of warmth. It's the same as always, the same place I've been seeing ever since mother died. Something stirs inside it, vast and ancient, but I'm not frightened. I've met it countless times before, felt its presence rolling inside me. Decker. It calls, a rumbling in the waters. It sounds almost like mother. But it's not her. It's lying to me, using mother's voice like that. I swim in the other direction, trying to get away from it. Then gold suddenly shimmers, a door opening behind me. Decker. The voice comes again, pleading this time. It scratches a memory, a reminder of something important I'm forgetting. Something about that door. I turn, and there it is, golden and shining, growing bigger and bigger until it completely blocks my field of vision. Enter it, Decca. The words filter, almost eerily, into my mind. An order. I obey it now, swimming closer and closer to the gold until the door swallows me up and there's nothing left but that beautiful color washing over me. You can wake up now, Decca. I gasp awake, obeying White Hands' voice, only to realize I've only done so halfway. I'm not really awake, and I'm not really here. That's the only explanation of why everything suddenly glows so brightly. It's dark around me, but all the living things glow, the plants, the insects, the trees. It's almost as if there's a halo over everything, a shimmering, mystical light. I turn to White Hands. She's standing beside me, a brilliant white flame in the darkness, her entire body illuminated. What do you see? she asks, her voice seeming to come from afar. She seems distant, so very distant. But I know she's here. Just as I'm here. Am I truly still asleep? You're shining. I whisper, wonder flowing over me. That's good. What's happening? I ask, my voice sounding hollow to my own ears. White hands walks around me. You've been taught about the combat state, she asks. I nod slowly, everything so weightless and calming now. What you've experienced is only the surface of it. This, what you're feeling and seeing now, is its purest form, a state of heightened senses when you're halfway between sleep and waking, halfway between this world and the next. Look at your hands, she instructs. I look down. Shocked to see they're glowing just like White Hands' body, only there are streaks on them that glow even more brightly than everything else. My veins, branching across my body, illuminating it in the night. I can see them even against the gilding. When you enter the deep combat state, you can see what others can't, feel what others can't, become faster and stronger than is normally possible for an alaki. This is the state you will use to develop your voice. Catch. A shadow whizzes towards me, and my hands automatically reach up, grasping the object. I gape at it. It's a sword, a very sharp one. I caught it by the blade, but I'm not bleeding, not even the tiniest wound mars my skin. I stare at it, amazement growing. The cursed gold has pulled under the skin there, protecting it. I can see it working, moving even under my gilding. White hand smiles. Wonderful. You're already controlling your blood. When you do the same with your voice, you'll be in a much better position, I promise. Well, then, let's get started, shall we? We have a lot to learn. Let's start with entering the combat state on your own. I wake up the next morning even earlier than I usually do. Rattle is already standing towards the front of his cage when I arrive. His eyes glimmer in the darkness, those midnight black pupils tracking me. It feels almost as if he knew I was coming, but
but then, he already has someone keeping him company. White Hands is seated on a small bench in front of him, that nulled demon half-mask on her face. I blink, startled by the sight. It's rare to see Karmikos wearing the masks when men aren't around. But Rattle is male, I suppose, although I've never looked at his nethers closely enough to verify. Morning greetings, Karmoko, I say with a nervous bow, but White Hands impatiently waves my greeting away. Are you ready, she asks. I inhale deeply, looking at Rattle. I think so. She nods. Submerge into the combat state. Just like that. I try not to show my unease as I nod, visualizing the dark ocean in my head, just as she directed me to do last night. At first, there is nothing, only the thousand erratic thoughts barging through my head, what if I can't do this? What if something happens and... Quiet your thoughts, white hands commands. Find a place to focus. I do as she says, glancing down at my hands, at the gold that gilds them. It's just as thick as it was the first day I dipped my hands into that vase. If I stare long enough, I can almost see my veins underneath it, feel them throbbing just under the golden sheen of the gilding. I remember the way the blood in them surged up last night, protecting my hands when I caught the sword. The blood is gold as my hands. As gold as that door. My thoughts still, my body already beginning to feel weightless. That's it, white hands whispers, her voice coming as if from far away. Focus on the door, she says. It's there now, just in front of me. I move towards it, swimming through the darkness. Swimming into the light. There's so much of it now, everything glowing white before me, everything living, that is. That includes Rattle. His entire body seems to shimmer now, a white light glimmering in the darkness. Only his eyes are still black. He looks at me, a strange expression on his face. Fear? Curiosity? I can't tell. I walk closer to him, my footsteps seeming to float on air. Once I'm just out of reach, I look up at his eyes. Rattle, I say. Neil. My voice sounds laired even to my own ears. Moments pass, nothing happens, but then a familiar, rattling sound. His quills, creaking on his back. He slowly but surely sinks to his knees, a vacant look in his eyes. The same look that was in the other Death Shriek's eyes, the one that killed Katia and the one back in Erfurt. Shock jolts as I realize, I did it, I commanded him. Why, Decker? White Hands's voice is suddenly right next to my ear. I think you've issued your first intentional command. My grin wavers, exhaustion surging inside me. Then everything goes black. 20. Death Shrieks have gathered in a cave near the outskirts of Himera's southern border, Komoko Thandai announces, glancing across the room. It's late afternoon and I'm standing in the Karmako's personal library along with several other Alaki, Beeks, a thoughtful northern novice with green eyes and black hair, Merut, the short southern neophyte Adwapa is forever making cow eyes at, and Britta, Belkalis, Gazal and Adwapa. White hands and the other Karmako sit quietly in the corner, assessing us. This time tomorrow, our small party will be on the outskirts of Himera hunting death shrieks. And not just the ordinary ones either. This particular group has killed over 50 men in the week they've been nesting at the southern border. Most death shrieks take at least two or three months to wreak such devastation. We're hunting these on our very first raid. My heart pounds, fear, nerves and eagerness all coming together as one. This is what I've been training all these months for. The death shrieks are massing here near the jungle villas of several nobles, Komoko Thandai says, walking to the center of the library, where a map of Oterra has been carved into the floor. She points with a spear to the area we will be traveling to, a small village at Himera's leftmost edge. You lot and your Yuruni will ride out tomorrow and will engage them at this cave. She points to the location, then looks up, 
beckons to me. Decca, this is where your particular talent becomes of use. I reluctantly walk over, noticing the questions arising in the other blood sister's eyes. Once I reach her, Komoko Thandao turns to face them. You all know Decca, she begins, patting my shoulder. What you do not know, however, is that she is not quite like the rest of you. The girls glance at each other again, confused. My muscles tense, anxiety roping them tighter. None of us in White Hands' lessons has told any of the others about my ability, and now that the moment is here, I'm filled with dread. Will they hate me? Fear me? A hand nudges mine. Britta's. It's all right, Decca, she whispers, smiling. I'm right here. I smile back, relieved. Decca is an anomaly among your kind, Komoko Thandai explains, glancing around the room. She has the power to command death shrieks. The other girls gasp, and Adwapa sends me a shocked look. Decca, she whispers, a question in her eyes. I nod quickly, suddenly shy. Beeks raises her hand. I do not understand, Komoko. Do you mean that she can hypnotize them? Something like that, Komoko Thando replies. She can do so only for short periods of time, but, as you can imagine, this is a very helpful ability, so we must explore it. Now she looks across the room, her eyes stern. A word of warning, very few people know of Decker's talent. Only those in this room, the Jatu commanders, and a few select others are privy to this information. No one else may know, not even your other blood sisters, on pain of death. Beeks nods, staring at me speculatively. I stand straighter, try to seem stronger, worthy, somehow. I still don't know why I was gifted with this ability, but I don't want to act so timid that the other blood sisters dismiss me for my lack of confidence. Now, let's talk strategy, Komoko Thandau declares. She glances at the other blood sisters, then at me. The plan is simple. Decca, you will approach first, flanked by your Yuruni and Britta. You will lure the death shrieks out, using your voice, and render them motionless if you can. The others will then exterminate them, fast and simple. Do you understand, she asks. I nod. Yes, Kamoko, I say, my muscles roped tighter than ever. It's finally here, the time for me to accomplish my purpose. The very thought makes my mouth dry. I can do this, I can do this. Kamoko Thando smiles at me and nods. Then let's go over the finer points. The mood is somber when we gather in the stands with our Yuruni later in the evening. Our group has been allowed to have two hours to ourselves, as is the custom with every new raiding party, so we've decided to pass the time having dinner together. After all, it's very likely that some of us will die tomorrow. This almost feels like a sort of funeral, a chance to say goodbye before it's too late. I'm not the only one that feels this way. As I bite into my dinner of hot stew and bread, Akalan, Belkalus as Yuruni, shifts beside me. What does it feel like, dying? He asks quietly. There's an expression on his face, a vulnerability I've never seen there before. Cold, very cold, I reply. You can feel the blood slowing inside you. Then there's the darkness, the loneliness. Dying is very lonely. And after? Akalan prompts, uncertain. Perhaps he's not all bluster and rudeness after all. After? I repeat, trying to picture it. It's a difficult thing. I always remember dying, but I can never quite recall what comes afterwards. All I remember is the darkness and the peace. If I try to think of anything further than that, the memory shifts away. Lots of my memories shift away now. I sometimes think I don't want to remember them don't want to feel the fear that accompanies them. It's warm. To my surprise, this answer comes from Belkalis, and there's a faint smile on her mouth as she looks up from the cream she's been mixing all evening. Belkalis is very good at creams and solutions, 
a talent she learned from working at her uncle's apothecary. She makes them every time she's nervous or anxious, even though we don't need any such remedies as a lackey. It's always warm, like something is surrounding you, keeping you safe. You sound as if you like it. This perplexed observation comes from Kweku, Adwapa's plump and usually cheerful Yuruni. His eyebrows are gathered together, large brown eyes confused underneath them. Belkalis shrugs. I don't mind it, being dead, that is. It's actually peaceful, like you're floating in warmth and happiness. Whenever people call us monsters, I think about when I'm dead, what it feels like, and I wonder, if I'm that much of a monster, why is Oyomo so kind to me in the afterlands? This answer doesn't sit well with Akalin, and he quickly rises. Oyomo is kind to everyone, from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low. And you might not want to share such words in mixed company. The priests might accuse you of blasphemy. He quickly walks away, back stiffly upright. I can't help but feel this is out of fear more than anger. Unlike us, the recruits get only one death. I'll go talk to him, Britta's Yuruni, Lee, says, his expression apologetic as he makes his exit as well. Kweku quickly does the same, leaving us in silence behind him. The moments tick by until finally Britta sighs. That went just as well as expected. We all laugh nervously, but we still follow the other boys with our eyes until they disappear down the hill to the barracks before we turn back to each other. Kata remains, much to my surprise. Despite our somewhat closer relationship now, he's still not the sort for idle conversation. He turns to Belkalis. Have you died many times, then, he asks. She shrugs. Only six, from the bleedings, mostly. Six, he sputters. When Belkalis shrugs, unconcerned, he shakes his head. And, bleedings? Sometimes, priests like to take our blood and sell it, Belkalis says, mixing the poultice faster and faster. She doesn't want to talk about this anymore. They always take lots of it, I add quickly, drawing the attention away from her. Once, as the village elders were dismembering me, I woke up and the entire cellar was covered in blood. That was unpleasant. And painful. But mainly unpleasant. I'd gotten used to it, you see. They dismembered me quite a lot. I'm used to saying this without feeling any of the old fear and nausea now, so the expression that takes over Kater's face startles me. It's horror. Pure, unfiltered horror. I have to, pardon me, he says abruptly, scrambling up. His body shakes as he walks away. I watch him go, then sigh. Sometimes, I forget how sheltered the recruits are. Yes, they're soldiers, and yes, they live with brutality, with horror, but they have no understanding of what life is like for us. The pain we've all endured. I should have told him about my past more gently, eased him into it, but now that I've said the words out loud, I don't regret saying them at all. I think I'll take some time to myself, I say as I rise. The others nod as I walk away. My favorite tree is the blue-flowered Nistria on the next hill. It's a towering old giant, its branches so broad, they block out the view of almost everything else. The rest of the Warthu bearer always seems far away a distant memory, once I slip into the small space under the branches and breathe in the delicate fragrance wafting from the flowers. That's where Kata finds me later, lying quietly in the shade. My apologies for running off, he says, crouching down beside me. You were telling me about the most horrifying thing that ever happened to you and I fled like a child. I just... I could have never imagined that, what they did to you. I still can't. He looks away, struggling for words. Finally, he composes himself, turns back to me. I'm sorry, Decker, he says. From the bottom of my soul, I'm sorry for what was done to you, sorry for what was done to all of you. I know it doesn't make a difference, but I just want to say it, so you know how I feel. 
I blink, startled by his words. Whatever I was expecting, it was certainly not this. This may be the most Cater has ever said to me in one go. I nod as he takes a seat, then turn and smile at him. I wouldn't compare you to a child, I say. More like one of those tree lizards. I point to a pale green lizard scurrying across the Nistria's branches. Cater's mouth quirks. I'll take nothing less than a horned lizard, he says. Horned lizard it is, I agree. His smile widens for a moment. Then he sighs. I'm sorry, he whispers again. Sorry for what happened to you, sorry that I didn't stay to hear you finish what you were saying. It's all right, I reply. I shouldn't have told you in the first place. You shouldn't have had to go through such horror in the first place, he says, his eyes grim. What those elders did, that's not what's supposed to happen. But what do you think the death mandate is? I ask him softly. I know he knows about it. All the Jatu in this unit do. They were once tasked with enforcing it if the priests failed. That was, of course, before a lackey became necessary. It's there. It's always been there. Kata looks away guiltily, so I move closer. I don't want him to turn away from me, from this conversation. This may be the only chance I ever have. My kind, we don't have a choice, I say. Fight or die, either way, our lives are not our own. Balkalis is right, you know. They call us demons, but are we really? Kata looks down. I don't know. He sighs. I don't know anymore. When I first became a recruit, I thought that's what your kind were. I thought I'd hate you as I worked with you, and even when I made the bargain with you, I still distrusted you. But now. But now? I echo. Now, when I look at you, all I can see is my comrades. And now, when I hear what was done to you. His hands clench. He has to breathe before he releases them. He turns to me. Who dismembered you, he asks. What are their names? What does it matter? I shrug. According to the infinite wisdoms, I'm a demon. Besides, it's over and done with. Kata gathers my hand in his and squeezes it. The heat from his hand is like a furnace, washing over my skin. It matters to me, he says. You matter to me. The words set my heart to beating and twist my stomach into knots. I don't know why I'm suddenly warm, suddenly flushed, in his presence. You are my Yuruni, I say softly, a reminder to myself. I thank you for caring. Even if I weren't your Yuruni, I would care. To my surprise, Kata's other hand reaches up to clasp my chin. He lifts it up so I can meet his eyes. They are warm, earnest. My entire body tingles. I remember seeing you in Jaw Hall that first day, he says softly. When I saw you standing there, so frightened, Britta at your side, you reminded me of something I'd forgotten. My heart is beating so fast now, I'm scared it'll burst from my chest. What was that? I whisper. Myself, when I was younger. I'm so sorry, he says abruptly, removing his hand. I'm sorry I'm powerless, Decca, sorry your life was taken from you, sorry that violence brought you here, same as it brought me. I stare at him, trying to understand these last few words. I've always known there was some tragedy in Cater's past, but I've never asked, since I know he wouldn't want me to pry. I sense that now is still not the time so I just blink. It's all right, I say. At least I have my blood sisters now. It's enough. I never had friends like that back home. Never had much of anyone, really. I remember how easily father abandoned me, how easily Alfred did too. I blink again, startled. I haven't thought about them in weeks, haven't even questioned again whether I'm father's child or not. Now that White Hands is here, I'm content to wait for answers, 
safe in the knowledge that no matter what the truth is, no one's going to lock me in a cellar or bleed me because of my abilities. Perhaps that's why I can be here, like this, with Kater. His eyes seem to glow as he glances sideways at me. Am I your friend, Decca? Do you want to be? I say this part so softly, I don't think he hears it. But then he whispers in my ear, his breath stirring the short mop of curly hair above it. I think I'm something much better. I'm your Yuruni, now until the day of our deaths. It's the nicest thing I've heard in a long time. 21. I'm already a thousand times prepared for the raid when the sun climbs over the horizon the next day. My weapons have been sharpened, my leather armor has been tightened, and my horse has been equipped with everything it needs for the long ride to the outskirts of Himera. I'm so nervous, a strange sort of energy fills me as I saddle my horse. I don't even feel constricted by my armor now, even though it's the same grotesquely heavy leather all the Alaki have been given. All I feel is a light compression over my body. Around me, the others are also saddling their horses and loading their packs. To my surprise, Adwapa still hasn't asked me any questions about Karmoko Thandai's revelation the night before. When I ask why as we mount the horses, she rolls her eyes. Well, I've always known you were odd, she says by way of explanation. I decide not to ask any further questions. As we ride to the gates of the Warthubera, I spot Kata and the other Yuruni waiting on the other side, behind Captain Kelich's horse. A strange warmth rises in me at the sight of him, resplendent in the ornamental orange-red armor of a recruit. I try to breathe it back, but it continues circling under my skin. A civilian crowd has gathered behind him and the other recruits, neck straining as they gawk at our tiny regiment, which consists of our Salaki, two matrons with battle experience, and the four assistants who will serve as our support, thankfully, one of them is Isatu, the assistant usually assigned to our common bedroom. The drawbridge goes down, and Gazal, the ranking Alaki for this expedition, lifts her arm in a folded fist, then drops it commandingly. Helmets, she bellows. We quickly don our helmets, piercing, Spiky affairs with war masks in the shape of snarling demon faces attached to the front. Cross the moat. Gazal commands. We obey, riding across the drawbridge. A strange feeling rushes over me the moment we reach the other side, nervousness, thrumming in my veins. This is the first time I've seen the outside of the Warthu bearer since I entered, the first time I haven't been within its confines, secluded by its walls, protected by them. I shiver at the thought, my pulse rising. I wonder what the common folk will do when they see us exiting the gates. Despite all our armor, most of us are shorter and smaller than the recruits. Will they suspect what we are? Do they know about us yet? The novices tell us that the common folk mostly ignore them when they go on raids, but lately, there have been murmurs, rumblings of discontent we sometimes hear when we watch the novices exit. Who knows what will happen today? I curb the thought as our procession comes to a stop at the end of the drawbridge, where our market day is in full swing, with crowds of people milling around, buying fresh goods. Captain Kelechi rides over to welcome us. He'll be heading our raiding party from now on, a surprising fact, given his rank as head of all the Jatu. To my surprise, he rides over to me, then stops and gives me a slow, considering look down his long, aristocratic nose. It feels as if this is the first time he's actually seeing me, even though I've seen him countless times before, his tall, dark silhouette and rigid posture unmistakable anywhere he goes. You are Decker of Affert, he says coldly, brown eyes assessing me up and down. The demon among demons. I make sure to keep my face expressionless as I reply. Yes, Captain. He moves his horse closer. It works only on death shrieks. Your gift, I mean. I'm confused by his question for a moment, then I understand. He's asking whether my gift works on humans. On him. Only the death shrieks, I confirm. The Captain nods brusquely. 
Ensure that you keep it that way, he says. Ensure that you keep your unholy ways well to yourself, because if I suspect for any reason that you are doing otherwise, I will give you so many brutal almost deaths, you'll marvel at my ingenuity from here to infinity. I nod, the blood chilling inside me. Yes, Captain, I rasp. He nods, turning his horse around. Move out, he calls. I urge my horse onward, keeping my eyes steadfastly fixed on the road. Around us, the crowd mutters suspiciously, having noticed the Alaki's smaller stature, not to mention the obvious curves of our armor. Whores! I hear the word shouted more than once as we continue on. I hurry to catch up with Kata. His forbidding expression is a barrier only the bravest man would dare cross. Concern shades his eyes when he glances at me. Is everything all right, Decker? he asks. The captain didn't threaten you, did he? No, why do you think that? I ask. I don't want him to know about what just happened. I saw him whisper to you, Kato explains. What did he say? My face heats, and I shrug in what I hope is a casual way. He just offered me some advice. About your gift. I nod. I've already told him about White Hands's revelations, our lessons, and what happened yesterday with Carmoko Thandive's announcement. He said I. Demons. The word explodes from the crowd. They are all demons. A shabby man pushes his way through, wild-eyed fervor blazing through his expression. Don't let them fool you. Every week they come out of those gates, clothed in the foul armor of corruption. They want to corrupt us, to rot Oterra to its very foundations. The crowd has begun to murmur now, many people nodding their heads in agreement. His right, a man calls out. Demons, another shouts. Whores. This last declaration comes from one of the few women in the crowd, an old grandmother in a grotesquely smiling bright yellow sun figure mask, and accompanied by two young boys, her male guardians, no doubt. It's not long before the crowd is chanting the word, whores. 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 As the chants grow louder, I instinctively shrink towards Britta, who's riding to my right. Even though we're well trained, I know only too well the power a human mob can wield. I remember my village, remember what happened there after the death shrieks attacked, the way the villagers all gathered around me, watching impassively as Iona's gutted my. This isn't my village. I blink, realization washing over me. These aren't the villagers who turned on me, tortured me. I'm not the same girl who cowered and allowed myself to be dismembered. I'm stronger now, faster too. Most important of all, I'm trained for combat. The shabby man has whipped himself into such a frothing rage, he launches at Britta. Demon whores. I'll kill. I pull him up by the front of his robes. Don't touch my friends, I growl. I'll break you to pieces before you can land a single blow. And I'll help her scatter them all across Oterra when she's done, Britta sniffs beside me. I drop him back onto the dusty ground and make a show of contemptuously dusting off my hands. As I do so, a warm, buoyant feeling steals through me. Exhilaration. I can't believe I did it, can't believe I defended myself, my friends, against that man. Just a few months ago, I would have just cowered in a corner. Good on ye, Britta whispers proudly to me as I continue on. Kata, meanwhile, moves his horse closer to mine, the other Yuruni swiftly mimicking him so they are a barrier between the crowd and us. I would never have imagined it, he says with a laugh. Our little Decker, finally showing her teeth. Keep twittering on like that, and they'll sink right into you, I humph. But now the man has turned to the crowd for support. They're demons, he shouts. You Jatu can't lie to us, we know what you're up to on that hill. We know you're doing all kinds of unholy things. We can't have such filth among us. 
His right, the grandmother in the sun mask calls out, clutching her grandsons closer. We don't want their filth here, another man shouts. My tension begins to rise, and my hands steal towards my Atika's hilt. I'm grateful this one is made of steel, unlike our practice swords. I have to be prepared for anything. As I do so, Captain Kelechi abruptly turns his horse to face the crowd. Very well, he calls out. If you want them gone, then who wants to take their place on the raid of a nearby death shriek nest we're going on? The crowd quiets, confused by the question. Captain Kelechi continues. If my soldiers are demons, and therefore not worthy of fighting, no, dying for Otera, who among you will replace them in our ranks? He glances mildly at the man. Will you? Then he points to another member of the crowd. How about you? Or you? One by one, Captain Kelechi points out people in the crowd, asking them to take our place. The crowd falls silent with alarm and shame. Scores of people, and no one can look him in the eye. When no one steps forward, Captain Kelechi nods again. The next time you want to rob me of my soldiers, make sure you're ready to take their place first. He casts a severe look at the man, who slinks away sulkily. He wasn't expecting anyone to question him, that much is obvious. I watch the man go, relief building inside me. The people in the capital are much less dedicated to their hatred than the ones in the villages, it seems. Once he disappears, Captain Kelechi turns to us. What are you waiting for? Move out. We quickly do as we're told. As we continue down the street, the familiar sound of Emika's tears thundering in the distance, I turn to Kata, perplexed. Is he always like that? Captain Kelechi, I mean. Kata turns to me and shrugs. He's both better and worse than you can imagine. The eastern outskirts of Himera are dusty and dry, the orderly beauty of the city giving way to a wild, and cultivated plain filled with yellow grasses and towering baobab trees. Baobabs are native here, but the summer heat has so parched them, their leaves have shriveled on the stems. Even the streams and waterfalls have dried up, all of them seared away by the sun's unrelenting heat. The farther out we go, the higher my anxieties build. The nest we're raiding is at the edge of the jungle, deep inside a cave. Captain Kelechi tracks the death shrieks' movements via kukuls, the messenger birds he trades with his scouts. The creatures have been unusually active today. I can already feel them out there, a vague, distant presence that causes my blood to rush faster and faster. Ever since I started taking lessons with white hands, my blood has gotten more and more sensitive. The plan is to attack the nest early next morning, when they are at their most vulnerable. Like humans, death shrieks are active during the day and sleep at night. As the day wears on, my nerves tighten more and more. I'm excited to finally begin killing death shrieks to fulfill the purpose the Karmakos have been training me for and avenge Katia's death, but what if I can't use my voice? I'm used to summoning it during lessons with white hands, what if I can't do it here? without her to guide me. My nervousness grows as we set up camp at the edge of the jungle, my thoughts consumed by the fear of what if, what if. I'm so preoccupied, I don't notice Kata when he sits next to me on the log where I've been mindlessly sharpening my atika for the past 30 minutes. Still at it, he whispers in my ear, amused. My heart nearly jumps out my chest. Oyomo's breath, Kata. I gasp. You almost made me slice off my finger. He carefully takes the sword from my hands, examines it. This is the fifth time I've seen you sharpening it since we set up camp, and it hasn't even tasted any blood yet. He glances at me from the corner of his eye. Frightened? Of course I'm frightened, I sniff. You'd be insane if you weren't, he agrees, leaning against the tree at our backs. He's so close now, I can feel the heat of his thigh on mine. I try not to shiver from the contact. On my first death shriek raid, I vomited so much that I fainted, 
he says. By the time I woke, the raid was already over. What? I turned to him, astonishment building. This is the first time he's told me this. We've talked about his time at Jaw Hall, but never this. Disgraceful, isn't it? He shrugs. There I was, covered in my own vomit, when they woke me. How old were you? I ask, curious. Despite the time we have spent together training, I still don't know much about Kater's earlier life, but then, he doesn't know much about mine. We both have secrets we want to keep. Kater pauses now, his eyes far away. Eight, he finally replies. I was eight. My eyes goggle. Eight? I repeat. Kater is seventeen now, which means he's been raiding Death Shrieks for nine whole years. Why would anyone take a child on a raid? I ask, appalled. I insisted, he says with a shrug. When I turn to him, he explains. The Death Shrieks had just attacked my home, killed my family, my mother, my father, my brothers. I wanted to avenge them. It's not easy, going from being the youngest to being an orphan in the blink of an eye. My stomach lurches, everything making sense. Now I understand why Kater's so desperate for revenge, why he isn't as carefree and joking as the other boys. If everyone I'd ever loved had been murdered all at once in such a horrible way, I'd be closed off too. He smiles thinly, a sad, bitter expression on his face. In the end, I couldn't even stay conscious for the beginning of it. I'm so horrified, I place my hand on his knee. I'm so sorry, I say. I didn't know. I didn't tell you. He shrugs again. It's all right, I suppose. You don't become Lord of Garfatu without someone dying first. Garfatu? I echo. I remember distantly Kater's introduction on our first meeting, but I didn't think much of it at the time. Garfatu is the name of the region where father served during his military tour. Then, Lord of Garfatu. I'd always thought Kater could be aristocratic, but an actual lord. And of Garfatu, of all places. Garfatu is the last stronghold guarding the border between Oterra and the Unknown Lands one of Oterra's most strategic castles. Why is he here with us instead of at court, doing whatever it is fancy lords and ladies do? His family is one of the important ones, the nobles. At least, it was. They are all dead now, which is why he's here. When I look up at him again, he's giving me a rueful smile, an expression that isn't reflected in his eyes. The sight of it wounds me. Don't do that, I say abruptly. Don't do what? Pretend like everything is all right when it's not. Make horrible jokes to hide your pain. I know what it feels like to lose a parent. To lose your entire family. You don't have to pretend with me. Never with me. Kata seems startled as he looks down, his golden eyes peering into mine. Finally, he nods. I won't do it again, he agrees. You swear it? I extend my little finger to him just as I used to with my mother, until I realize what I'm doing. I quickly retract my finger. To my surprise, he picks my hand up, intertwines his little finger with mine. I swear it, he says and nods. We sit there, fingers intertwined, as the night air cools around us. The rest of the camp seems to recede in the distance, the other Alaki milling around, the recruits huddled together around a board game to calm their nerves. Finally, the silence becomes too much. I awkwardly remove my finger, clearing my throat as I do so. Did you go on any raids after? I ask. After the one where you vomited, I mean. Kata taps his feet against the ground. Countless, he says. That's why I was assigned to Jaw Hall. I'd seen more death shrieks than all the Jati there combined, even though I was only a recruit, so they decided I wouldn't be out of my depth overseeing a few Alaki. Then they decided to send me to the Warthu Bearer. 
It was a much more fitting match for me, they said. I had to give up my rank, though. Now I'm just a lowly recruit, like the rest of them. You're much more accomplished than I ever imagined, I say, impressed. I'm glad you're my Yuruni. Kater grins, a glimmer of teeth shining behind his lips. The breath shallows in my throat, my whole world suddenly hanging on that expanse of white. Just wait till we finally go on the campaign and I spend days without washing. My odor will impress you more than anything you've ever smelled in your life, he says. I giggle, charmed despite myself. Stop joking, Kater, I. Apt words, Alaki. When we look up, Captain Kelechi is standing above us, his mouth turned down in a disapproving frown. Kater and I immediately jerk upright. Kater clears his throat. Captain, I was. Chattering with your partner when you should be inspecting the perimeter, the captain interrupts, eyebrow raised. Kater bows. My apologies, captain, he says quickly. I will do so now. Once he disappears into the shadows, Captain Kelechi turns to me. Get some sleep, Alaki, he says. We'll need you at your best this morning. Yes, Captain. I bow, but by the time I lift my head, he's already gone. 22. 